Good morning. It is 9.30 on Tuesday, February 6th, and I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors. Welcome to all of you who have joined us, and let's begin with a roll call. Hi, Anjanae. Good morning. Supervisor Arenas. Not here yet. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Samidian. Here. Vice President Lee. Good morning, President. And President Ellenberg. I am here as well. We have a quorum. Thank you. I'll turn to our county executive, James Williams, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. This morning's uh, invocator is going to be welcomed by Vice President Lee. Good morning. The Lunar New Year begins on the first day of the first month of the lunar calendar, which is around late January or early February every year. And this year, it falls on February 10th. I want to ask Venerable Jane Shang from the Chong Tai Zen Center of Sunnyvale to do the New Year's blessing before the board meeting begins today. Venerable Jane Sheng, please come up to the dais. Venerable Jane Sheng first came to the Bay Area in 2005, where she served as the abbess of Buddha Gate Monastery in Lafayette until 2018. During that time, she led the team of Buddhist nuns and lay practitioners in renovating the monastery and inspired students by offering spiritual talks and meditation classes in English and Chinese. Venerable Sheng's life's mission is to teach the truths of Buddhism and guide sentient beings to explore the potential of their pure nature. She believes that by developing compassion and wisdom in a selfless way, we are able to create a promising future and world peace. After a year of sabbatical, Venerable Jin Sheng has now came back to Bay Area, where she has been continuing her service as the abbess of the Chong Tai Zen Center of Sunnyvale since 2019. Please welcome Venerable Jin Sheng. Good morning. Let's get the, the microphone mic. on first. Yes. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Chairman of the board, uh, president, and all supervisors. And thank you for uh, Supervisor Lee's kind invitation. And thank you for having me on uh, your board meeting. So there's a Chinese saying, uh, spring is the time to plant your year. And morning is the time to plant your day. Diligence is the way to lead your life. Spring cleaning is the good start for a new year. So we not only clean our houses, our environments, uh, but also we clean our minds. So past is already past, we learn from the past. And future comes from the precedent, precedent, present. And present is always a gift, a new beginning, a new moment. So there's a Chinese saying, uh, watch out our thoughts. Our thoughts will lead our words. And watch out our words. Our words will lead our actions. And watch out our actions. Our actions will lead our habits. And watch out our habits. Our habits will lead our characteristics. And watch out our characteristics. Our characteristics will lead our personalities. Watch out our personalities. Our personality will lead our destiny. So uh, to be the master of our destiny, uh, we should start being mindful of our thoughts at each moment. Uh, with our pure awareness, uh, do our best to keep our minds clean by letting go of uh, those thoughts of greed, anger, and ignorance. Uh, this is the spring cleaning. So now I'm going to present uh, the New Year blessing words from our parent monastery, uh, Zhongda Chan Monastery in Taiwan. Calm the mind to find our intrinsic freedom. So actually our mind is originally calm and full of uh, treasures. Uh, purity, peace, joy, compassion, and uh, wisdom. At each moment, we just need to focus inward and uh, stay calm. The mind is free from delusion and uh, attachment. So the Buddhist Sutra says, when the mind is peaceful, the world is peaceful. 
When the mind is pure, the land is pure. 2024 is the year of dragon, representing diligence, strength, prosperity, and good fortune. And in Buddhism, dragon is also the guardian of the truth. So that's guard and protect our pure mind all together to create a peaceful and harmonious world. I wish everyone become enlightened and attend true peace and joy. Thank you for having me again. Happy New Year. Amitabha. Thank you very much. Back to you, Madam President. Thank you very much. What a beautiful start to today's meeting. I'll note for the, the record that Supervisor Arenas has joined us. Um, item four is adjournments and memoriam, and I do not believe we have any for presentation today, so I'll move to item five, uh, comment, commendations and proclamations, and we don't have any of those for presentation either. Uh, which brings us to public comment, item six. This is the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address the board on matters not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. We're going to hear, uh, member, we're going to hear speakers first in chambers, so if you are intending to speak on public comment, you should have completed a yellow card there in the back of the room. If you have not completed one, please uh, scurry over and get one if you're intending to speak. We will close the in-person speaking queue when the first person begins speaking. So we'll, we'll make sure everybody has an opportunity to get a card. For those of you who are on Zoom, if you are intending to, to speak on public comment, now is the time to please raise your virtual hand. That queue will close when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. So I see some, do we have more cards that we're waiting for, Tina? It does not look like we have any more. Okay, then how many um, cards do we have in chambers? I have three cards in chambers. Three, and um, online at the moment? At the moment, we have three hands raised. Six, all right, so we will uh, allow two minutes, please, for each public commenter, and welcome, thank you. Perfect. We have Susie York, a Zach Taylor, and Matthew G. Please approach the podium. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Zach Taylor, I'm a nurse for Santa Clara County, and I'm here to speak today about how the county systematically underpays shift differentials to its nurses at the bedside, uh, assistant nurse managers and shift supervisors. Me specifically, I noted a discrepancy in my paycheck last year, and it took seven months of sending emails, um, being told excuses, being promised to be paid by the county, and then being ignored for months, and having to file a lawsuit against the county to get the county to actually pay me the money that they owed me. Many, many of my coworkers across the um, hospital have had the same problem. This is a systematic and malicious thing that occurs with the county that it does to its nurses. It's unacceptable practice, and it makes me embarrassed uh, to say I'm an employee of Santa Clara County. Um, it's sh a shameful misuse of taxpayer dollars, and um, it's something that must be rectified. This is malicious, it's known, it's gone on for years, and it has to stop. The people that are complicit in this are the same people that are refusing to give us a raise in line with what other hospitals in the county system are paying and um, are pushing us to go on strike here in several weeks. These practices are unacceptable and they must stop. And if anyone in the community or anyone in front of me wants to have proof of this, I have all the proof in this binder. I have all the documentation from my journey plus other nurses and I'm here to share this with anybody who wants to know about it. Thank you. And please fix these problems and pay us properly. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Susie York, and I serve as the president of RMPA. We have been without a contract since October of 2023. Months of negotiations proved unsuccessful and we entered mediation with the goal of narrowing the differences and possibly reaching an agreement. 
Mediation did not result in a tentative agreement because we were unwilling to agree to accept substandard nursing practices and substandard wages. We would have had a deal if we were willing to agree to perform mandated training sessions while simultaneously taking care of patients. Our patients deserve better. We would have had a deal if we were willing to agree to allow management to pick and choose which departments and managers receive special treatment. We would have had a deal if we were willing to agree to substandard wage increases that don't keep pace with inflation. We would have had a deal if we were willing to agree to allow management to float nurses from St. Louis in Gilroy to VMC in San Jose. The nurses at St. Louis should serve Gilroy and the surrounding community, which is our minority community. Our nurses shouldn't have to pay for a failed integration. We love this community and will continue to fight for a contract that both patients and nurses deserve. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Matthew G, and I'm a healthcare specialist for Clean Harbors, a medical and hazardous waste vendor. I come before you today to share my concerns regarding the county's RFP for the medical waste contract. The contract that is currently in place began in 2016 and originally expired in 2021. Extensions were issued in 21, 22, and 23, all of which came with significant price increases. These price increases and new fees added over the life of the contract, resulting in a staggering 52% increase in pricing, are simply unacceptable. This exorbitant rise in places undue financial burden on the county's healthcare facilities, ultimately impacting the afford affordability and accessibility of vital medical services for the county of Santa Clara residents. Moreover, the lack of competitive bidding or requests for proposals over the past eight years raises serious concerns about transparency, accountability, and fair market practices. We've been told that an RFP would be released each year since 2021, each time resulting in a one-year extension with the current vendor and a substantial price increase without alternative vendors having an opportunity to bid. These trends not only undermine the fiscal well-being of our healthcare institutions, but also call into question the integrity of our procurement processes. I encourage you to push the procurement department to expedite the release of the medical waste RFP and give not only clean harbors, but other alternative vendors an opportunity to bid on the medical waste services for Santa Clara County. Should an RFP not be released in the immediate future, another extension and yet another price increase is inevitable as the contract is scheduled to expire on June 30th, 2024. We must do what we can to stop these price hikes and promote competitive bidding to mitigate the adverse impact of these inflated costs on our healthcare system and ultimately on the well-being of our community. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the in-person speakers, correct? Yes. So one more notice to folks on Zoom, if you're desiring to speak on this on public comment, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. Anjanae, let's give that a few seconds, and when it looks like the number is holding, let me know what that is, please. We are holding at four speakers in Zoom. All right, so we will close the queue at four speakers and have the first speaker begin, please. Thank you. Our first speaker in the queue is a member by the name of Resident. Please accept the unmute. You may begin your comments. Yes, hello, good morning. I've, I've uh, wanted to uh, follow up with uh, the Board of Supervisors. I would previously um, uh, told you guys that my kids were being sexually abused, that my son had already uh, confirmed that my ex-wife was allowing him uh, to be raped by a man beginning at the age of 13, and the other children were also showing signs of the same abuse. Um, Supervisor Lee uh, thankfully offered assistance, and his, um, his assistant contacted me, um, but she was um, unable to help me at all. Um, like I told you guys, the uh, Department of Social, yeah, uh, sorry, the Social Service Agency is refusing to conduct an, uh, an evaluation, and, and in this uh, in this case, you know, such a evaluation would be a no-brainer to do. But unfortunately, um, my former attorney is involved in this, um, and um, and there's a, there are conflicts of interest because she's well connected. 
uh, in any case, uh, the, the assistant was un un unable to help me. Uh, so SSA um, uh, told her because they're children that they couldn't do any, they couldn't tell her anything. They couldn't, and, and, um, and she also said the same of the DA's office. They're, they were unable to tell her anything. So basically she got back to me and said, there's nothing that we can do. So I'm, I'm back to ask you guys, what, what can be done? What can you do? And if you can't do anything, uh, perhaps a higher authority, the, the attorney general's office can help. I, I'm not sure what you guys can do, but I would greatly appreciate it. And so would my children. If there's something that you could do, please let me know. And Supervisor Chavez has my contact information. Obviously, Supervisor Lee does too. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker on Zoom, Gardenia Angeles. Please accept the unmute and you may begin. Uh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Gardenia Angeles. I've worked as a nurse at Santa Clara County Hospitals for the last nine years. I love my work. Working for the county allows me to work with my favorite population, the immigrants, the marginalized, disadvantaged, underprivileged, houseless, et cetera. But it comes with its challenges. Accepting that I may be assaulted because there's virtually no security. Accepting that some days my workload will feel impossible since there's no standard system in place that ensures equal workload. There's no acuity system. Accepting that if my paycheck has errors, it will take weeks or months to correct and accepting a wage that is below market when compared to other hospitals in the area. It's truly a labor of love. And now with the contract that the county wants us to accept, it is also a thankless and unappreciated job. Please, do the right thing. Give us a fair contract. And take care of the nurses that take care of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Sh uh, Sharon Luna. Please unmute. You may begin. Good morning, Supervisor Sharon. Sharon, I think you might have remuted yourself. Please unmute. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please begin. Okay. Good morning, Supervisor Sharon Luna with the San Martin Neighborhood Association. Please tell me why it takes the Department of Health and Code Enforcement, in some case, cases, years to handle complaints. These departments are probably the most important to the health and welfare of the county residents. There are rules, codes, and regulations that should be followed in a timely and accurate manner. When you have food vendors, food trucks operating without permits, on public and private properties without permits or food training, uh, this is a concern for the residents. Moving to another location is not the answer. Follow-ups are important. When a project with mitigations are approved by boards, it becomes the residents to file complaints if those mitigations are not followed. Some complaints are going on for over 10 years. Why is there green netting? Why is green netting allowed to cover properties that have a code complaint filed? The county spends numerous taxpayer dollars for programs for financial support and in several languages. Please take a look at how complaints are handled and how areas uh, can see a reduction of unpermitted vendors and code violators are handled. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our last speaker with her hand raised at the close of the queue, Evelyn Torres. Please accept the unmute. You may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Evelyn. I've worked with the county for 16 years now. I love being a nurse with the county. As mentioned by Gardenia, we love our community. I'm speaking on behalf of all our nurses. We are hardworking and we deserve a competitive pay. We are the second largest hospital health system in the state and yet, yet the lowest paid in our county. Please help us get the contract we are requesting in order to retain the excellent staff that we have and to be able to continue to provide the excellent care 
that our patients deserve. Also, please extend and remove the cap of our hours of the per diems as they are vital to our staffing. Nurses are asking to be paid appropriately and on time. This has been an ongoing problem for years. If staff isn't getting paid, this in turn affects our staffing, which affects our patients. This needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Our contract expired in October, and we have been going through negotiations. However, it's not going well. We find this very offensive. Please budget for our lives. We deserve to be protected the way we protect our patients. We want to have law enforcement as soon as possible in our hospitals. This is a safety problem, and it should be prioritized for our staff and for our patients. We don't want to go on strike, but we will. We do it for our patients on every day, and we'll do it to protect them. Thank you for your time and help in this crucial matter. Thank you for your comments. That was the last speaker in Zoom for public comment. Okay, we are going to move on to item seven, which is approval of the consent calendar. And I will ask the clerk to begin by um, noting all of the current uh, items on the consent calendar, C current changes to the consent calendar. Yes, we have quite a few. I'll begin. Uh, we have a request from Supervisor Arenas to consider items number nine and 10 concurrently and a correction to item number eight to reflect possible an action that possible, action that possible a has a requirement for a four-fifths vote. Um, item number eight is to consider the recommendations relating to the fiscal year 23-24 mid-year budget review. And item 10 is to receive the report relating to um, coming to the board as a part of the fiscal year 23-24 mid-year budget review. We also have a request from administration to hold item number 13 to February 27th board meeting. Item 13 is to receive a report relating to options to establish a third round of funding in the amount of $10 million for an all-inclusive playground grant program. We also have a request from President Ellenberg to consider items number 12, number 14, number 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 concurrently. Those items are 12, consider recommendations from the proposed Blue Zones project in partnership with the City of San Jose. Item 14 is to consider recommendations relating to options for allocation in the capital project budget of the Fairgrounds Management Corporation. Item 15 is to consider recommendations relating to adding three positions in the Office of the Veteran Services, Social Services Agency. Number 16 is to approve the request for appropriation modification. Number 152 for $300,000 transferring funds from the General Fund Contingency Reserve to the Office of the County Executive Budget relating to funding of efforts relating to ag agricultural worker housing. 17 is to receive a report relating to strategies for implementing the recommendations from the Hate Prevention and Inclusion Task Force. Item number 18 is to consider recommendations relating to the Reed Hill, Reed Hill View Airport site. 19 is to receive a report relating to recommendations for fund sources to implement the second phase of energy efficiency efforts at county hospitals. Item 20 is to receive a report relating to incentive-based programs to encourage foster youth to complete medical and dental well-being exams in accordance with the Bright Futures Periodicity Schedule. Item number 21 is to receive a report relating to options for consideration, consideration regarding support of establishing a permanent OBGYN unit care, urgent care clinic in Santa Clara County's Valley Healthcare System. Item number 22 is to introduce and preliminary adopt a salary ordinance, number 20.23.08, amending section two, position salaries position salary for transfer, salary range transfers and in placement, adding 
a subsection F providing a one-time payment up to 10% of the salary upon satisfactory completion of the 18-month probationary period for specialized difficult to fill positions. We also have another request from Supervisor Aranis to add item number 24 to the consent calendar, and that is a report relating to the programmatic services provided at the hub. We have a request from President Ellenberg and Supervisor Aranis to add item 25 to the consent calendar, which is to receive the transitional age youth annual report for fiscal year 22 through 23. Another request from President Ellen Burke and President, um, sorry, Vice President Lee to add item number 26 to the calendar, which is a report relating to timely medical and dental examinations for children in the, county, the county's child welfare system. A request from President Ellen Burke to add item 27 to the consent calendar. Item 27 is to approve a retroactive agreement with Hop Skip Drive, Inc. relating to providing foster youth transportation to school of origin children-oriented services in an amount not to exceed $375,574 for a period of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024 with a two one-year extension option a request from President Ellenberg and Vice President Lee to add 28 to the consent calendar, which is a report relating to the Welcoming Center evaluation and steps to transfer operations from Seneca family of agencies to the County of Santa Clara. Request from President Ellenberg and Supervisor Aranis to add item numbers 29 and 30 to the consent calendar. 29 is to approve uh, the retroactive amendment to the agreement to, with Seneca Family of Agencies relating to providing intensive services, foster care plus programs, previously called enhanced therapeutic foster care, increasing the maximum contract amount by $1,175,616 from $2,293,368 to $3,468,984 and extending that agreement for a 12 month period through June 30th, 2024. Item number 30, to consider a recommendation relating to the Strengthening All Families Equitability Program. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's not on consent. Uh, 30, I don't, I don't see a request to put 30 on consent. I apologize. That is supposed oh, to be marked apologies. on that. Apologies. That's okay. So yes. it's on my draft. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, we have another request from administration to hold items number 37 to February 27th, and that is a report relating to options to identify and lawfully provide addiction services and treatment options in locations of greatest need and the cost of implementation. A request from Vice President Lee to remove item number 50 from the consent calendar. And that uh, item number 50 is to consider recommendations relating to a temporary sign on bonus program for lateral and academy graduate correctional and enforcement deputies for the office of the sheriff. We have another request from administration to hold item number 62 to February 27th, and that is to consider recommendations relating to real property at 4388 Alpine Road, Portola Valley. And items number 61 and 64 should reflect that they are subject to the Levine Act. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn our first to colleagues for any additional uh, changes and then we'll go to public comment so that the public understands what actually ends up on the consent calendar after all of all of our comments. Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would like to actually put item number 5050 back onto consent. Uh, that's relating to the temporary sign-on bonus program for our lateral recruits uh, for our deputies. Uh, I would like to actually request an off-agenda report with details about the payment schedule for these lateral bonuses and how it will be implemented to ensure longevity of the new lateral hires. But yeah, but we don't need to hear it today if I'm putting consent. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional uh, comments? Supervisor uh, Chavez? Yes, thank you. I'd first like to begin by um, keeping items 25 and 30 to be heard on our regular agenda. Um, 30 is the strengthening all families, equitable agreements, and I, I think it actually pertains pretty significantly to the, the issues that we're going to be discussing relative to child welfare. And item 25, I just have some a few questions that I want to ask um, staff. On items um, 
uh, and then I, I want to make comments on the other items that will will stay on consent. And I'll begin with item 24. This is our the hub. I I do just want to um, acknowledge that the the programming component of this is uh, is very important and really um, to the county executive. One um, request that I want to make is that as we are developing new uh, projects for um, use by the public, that the county executive's office work with uh, FAF and with the client agencies to ensure that the activities that we're investing in and as we're developing not just programming but the physical infrastructure of the buildings, that there is a, a much more rigorous focus on clients. And, um, and I do want to acknowledge that in this instance, the staff um, did a really good job of working with the foster youth and with the folks that are potentially going to be living in the housing. But the overall approach to making sure that we have appropriate space and that those uh, facilities are very client-centered is something that <coughs> was both a challenge with the VASC and I think uh, for me has been a challenge in this uh, facility. So what I'm gonna be requesting as part of this action is that we get a report back from the county executive on, on the best mechanisms to making sure as we're creating integrated projects that we're still able to balance that very client-centered approach and that specifically as it relates to the physical infrastructure. On item 26, the timely mental, uh, medical and dental, I, I do just want to say to the staff, this is incredibly, uh, we've moved so far forward. I want to thank all of you. I would like to ask that in the future when the timely medical and dental um, reports come forward that we include the incentive strategies that we're using to determine whether or not that's had an increase, particularly as it relates to older children, so that those reports are coming in one report instead of two. On item 27, this is Hop Skip Drive. The um, I, again, want to. This came out of the um, the Foster Youth Task Force. Actually, many of these things did many years ago, and I'm really excited that it's working. What I would like to get is an off agenda report that explains a little bit about how we're making sure that there's access, and in particular, colleagues. One of the reasons this was so important is we have you know, middle schoolers and sometimes um, uh, high schoolers who want to do after school activities, play a sport, and there's nobody to pick them up or to, to get them. So I, I do want to make sure it's not just a to and from school um, program. And when I was reading through, I, I apologize that I wasn't able to determine um, how much flexibility there is for the child. So I'd like that in an off agenda report. Item 28, this is our welcoming center. Um, I would like to recommend colleagues that this come back um, every two months until the transition's fully made to this coming back to the to the county. I think it's important both from a land use perspective but also a services perspective. And again, I, I would have kept this off because it does in some ways pertain to the other discussions we're having. But I recognize that this is this is more um, this is a got its own path. So as not to make today confusing. Um, item 29 for the Seneca Agreements for Intensive Services. Again, a really great partner uh, organization, but I would and would have kept it off, except I, I know this is such a long agenda. I would just like to make sure that when staff is presenting on the, um, the child welfare procedures and protocols, that if there are fundamental changes that need to be made in our intensive service agreements that we have that discussion as part of the overall presentation. And what I'm particularly interested in is we have, we have a very few agencies that are at the high end really serving high need children. And in some instances, I'm not sure all of our nonprofits have the, the resources they need. I, do, I don't even just mean financially, but the resources they need to really serve those high need children. Some of them are, uh, kids who run away and other things. So while we sign these agreements, I, I worry that we still have a group of kids that we're not able to serve. I'm not sure I know the answer, but I want to make sure that we're providing the nonprofits the partnership uh, and support they need to address those those children. Um, the one other thing, uh, President uh, Ellenberg, if you're, I'm fine to do this either way. I know you were very, um, mindful of keeping 12 and 22 all collected. I have had interest from the staff in putting 18 
um, on consent, and mostly because I think we have some staff that have other activities that they need to address today, and I'm not sure this is an issue that's very controversial relative to other work that we're doing. But I would defer to you if you'd like to make sure that it stays on. Quick look. I think it's. Sorry, I just need to look at my chart. This is Reed Hillview. Right. Okay. And while you're doing that, I just ha had a quick comment on your request related to item uh, 28 to come every two months. Um, could I suggest maybe it come quarterly so it stays in alignment with the other regular items coming to the board related to DFCS? I think that would be fine if it weren't. Um, put on consent. Right. Uh, so None one of, of the challenges with today consent. is that because we know the, in fact, you know, one recommendation I'm going to make as we get to the, the other conversation is that um, there are some items that I don't think can come quarterly because they have either a different timeline or a, a sense of urgency or the board may need to dive into it in a little deeper way. Um, if I could ask um, that the staff maintain that off consent, and if the board wants to put it on consent as you did today, then I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, and I would prefer to keep item no 18 problem. on. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I, I wanted to be respectful of the process you laid out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> we have been advised that certain items on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language in our published agenda. Specifically, we have been advised that items 42, 47, 48, 52, 53, 59, 60, 61, 62, 64, 69, 70, 80, and 81 on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or of the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, and, and forgive me, uh, I uh, should have indicated an abstention for the clerk uh, and for the record on item 82, which is a compensation matter. Item 82 is an abstention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, a slight jiggle that I would like to, to make, and Supervisor Arenas, I'll, I'll look to you. Um, I had also initially thought to hear 8 and 10 together, but... Um, to me, 10 really lays out what is happening in 12 through 22. So if it's all right with you, my preference would be to hear eight independently, nine independently, 11 independently, and then 10 along with 12 through 22, so that that grid is essentially teeing up 12 through 22. Will that work? Can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Because I was looking at our original agenda and I was looking at the wrong numbers. Okay. So now I'm looking at the Not consent. a problem. You had requested to hear eight and 10 together. Right. And, and that was initially my thought as well. And I just want to share my thought process. And if you agree, um, we could make an adjustment. Item 10, the mid-year budget review reports, really um, is a, is essentially a tool to help us understand 12 through 22. So I, I think it will be challenging to discuss 10 separately because it's going to be hard potentially to resist going into those individual 12 through 22 items. So what I would like to propose with your agreement would be to hear eight on its own, then nine, 
then 11, and then here 10 concurrently with 12 through okay, 22. 22. Does Perfect. that work for you? Yes, absolutely. Oh, Thank good. you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I know we need a Levine Act announcement before we vote. We haven't done public comment, but let me get a motion and a second, and then I'll go to public comment. Move, Chavez. Second, Arenas. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's do the Levine Act announcement and then go to public comment. Uh, yes. And I will, sorry, remind folks that are speaking on public comment, we had a little bit of a uh, misunderstanding earlier. Um, the, the process is the same as it has been since I uh, became president in January of 2023. We do public comment by hearing first the speakers in chambers and that speaker queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. I'm agnostic about the number of speakers, but in trying to manage, I wanna make sure that there's not an ongoing trail of speakers after we've determined the amount of time. So if you're in chambers and intending to speak on public comment for any item, please be sure that you have submitted your yellow card prior to the first speaker. And for speakers on Zoom, similarly, the Zoom queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. So if your virtual hand is raised after the first speaker has begun speaking, we're not going to hear that comment. Again, this is for purposes of, of time management in the meetings. If 100 of you, maybe not, but if 100 of you all raise your hands before the first speaker begins speaking, we're gonna hear everybody. So um, with that, let's do the Levine Act and then go to public comment. Thank you. Um, items on the, Levi on the consent calendar may be subject to the Levine Act as indicated in the language on the published agenda, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda and participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Madam President, I do also have a oral summary to um, read into the record. The executive leadership salary ordinance number 20.2. 23.06 was approved on first reading for January at January 23rd, 2023. I'm sorry, 2024 and will not be finally approved until it is adopted for a second reading, which is agendized to occur at today's meeting under item number 82. Per go government code section 54953, the following is an oral summary of the positions for which the proposed salary adjustments are required to be disclosed. NS-20 23.06 increases the flat rate salaries of the assessor, district attorney, and sheriff by 2.6163%, effective on and after March 18th, 2024, or 30 days after the date of the final ordinance adoption, whichever is later. The new biweekly salary for the assessor position is $10,861.87. The new biweekly salary for the district attorney position is $15,761.93. And the new biweekly salary for the sheriff position is $13,260.08. Thank you. Thank you, and my apologies. I, I forgot that I needed to register an abstention on item 22. Uh, that's uh, elected official salary ordinance. And uh, to note also that uh, simultaneous Vietnamese interpreters will begin starting at 1.30 p.m. for items 31 and 32 via Zoom. If uh, people want translation uh, and they are in chambers, that will be offered in room 157 where you can listen to the Vietnamese interpretation of items 31 and 32. President Ellenberg, did you mean to abstain from 82 or 22? 82. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 82. Thank you. Do we have speakers in chambers? I am looking over at the clerks. No um, additional cards. Okay, so we have one card uh, for item number 41 in chambers and currently holding out one in Zoom. Okay, let's offer two minutes to our speaker in chambers. Welcome. Okay, we have Cole Cameron for item number 41. Please approach the podium. And again, just a reminder that this is to comment on items that are on the consent calendar only. Good morning, Madam President, 
supervisors, and the great rest of the team. It takes a team to do all this, and I really appreciate all the time and effort you all put into this. Um, I sent a note along to each of you and to the clerk uh, that states basically a quick summary to minimize the amount of time I take up, stating basically that uh, 41 provides a support to our VSOs for a career path where in the past they've had some real challenge in having a place to move up to within the organization. And I'm really happy that we have number 15 on consent where we have over $15 million being brought in to be spent in the community to take care of all of the benefits they receive. And then, so we not only have the 60,000 vets that these additional uh, staff in our VSO team will help, but we're gonna get more out into the community, such as we're already doing in South County, up north over Milpitas. And when you consider the number of our 60,000 vets having community members that are family and caregivers, that's talking about 120,000 people that are in our community that are voters, that are members here, that are doing a lot in their service. And I just want to say thank you very much for considering uh, this additional item uh, to support the team here in our county that's just amazing with them, some of them being nationally certified counselors. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. And for speakers on Zoom, we'll give us a couple of seconds if anyone additionally wants to raise their virtual hands and then we will close the queue. And it looks like we're still holding at one speaker. All right, let's invite our single speaker. <laughs> okay, we have Sharon Luna for the consent calendar. Please accept the unmute. And you may begin. Good morning, supervisors. I'm not quite sure if um, the item was removed from the consent calendar, um, but uh, I'm calling to discuss uh, for item 151, 158 um, in regard to Reed Hill View. Um, in reviewing the information, there really needs to be clarification on the taxpayer funding for this item, transferring funds from the general fund to the Office of Education, at, uh, the county executive budget relating to funding of planning and outreach efforts related to the Reed Hillview Airport. It needs to be clear what these funds are and have already been used for. Um, if it's outreach with lead education or if it's a vision planning. If uh, lead outreach um, is going to be done again, what is the accountability for the previous amounts totaling over $400,000? Uh, to a nonprofit. If for vision planning, is it uh, for what company, what contacts will be using and how will it be applied? It's important that a plan is presented up front for the public and the taxpayers to know where the dollars are being allocated. And is it 300 or is it 600 that you are approving? Residents have on both the east side and in the south county are concerned about the funding coming from the general plan, general fund to the airport enterprise fund, which is really for providing airport safety. Um, hopefully you can take some time to review this and give the public, the taxpayers, a full accountability. Thank you. And that was our only speaker uh, with their hand raised at the close of the queue. Thank you very much. Um, we have a motion by Chavez, a second by Arenas. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, item eight is a time certain uh, at 10 a.m. We're pretty close, it's 10.19. Uh, and as the presenters come down on item eight to, um, to make a presentation for the fiscal 23-24 mid-year budget review, I wanna just offer kind of a few um, 
opening and, and framing thoughts. Uh, we know, uh, spoiler, that administration is, is projecting a year-end balance in the general fund uh, of about 40 million, um, or in about 15% of the $250 million deficit. Uh, I know in the past couple of years, we've relied on deleting funded but unfilled positions uh, and I'm, I'm concerned that those opportunities have largely been exhausted. Our labor costs, which is money very well invested, are outpacing our revenues, particularly in regard to the health and hospital system. We've deferred maintenance on parts of our infrastructure, and that may cost us more in the long run. Uh, in my view, these are challenges that, if not addressed this year, will be exponentially greater next year and thereafter, and um, frankly, the three of us that will be on the dais next year may need to make even more difficult and unpopular decisions. So where does that leave us today at the mid-year? I think it leaves us in the same tight spot as our county departments and our CBO partners, all of whom are being asked to manage with less, not because need has decreased, but because we simply aren't in the economic climate this county has enjoyed for the past decade or more. Uh, I'm hoping that our board today will model the restraint and tough decision making that we are asking of literally everybody else. We need to work to identify new sources of revenue outside of our general fund to fund new work. We need to identify more efficient ways of delivering services. The mid-year budget outlook that we're about to hear presents an opportunity for us to show leadership and provide Santa Clara County residents with an honest assessment on where we stand financially now and looking forward. So with that, uh, I'll turn to you, Greg, for your report. Good afternoon, uh, <clears throat> President Ellenberg, members of the board. This is Greg Ituria, County Budget Director. I'll provide a, uh, a, a short presentation. If you could advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. The mid-year review and report in your packet as, as uh, several uh, categories of inf information. It includes um, the uh, preview to the, the base budget situation for next fiscal year, uh, the base budget being the estimated cost and revenues for current level of services. It also provides the first projection for ending fund balance in our major operating funds, the general fund and the enterprise funds. And then it also describes recommended budget adjustments to keep the current uh, budget an accurate record and reflection of the decisions approved by the Board of Supervisors last June. Next slide, please. The mid-year review, begins with a comprehensive look at the first six months of all expenses and revenues in all funds operated by all departments. Staff in my office work very closely with fiscal officers in each county department to take a look at that first six months of activity, compare it to estimates for cost and revenues in the budget, and from that develop uh, recommended adjustments to the budget to uh, correct and true up the budget to reflect actual uh, cost and revenue trends. Also during the first six months of the fiscal year, uh, the Office of Budget Analysis works closely with the fiscal officers in all the county departments, with the controller treasurer's office, and employee services agency to put together estimates for the cost of operations for next fiscal year estimating the cost of uh, staff for our services and estimating all of our revenues. So that way we have an, a, an early indication of what the budget situation is for next fiscal year. And as President uh, Ellenberg noted, there's a significant operating deficit um, uh, in, in line for next fiscal year. That's approximately 250 million. Next slide, please. Uh, on that, the uh, the measurement, the $250 million is the amount of additional discretionary revenue that would be needed to sustain current staffing programs, activities in uh, all the funds that require and have some dependence of discretionary revenue, including the general fund. The main reason is that the county operating costs continue to grow at a faster rate than revenue 
We saw this last fiscal year. We're seeing it this fiscal year, and it's projected to continue into through the next couple of fiscal years. One of the contributing factors is the slower than usual turnover and property ownership that we've seen um, in, the, in the current uh, economy, Bay Area economy. This is impacting the growth rate of the property tax assessment role because the property uh, assessment at this point can only grow by 2% per year because of Prop 13 limitations unless it's a change in ownership. And with a slower change in ownership, there is less growth than what we saw a, a couple of years ago. The county property tax roll is still projected to grow at 5%, which still, while healthy, is less than we've seen in, in, in recent years. And uh, of the growing cost, you know, primarily it's the cost of labor, but there are other operating costs that are also growing and outpacing the, the growth of this revenue. Next slide, please. The other uh, endeavor at, the, at this mid-juncture is to work again with fiscal officers to estimate the cost and revenues for the next six, the remaining six months of this fiscal year to give us our first projection of where uh, the ending fund balances are looking at to be for our general fund and our enterprise fund. So at this point, we are on track to end uh, the general fund with a positive uh, ending fund balance although relatively modest considering the overall size of, of the general fund. And for the uh, health uh, care enterprise funds, currently on track to end the fiscal year uh, slightly negative, um, about 43 million. So included in your recommended adjustments is an opportunity to chew that up, provide some additional general fund investment so the hospital and clinic system can sustain current services through June. Next slide, please. Balancing the budget for next fiscal year clearly is going to be difficult, and it's going to require budgetary reductions. The, um, um, you know, over the next week, several weeks and a couple of months, the administration will be working closely with county departments, reviewing a wide variety of proposals to reduce costs, to explore opportunities to maximize revenues and, and cost recovery and to take a look at all of the uh, fund balances and, and other funds uh, that have some degree of restriction with them, such as our realignment funds, public safety realignment, health and social service realignment, to see if, how we could possibly you know, maximize the use of those funds to help minimize reductions to services and staffing and to sustain our critical safety net uh, services. We expect few, uh, if, if any, uh, uh, expansionary um, uh, proposals to be in the recommended budget because of this situation. Uh, in addition, uh, our office, in addition to working with departments, our office will also be preparing a variety of, of cost reduction options for the county executive to consider as he puts together a balanced recommended budget to bring to this board. Next slide, please. Yeah, as the board is well aware, but for the benefit of the public, a, a balanced recommended budget relying on accurate projections is a legal requirement, and that's going to mean very difficult given this, uh, this circumstance. Uh, I do expect that there will be many programs, activities, and positions that will need to be reduced in order to, to balance that budget. And where allowed, the staff will be bringing forward cost recovery opportunities um, uh, for board consideration to try to mitigate the amount of service impact uh, that uh, will be considered. And then one important challenge uh, that's relatively new is the, uh, the governor's budget that was released in January proposed a shift in law uh, to divert property taxes from Bay Area counties and, and, and cities and special districts to help the state deal with its budget deficit as well. The, the impact uh, to the county general fund if the governor is successful is uh, 32 million per year that will grow in time as uh, at the rate same rate of, of the property roll growth and just to emphasize if it's not clear this potential impact is not part of and not included in the projected 250 million dollar deficit this would be in addition to that if if there's success in that legislative endeavor next slide please the recommended modifications uh, in your packet are described in great detail uh, th throughout the packet. I'd like to highlight uh, a few. You know, 
it recognizes the additional fund balance that is available uh, for use based on the difference between the general fund ending fund balance that was estimated at the end of last fiscal year and included in the budget and the amount that we actually ended up with after preparation of the financial statements this fall. We recognize there is approximately 80 million uh, um, uh, additional amount that is used uh, and the various recommendations to replenish the general fund contingency back to board policy levels to help adjust the expenditure uh, and revenue uh, estimates to make the, the current budget an, an accurate reflection of costs and revenues and to correct errors and omissions that were identified after the budget was adopted. Also in your packet is the uh, reimbursement for a number of county pandemic response costs that the board has uh, reviewed in the past for a use of ARPA to, to fund some of those costs. At the media, we were able to capture you know, actual costs through uh, December 30th and recognize that amount and have the, uh, the budget adjustment to carry that reimbursement out. Also in your packet is a recommendation to set aside some of the unspent 2012 measure a sales tax from last fiscal year. There's approximately five and a half million that wasn't spent. Um, we track this uh, sales tax separately, even though it's discretionary in nature, it was passed uh, by the voters. And there's been a great amount of respect by this board to track that, report that separately, and to recognize its uses. That it's set aside in a reserve because of a board practice to historically treat those fund balances one time in nature towards investments that have an enduring uh, value to, uh, to the community. Um, also in your packet is the, uh, the aforementioned uh, adjustment to increase the general fund investment to the hospital enterprise funds, approximately 42 million. Some of that is offset by a reserve that the board set aside in June. If you'll recall, a $12.4 million reserve was set aside in June because the, the thought that there, there may be a need at this mid-year to provide some additional um, uh, budget uh, if costs were going to be higher than, and then the budget reflected. And then we did see that costs are higher um, uh, than, than budgeted. And so we recommend the use of that reserve that was set aside by the board for this purpose. So that partially offsets that, that, that impact. Uh, also in your packet is uh, and part of those adjustments to true up uh, uh, the budget to reflect cost includes some increase in budgeting and the sheriff and Department of Corrections and, and a couple of other public safety departments were overtime in particular, but where there are some other costs that are trending in the first six months higher than in the budget. And we recognize that um, uh, there needs to be additional budget to, to cover those costs in order to sustain those, that level of operation. And then lastly, the, the, the last notable uh, adjustment is the recommended allocation for the Behavioral Health Services Center uh, or sometimes the Adolescent psych, uh, Psychiatric Facility. It's under construction, it's, on, it's, it's running on, on time, and they're at a point uh, that they need to start ordering the, the furniture fixtures and equipment, preparing for the public art. And, um, and so there's also a recommendation to provide funding uh, to, to complete that project as well. Next slide, please. Greg, we're getting some requests for you to lean more deeply into the mic, please. Okay, I Thank will. You. How about that, a little bit better? A little bit better, Thank Just you. in time for my last slide, I know, too. I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> it took um, a while to get the message to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and then uh, on the last slide, here's just a reminder of our timeline. Uh, throughout uh, this month, uh, we'll be meeting with departments to uh, review their proposals that they're submitting to help us address the, the budget situation. And then throughout March and April, we'll be fine tuning those proposals and putting together a balanced recommended budget for the board's consideration, which will be published on May 1st and, and time uh, to prepare for the budget workshops in mid-May and the budget hearing in mid-June. So at this point, this concludes the presentation. Uh, uh, the county executive and I are, are certainly available to assist with any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm gonna go first to the public and then uh, back to the board for questions and discussion. Do we have public speakers in chambers or on Zoom, please? I have one card in chambers and currently no hands raised in Zoom. 
All right. If anyone other than the speaker who has submitted their yellow card wishes to speak, now is the moment to get the yellow card and get it in to the clerk. The queue for speaking in chambers will close when the first speaker begins speaking. So I'm looking. I don't see anybody rushing back there. So let's call our first speaker and uh, offer t uh, two minutes of public comment, please. We have a speaker by the name of Alice. Please approach the podium. Right. Good morning. Speaking about the budget and the concerns about the expenses. And I may have a way to help you reduce a significant amount of expenses. Each budget item has a source of funds. Why each expense is done, what supporters it has, is incredibly relevant. In December last year, I talked about the county's new spending on signage for mask requirements for the COVID over the winter. Last month, I talked about the deluge of federal whistleblowers, particularly Navy Dr. Macy, who's part of a petition that now has over 30, probably 40,000 signatures now, about how the military knew in 2021 that the COVID injections were lethal heart attack rates were up no, over 970%. This is medical data known in the first quarter, certainly by quarter two of calendar year 2021. Today I'd like to also talk about when each of these budget items, particularly anything touching with COVID, the impact of dark money on these. What do I mean by dark money? For example, anybody who follows sort of the non-mainstream media is probably aware of James O'Keefe and his new OMG uh, reporting company. He has a website. He likes to do sting videos. He did a series of sting videos in Maryland last year at people's doorsteps who'd given, say, $20 or $100 to Act Blue, which is the Democrat Party's dark money big thing. And they had been reported to federal authorities by Act Blue as donating, say, over $100,000, sometimes in micro donations of just $1.25. He doesn't favor any particular party. He did the same thing for Win Red in Maryland, doorstop videos, same thing. June of 2023. Anyway, thank you. there's an address. Do we have, thank you, your time is, is up. Can you um, please go to the, excuse me, the time has ended. You can leave that on the counter and we'll be happy to take that. Thank you. Do we have speakers on Zoom? I do not have any hands raised in Zoom for item eight. All right, then thank you uh, to, to Greg and to all of county staff who, who work year round on our budget. Uh, I know we've had some recognition as a, as a leader in this work on a number of occasions, and uh, this work is much appreciated. Uh, that being said, you know that I am always looking for opportunities for all of us uh, to improve. The agenda and supporting materials posted Wednesday of last week, which has allowed very limited time for the board members and our staffs, uh, let alone members of the public, to process a very large volume of information. I, I do have at least some understanding of the volume of work uh, that your office is doing, but we have to find a way to build more time into mid-year and budget reviews. Um, both the board and the public need time to realistically process publicly available information in order for our organization to genuinely operate with uh, transparency. Uh, aside from review time, uh, I'm going to reiterate a request that I have made in past years uh, that I haven't seen yet. I continue to want high-level summary information to, pre to be presented in the form of a table in addition to the narrative. Uh, I, I do acknowledge that our award-winning budget does contain excellent, if very densely presented information. The document itself is more than 200 pages, including more than 50 pages of detailed descriptions of each, of each adjustment. 
but what is still missing is a summary that explains the net impact of all of those adjustments. It, it doesn't need to be a detailed accounting, but something similar to the description of major categories contributing to the $83 million uh, revenue left from fiscal 2022 to 2023 on page 24 um, would be most helpful. Um, I want to offer my own quick summary as, as I've understood these documents for the general public, and I would encourage administration to chime in with any needed clarifications or corrections. We have a $250 million deficit looming. We have $83 million in unspent revenue uh, from that, that was identified during the process of closing fiscal 22-23. Uh, through mid-year adjustments, this $83 million will more or less cover any of the unbudgeted expenses for this fiscal year, including, as you mentioned, the $42 million hospital subsidy, $10 million to replenish the contingency reserve, uh, higher than expected OT costs, particular overtime costs, particularly in the office of the sheriff. So while the board is not tasked with making any reductions today, um, I'm, I'm just feeling very conscious of my, my duties as a steward of limited resources uh, and the upcoming challenge of maintaining county core services, namely our safety net with, with likely fewer resources. That will be um, my priority for today. And with that, I will go to any comments uh, from my colleagues on item eight. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, um, and Greg and team, uh, thank you very much for uh, pulling together what is a massive uh, amount of data and information. I wanted to start with a very broad question, and it really follows up um, Supervisor or President Allenberg on an issue that you raised, and frankly, as part of our debrief last year. And I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering, how and if there will be continued changes to the uh, budget material we get in June. And I think um, we've had some discussion about whether or not that's a program-based budget or what the best tools are. Because one of my concerns is that we demonstrate adjustments up and down, but don't really express the implications relative to services. and. For the board, and I think this is true for the public too, as, as you're looking at making changes in one pot or one category, it has implications for others. And that's not easily understood, and it's not easily understood by the public in terms of what the actual impact will be to them. Maybe I can take this question. Um, you know, and I think it's especially important in the context of the recommended budget, which will obviously be proposing a number of uh, reductions given the place we're in um, for the you know for the mid-year what administration brings forward is really um, adjustments needed to maintain current levels of I service. absolutely understand that but, but I'm, what I'm really budget, asking yeah but for the budget when so we're talking we about changes, changes yeah um, we'll be making an effort uh, we're still doing incremental budgeting because that is the the structure that we have built and a shift to a different model will will take multiple years including a shift in the system, uh, which Greg and I think have talked about in the past, um, and there's actually some description about that um, in in the uh, mid-year report. But one of the things that we will be doing is in describing what reductions are being brought forward uh, to make sure that we're providing a more thorough description of the actual impact of those actions. Um, in the past, uh, the descriptions have been um, very high level, um, and we'll be seeking more detail, and we've and including more programmatic detail in how those um, packages, so to speak, they're called packages in the budgeting system, are um, written up and presented to the board in the recommended budget. So, more more directly, um, are you going to be proposing to the board a, a new approach overall to budgeting? And I'm asking that question as clear as I can because I, every June, 
uh, every March. I feel like we've had a high level of this discussion for really for years. And I've always known that we've had limitations relative to our, um, our uh, technology. So what I'm really asking is, are we going to be able to move to a, a more um, productive method of budgeting, and I'm using that term deliberately because I want to emphasize, and that'll lead into my other questions, that um, when we're making decisions, for example, we will get feedback from you know, different um, members, mostly of our staff, who say, you know, we're leaving state money on the table, we're leaving federal money on the table, or here are the implications to a particular program. We've been working very hard, as an example, on um, through public safety and justice, working with all of our partners on uh, appropriate investments to clear backlogs and all of that, but making a change in one area may be necessary, but it has a cascading impact. And we don't learn about the cascading impact until later. And so what I'm thinking is that if we had the appropriate tool, it would actually be helpful for your staff to be able to come to us and say, programmatically, here are the impacts, here's how the money is shared. And, and you know, and I, and frankly, I've seen new technology that demonstrates that very, very clearly in, in, in organizations, maybe less complicated than ours, frankly, but nonetheless, it's available. So when and what, or maybe it's what and when. So we're doing two things. So one is um, for the upcoming recommended budget, we will still be doing incremental budgeting, uh, but we have asked for more programmatic detail to be provided, but it will be incremental budgeting. For future fiscal years, OBA is working, and Greg can speak to this more, in um, procuring a replacement budget system and specifically looking at a modified programmatic based budgeting approach um, and you know that would shift us to uh, something that would look more like some program based budgeting so what does that mean that what because what I heard you say is sort of programmatic light I don't but I don't know what that translates into and what that would equate to both for the board the public and your team what it means is we would be uh, collecting and reporting information information at the program and activity level, uh, of, which is the you know, the the desired uh, level of information. But at the same time, we would also keep track of the incremental changes from year to year, so we can answer the question: How is this different? Uh, here's a proposal. How's it different from what we're currently doing? We want we want to be able to answer that as well. So the the idea is to doing both keeping track of incremental change so we can answer the question, how is this, this proposal different from what we're currently doing, but at the same time also be able to, to uh, present that information at the program or activity level. So if we have associated data, performance, uh, key performance indicators, or any other programmatic information tied to that program, that could be shared and be looked at uh, in context with, with one another. So there are, uh, you know, we are in the process of having to replace the current budget system because the current vendor is, is getting out of the business of governmental budgeting. And we're, we're gonna identify um, a, a new vendor that's got that capability, but in addition to that, how we configure that and how we work with departments to start on their own tracking information at the program activity level, tracking revenue at the program activity level to the extent that they can. Sometimes revenues are fungible. So that way the information is gathered at that level, and, and, and that way it can be reported uh, as requested uh, in that. Uh, Does that mean that the organization will have one budgeting system? So what happens in a department will scaffold up to you and you're not creating different reports? Yes. And, um, and you've already chosen that vendor? No, we're in the procurement process right now. Could you say where you are in the process? We've, uh, we've reviewed, um, we've received proposals after a competitive request for a proposal, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this month we're receiving demonstrations from those vendors that have submitted their proposals to help understand their proposals better. And is the the folks that are looking at the demonstrations are those including the departments? themselves participating with your staff in in part in learning how to use them and determining how effective they will be at their in their particular departments 
Well, early on, there was a steering committee made up of representatives from some of the largest departments, uh, the controller's office mm -hmm. uh, and uh, IT staff as well. And so right now, uh, in those review and, and, uh, and, and, and rating right now was a little bit more of a select group uh, uh, folks from uh, IT that are going to be responsible for implementing as well as budget professionals um, as well that, under, that so we, understand. So we, lim have, we have a mix. Okay, so I just want to make sure, um, Greg, that we, are, that we are like, what I would hate is for some departments to say this doesn't work for us, so I think that's fantastic. Will this be a system that's used by the hospital and behavioral health also, or Yes, so this will be countywide. Greg, can you lean into the mic? You're hard to yes. hear. I'm yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yes. Uh, countywide, yes. Okay, so every department, will f you'll finally be able to look with a click of a button into whatever you need to see countywide. Yes, and we, we also uh, intend to continue to have a public interface so uh, interested uh, uh, public members can go into the county website and also be able to start at a high level and drill down into departments and, and programs. You know, I know we can't have anybody from our offices because we would be voting on the final contract, but I think there would be a lot of value in maybe getting folks who um, are interacting with the community a, a lot and also maybe even somebody who's retired from one of our offices to take a look at the systems as you refine them, because that would help you all understand what we would be, I mean, I don't mean uh, programmatically what we're looking for, but I mean just in terms of uh, ease of use. Um, so I would think about that just because I think it would be horrible to get all the way through that process and then have folks here say, well, that's not what we can use and and that would be you know painful for everybody. So anyway, just a recommendation. and. I, I'm happy to make some recommendations about who to volunteer for that, um, so to speak. So uh, let me go back then to the budget. Uh, but let me say, um, James, for June, I, I actually think having a timeline for when the big change will happen and when the board should expect that, like how long it will take. I always know those projects take forever. But I think being able to report out on that um, as part of the June budget discussion is really an imperative. And um, I and I appreciate that you're moving on it because I know we've been talking about this, you know, for a very long time. Uh, could you talk just a moment about the timing of the 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 you're making modifications and recommendations to mid-year, which I understand. I just want to be clear about that. And we're looking out um, as part of mid-year. We're going to be making some, I hope, some decisions today on on some. Fin financial issues. I'm concerned about two things broadly as it relates to what the implications are today for, for June. One is um, I know that we have always had an eye toward managing cash flow. And I believe we're going to continue to get feedback from our nonprofit partners over how fast we're getting money out to them especially because the state is so slow in getting money out to all of us um, in terms of refunds and repayment. And I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the protection of cash flow as we enter into this um, both mid-year but as we're looking at the future, future budget. Uh, yes, and so the, uh, the Office of the County Executive meets regularly with uh, staff from the hospital system and with the controller treasurers to monitor regular cash balances and what's, what causes cash balances to, to go up and, and, and go down for, for, that, uh, for that purpose of you know, keeping a lookout uh, for if we have uh, any concerns with trends that could put us into uh, you know, a tight cash position like the county was and during the Great Recession, which mm -hmm. uh, some folks will remember here, there were concerns about having adequate cash to make payroll uh, there during during that time. So we we do monitor that. Uh, cash overall has been you know adequate, um, but we realize when we have periods uh, like this where we are have uh, expenses at a higher rate than revenue coming in, that's at significant risk, especially with the magnitude that we're talking now. So with that regular monitoring, if we get to a point where there is a concern about uh, the county's own liquidity, uh, obviously we'll have to take um, uh, 
a number of, of, of options to the board for how to address uh, that type of concern. And if I could just yeah. add, add a couple things on the cash situation. Um, you know, one of our big, probably our biggest in magnitude cash challenge relates to the timeliness of supplemental payments to our hospital system from the state. Mm -hmm. uh, those payments run 18 to 24 months in arrears. So the, the state takes a long time to kind of finalize the calculations and ultimately make the payments. And it's quite significant uh, to our system because those payments are uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. And we're talking cumulatively uh, around half a billion dollars of payments that end up coming to us um, one to two fiscal years after the fact. Um, and so that creates basically a cash situation for us that we've been able to manage so far, but uh, could become a challenge uh, in a tighter economic environment. Um, so, you know, we, one of our legislative pieces that was part of the board's approved uh, legislative advocacy that, that happened the other day at the, uh, uh, at the January meeting, uh, this is one of the priority areas um, that uh, we've identified, which is to encourage the state to make at least significant interim payments mm -hmm. like they do in other areas, for example, to schools and others, um, even if they have to make some true up payments that run further in arrears. But that's the most significant dollar cash issue. The other thing I just wanted to note is, you know, we've had um, a goal for a number of years of trying to have a cash reserve equal to the cost of one pay period of payroll. Um, and uh, just to note for the board's awareness, um, our current balance in that reserve is only 14.2% of that goal. Um, it is far short of, of having that, that reserve of one full payroll. Could you um, say what the monetary, what that equates so to? So one, one okay. pay period for us is $194.1 million. Uh, and uh, the balance in that reserve at the end of December was $26.2 million. So um, colleagues, the reason I'm raising this is that both as it relates to our advocacy, like this to me feels like of, of all the things we're advocating for, and we're advocating for a lot that doing our best to remedy this problem is gonna be really critical because, um, for obvious reasons, I, I, but what is a bigger concern to me is that um, having that, the, um, the amount of money in arrears and the changes both in Cal AIM and all, all of the other um, structural changes we're trying to make, for me, create more risk for us than perhaps we'd seen in the past. So I, I do just wanna reemphasize that. The other issue that I wanted, the reason I wanted to raise this cash, um, this cash issue is I do think it's important as part of the um, June budget that the key policies that we have in place that we are not meeting actually be presented to the board. Because I think, James, what you just raised raises a level of um, um, severity for both us, but also all of our partners, you know, our labor partners, our community partners, to, to better understand the situation that, that we're in. And then here's my, um, my last question. On the, I, I'm always, I know we're always in a, in a weird bind with the state because of the timing in which they do their budget and the timing we must do our budget. And, and this it aligns a little bit with the cash issue that we were just talking about. And colleagues, the 32 million that the state will absolutely try to take, and I'm nervous that it will be more than that next year. So, you know, holding the line on that 32 million, making sure we're getting the repayments in a more timely way. And by the way, not just for us, but also for our nonprofit partners that get paid directly from the state and federal government when they do, like this is a opportunity for us so that they're not coming to us on, with uh, limited cash available. Um, so my question is, how much risk will need to be built into the, the um, June budget based on the state's challenges, recognizing that um, as we get closer, sometimes things become more clear. I will be frank with you, last year it didn't feel like clarity happened as we got closer. So how much are we going to be forced to... Um, to cut, frankly, because of unknowns from the state? Yeah, it's a very challenging question uh, for a couple reasons. One is most of the governor's budget proposal 
uh, consists of um, the state itself kicking the can down the road and a lot of um, accounting maneuvers to shift payments to future fiscal years, which is something the state did repeatedly uh, years ago when it was in a challenging fiscal environment, uh, as well as substantial use of reserves. Um, and what that means is um, while we, we have the excess ERAF $32 million issue that we've been talking about, which is a specific one, I think the other, the other thing that's harder to see on the horizon is what additional state-related impacts may materialize either through the final negotiation process that occurs in late May and June, uh, or uh, what happens in the subsequent fiscal year uh, when the state then has to deal with what the LAO anyway says is, a, is about a $30 billion structural deficit at the state level. Um, you know, we will make our best assessment uh, but have to put forward a recommended budget um, in, you know, in terms of the timeline of decision making in early April. Uh, and so that's probably information that will be part of the June um, revisions that end up coming to the board. I think what I would just, my point is, is that I think we need to call that out again because we're, whatever those externalities are that impact what you're going to be presenting, we need to do our very best to say this action is in response to this um, body of work. And one of them, you know, the other thing I would just say is while it won't impact this next budget year, um, Proposition 1A, am I right about what that, or Prop 1, you know, if, if there are going to be funding shifts that remove operating money from us, because of that, you know, like, and I don't know all the timings, but I think being able to, again, alert the board, even if it's, even if it's um, somewhere out in the future, again, I just think helps everybody be able to say, okay, here are the lists of risks that we have to assess, and here are the, here are the implications for those risks. Because I think what happens is that you all digest that at a really, deep level, um, and it's sometimes hard to call those things out, but absent calling them out, it's hard to see the emerging trends, and that's really what I want to make sure everybody is aware of. We, we definitely will call those out um, in the recommended budget, and there's a number of them. There's federal risks, uh, there, um, there are the ballot initiatives, including one that has qualified for the fall that um, is a significant uh, measure related to uh, taxes brought forward by the Business Roundtable, but it's not just taxes. It has a significant impact on fees and is retroactive to 2022 um, and could have a, a quite a substantial effect on us. Uh, there's a pending court challenge to that initiative that was brought by the, by the governor and others, um, so we'll see if it ends up on the ballot or not. But right now it is qualified for the ballot for November. Um, so there's a number of these items, and we will call those out um, as best as we can, even if we can't precisely quantify, in some cases like that one, the magnitude of exposure that we have. I appreciate that, and thank you. And I, I do want to say a very sincere thank you to the staff. The complexities of this are are so severe and dramatic that um, that I think you know it's it. It really is, um, to go back to, to the president's point about getting a graph or a chart, it really is, it helps us sort of follow the program. So I appreciate it. Thank you, President Allenberg. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to start off by also thanking all of the staff that had contributed to putting this budget together. I think when we do our own budgets at home, um, well, Excel is not my friend, but I, I do my best. Um, and so it's, you know, it's complicated for families. There's inflation, there's high cost of living, of course, housing, there's so, and childcare, of course, there's so many things that as a family are competing for, um, for our salary that comes in. And so we have to do what we're asking our families to do, right? And what we know that our families are doing out there in their community, and that is they're making some cuts to some of the things that they're used to. Maybe not buying that extra pair of shoes. I'm not talking about it personally, but you know, it happens. 
And so I think we need to also take a look at what do we not purchase? What do we not, what are we, what are we able to hold off on? And I think when we know that our families are struggling and doing this at home in their own household, we have to ensure that we're doing this in our own household. And so this is our home budget, right? I know this is mid-year, it's not our future fiscal year budget, but this, um, one of the one of the things that we are um, supposed to be discussing is considering recommendations, and I'll read a portion of this: is to receive a report relating to the status of the general fund budgetary revenues and blah 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 blah, and the projected status of the fiscal year 2024-2025 general fund budget. And so, we are also looking ahead, and I think that's smart. We need to take a look ahead. Um, and so I really appreciate the, the, um, the research that you're doing to take a look at um, the zero-based budgeting and the program-based budgeting that I had discussed last year um, and integrating somehow um, some kind of model that will work for us. I don't intend to um, participate or have um, my team participate in the, in the demonstrations because I don't know if that, and I, I guess I'll ask our um, city attorney, I mean our county attorney, terrible habit, um, to see if that's something that's possible because I would love for my policy and budget director to participate in these discussions and I agree with Supervisor Chavez that once we as policymakers get involved, sometimes these proposals already are baked and it's really hard for us to take a step back. And so in anticipation of this, I'd like to see how we can get involved and, and if um, there is some limitations, I think that maybe we could work out a work group um, that can come together. Tony? Supervisor, we can certainly follow up on that and give you some clarity on um, appropriate ways to participate. Got it, okay. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so I would like to, to even if we are not looking at the demonstration um, from the vendors, I anticipate that you still will be talking about um, how you will integrate either of these, well, I think this in incremental based budgeting, the zero based budgeting, the program um, based budgeting, and which, you know, which hybrid is going to actually work for us. Um, and so I think that we need to have some kind of work group that allows for our, um, our supervisors, staff to participate somehow. Um, and we don't, well, I guess we could decide at some point, but I'd love to hear the rest of what my colleagues have to say. The, the other piece to that is that I'd like to see it also integrate into the equity-based budgeting. So as we have, we're having this conversation that we are, and, and I think many of the departments already integrated um, the equity-based budgeting tool um, and framework, although I still don't know what that looks like. I think I asked for it last year and I, I, I didn't get that. So um, I think this is one of the reasons why I would love to have some, some type of um, work group that allows for us to have some focus conversations on budget and kind of the, the behind the scenes and not exciting stuff that we are talking about today. Um, all right, so I'm gonna move on to something that, that has happened in, in my district and this is a fix, oops. This is a fix from last year's um, inventory items. Um, and one of those one of, one of which is um, a request that I got from um, Nueva Vida, which is in, in South County, and they weren't able to accept the um, amount that, that was funded to them. Um, and so I'd like to request, I, I, don't, I didn't hear a, um, a motion from you, um, Cindy, so I'm, I'm gonna make a motion. Um, to consider the recommendations relating to the fiscal year, mid-year budget review. 
And I'd like to request that administration return with options to move one of my inventory requests to a different agency that also provides services in Gilroy. That agency initially requested, and I just um, mentioned that um, they declined to accept the funding award, but we have another project that the Gilroy Foundation would like to move forward on immediately. And so it's really important for me to continue to invest in South County and our Gilroy community. Um, and of course, they have a, a very strong um, and established reputation, the Gilroy Foundation does. And so I'd like to ask um, to, to make sure that our, my colleagues understand that this is, all, this is money that's already been assigned. I'm just changing um, who is actually going to receive it. So I'd like to um, have an administration return at the next board meeting with all necessary actions to award the inventory grant um, amount awarded to Nueva Vida through inventory item 137. This is the ledge file 115855 to instead fund the Gilroy Foundation South County Open Streets proposal. I'm happy to second that if there are no procedural concerns from, from administration. No, we can definitely bring that back to the next meeting to do that reallocation. Excellent. Then I second the motion. Wonderful. Um, I have another question around some of the increases that I saw because I know that we are all talking about um, how to create efficiencies. W what are we going to drop in terms of programs or services? And I'm wondering, while we are doing this, this process of trying to figure out what kind of budget um, framework we're going to use from here on, um, how are we going to determine which programs and services get decreased or get eliminated at this point? So where we are in kind of that process regarding the recommended budget is we um, provided a set of targets based on general fund to each department and that was shared back in the fall. Uh, we are receiving proposals from departments on how they would meet those targets, and there were two sets, but focusing on the primary targets. Um, and so we will now be entering a phase where OBA will be carefully reviewing those proposals to validate them, uh, and then we'll be uh, working to look at those proposals and kind of put the pieces together in a set of recommendations to then bring to the board as a recommended budget. And that process will be happening really this month and next month. Um, uh, and then the, the process of the hearings and so forth will commence. Um, different departments, I think, are in different places in terms of what tools they have to meet those targets, as well as in um, um, you know, different places um, in, in terms of kind of where they have been and, and what issues they're facing. And so, you know, one part of that process is that um, the OBA team, the chief operating officer and I will be meeting individually with each department head and their fiscal team to go over their proposals. Uh, and those will be a whole series of meetings that are going to occupy a considerable amount of time this month and the early part of March um, as part of going through that process. So we'll be meeting with each department to hear uh, about their proposals, where they're at, why they've proposed, what they've proposed, uh, so that we can try to put all those pieces together. Um, but I think we've laid out some pretty clear, broad parameters uh, that have been discussed, uh, you know, that I shared with the board back in October. Um, the first one being to identify opportunities to seek additional revenues uh, and cost recovery measures. A second being to identify uh, opportunities for efficiencies. Um, a third being to prioritize you know, safety net services. And these all kind of weave together, um, in my view. Um, and I do think there are, will be a number of proposals. It's not going to add up to the 250 needed, but I think there'll be a number of proposals in that vein. Actually, one of them is item nine on today's agenda, which is an effort from the planning department to meet um, its uh, part of its target by reducing what's functionally a general fund 
subsidy to that function uh, and then freeing up essentially that money for safety net services. So that's, I think, an example. It's, it's a modest one, but a significant one, an example of, of some of those pieces of approach. Um, so that's kind of where we are overall. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know how uh, departments are going to prioritize um, and protect safety net services because I think everything we do is part of the safety net. So how will they distinguish that? Um, th there are different, not every, most of what we do is certainly safety net services. There's no question about that. Um, but within that, there are, um, there are different operational considerations. So for example, um, it may be the case that a department has identified a way to consolidate a program between two departments in a way that generates efficiencies. Or a department um, may have identified that there was a program or a, mand a mandated service that has now been changed um, but hasn't been revisited in the last several years. Um, so you know, I think there will be some proposals. Again, it's not gonna add up to 250. But there will be some proposals uh, like the item nine for today, but there's, uh, there'll be others, I think, that are either revenue opportunities or adjustments or alignments that don't impact um, service delivery to the community. They're undoubtedly, given the magnitude of our budget situation, undoubtedly there will be a number of proposals that have significant uh, service impacts, and those will be the ones that we're gonna have to, I think, um, spend the most time grappling with. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to the efficiencies, and I mentioned this last year. I'd like to see, and I'm going to include this in the motion, some uh, some type of um, program that would allow for our frontline staff to submit proposals for efficiencies, because I know those are the folks that actually know how we're wasting a lot of our money um, or inefficient with our money. I know what it is to be a frontline staff member. Um, that's how I started at the city of San Jose when I was like 19. And we're in, as a frontline staff, you're not encouraged. Actually, it's, it's, it's probably none of your business to give program managers your opinion about how to make a program more efficient, or at least that's typical culture, right? Because it's very top down. So I'd like to see a program that is bottom up and that would somehow um, reward our employees in speaking up. Now, I don't mean provide them with any funding, but we can reward them in some way. And I, you know, you, you can come up with what that reward is. Um, uh, there, there's lots of ways to do that, I'm sure. We actually did, um we have done two things in that vein, just to, sh to share with you and the rest of the board. One is um, departments were encouraged to have their own processes in departments, and I know that several did quite robust things in that vein, um, and we actually shared some of those models with all the rest of the departments uh, to encourage that. And second, uh, we did launch last month um, a countywide um, budget suggestion uh, portal uh, which was uh, distributed to all county employees that does include some modest uh, recognition uh, and uh, we are receiving and tracking uh, um, ideas that have been received. I think we got over 70 in the first 24 hours uh, and so those are items that the OBA team is going through as well. So we have done a few things uh, in that vein and we're, we certainly will continue to look those opportunities. That's wonderful. Um, I'd like to um, get um, an off-agenda report on what that is. Um, I would encourage you to standardize um, an approach for departments as what I dare to say that those folks who think that they should not be more efficient are probably the ones who should be. Um, and so I'd like to see some type of baseline in terms of efficiency and I know that this is comparing apples to oranges and bananas um, because our departments are so different. Um, but I would like some level of standardization, some baseline. Um, 
And then, let's see, the other thing is when we are considering augmenting um, some of the, the funding, and I think this is the, this is the item um, to talk about. I think there's, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna look for my note so I can um, make sure that it's within this item since we I kind of, we kind of broke some of these things apart. Um, and that's it for me, thank you so much. Thank you, Supervisor, uh, Vice President Lee. <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just want to thank staff for the uh, amount of work that you have put in to uh, present today. Certainly, this is no uh, small feat, and of course, we have to do it all over again uh, during the workshop, and then eventually, uh, we're dealing with the annual budget again. So, you won't be sleeping much at all, I see, Greg, <laughs> uh, between now and uh, June 30th. Uh, in the meantime, just want to say thank your staff for, for this great work. Uh, this is extremely uh, helpful and important, and uh, um, and, and, and some of the problems certainly has nothing really come with the county. This is really a, 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 a affairs with the state of how they are late on some of their payments. I think the county exec has uh, stated clearly 18 to 24 months re arrear by our state. Uh, if I do that to my credit card, they would have yanked my credit a long time ago. Uh, you certainly can't do that in, in, the, in the civilian world, but uh, obviously it's the state of California. So I really appreciate the fact that we are uh, working legislatively, uh, and, and, and please uh, let us know how we could help more, uh, James, um, uh, through Dave uh, Campos' team, and how we could push this uh, with our, our very strong legislative uh, uh, representative uh, from the state level. Yeah, absolutely, and we will be 100% um, uh, seeking as much engagement as possible from the board, uh, particularly on this excess ERAF issue. And as we get deeper into the state budget season, it's it's going to be, we're going to need all hands on deck because you know it only affects five Bay Area counties. That's obviously not a majority of the legislature. Um, and so you know, while we're optimistic that we can really rally together and push back on this, it's going to be an all-in effort to do so. Um, so we, we will, um, and we've already prepared some advocacy materials, and we'll make sure that, that every board office has that. And I just want to thank you for your leadership, along with the county council's office and, and the uh, legislative office, to push this issue of excess ERAF for those who don't understand what this really means. Basically, this is going to be a 30-plus million impact to the county not one time, but every year moving forward, depending yeah. on how this is, is dealt with. This is a really big deal, so that's why I think it's important that we really have to fight this. Uh, funds that's coming from our county uh, that the state wants to uh, keep uh, uh, later on. So anyways, I just wanna make sure how, how important this really is to us. Um, so the, the fact that in the past few years, we, we have you know, survived the whole uh, COVID pandemic. We have, were able to get a lot of federal funding, and a lot of those fundings have now dried up. Uh, there's no more ARPA funds coming in, for example. Uh, the, uh, we mentioned that the, uh, the reimbursement uh, from the uh, um, uh, FEMA has been extremely slow, and we're getting, what, less than 10% so far of what we've claimed? Yes, we, we're having significant uh, challenges there, and that is a big piece of uh, federal advocacy. Um, you know, and we'll continue to keep the board updated, but the bottom line is there hasn't been much progress to date, uh, unfortunately. So we are still owed. Um, I think we've submitted nearly half a billion dollars in claims. It's like 490 some odd million uh, in claims to FEMA, uh, and we've received um, only about 50, I think, and in, in, or only about 50 has been obligated uh, by FEMA. So we have a big gap there. Um, and the process is moving, not only is it moving very slowly, um, but there are some other serious concerns. I'll give you an example, which is, and this is a statewide issue, it's not just a Santa Clara County issue, but the FEMA has made retroactive changes to their non-congregate sheltering uh, guidance 
of what is eligible to retroactively deem a lot of expenses that we incurred with our uh, COVID isolation quarantine efforts, um, retroactively deem those ineligible. Mm -hmm. That affects us significantly because we had a really robust and successful program and a huge shout out to the, the whole housing team in the EOC and Office of Supportive Housing that, that ran that effort. Uh, very successful effort, but we incurred those costs in reliance on the federal government's express guarantee that it was gonna pick up those costs and now they're retroactively changing that guidance. Cal OES is engaged on the issue because it affects counties across the state um, and uh, is uh, over, I think, 300 plus million dollar issue statewide um, and uh, is, is advocating for the federal government to reverse that. But that's an example of some of the types of things that are, that are um, we're grappling with on the FEMA side. Right. And I'll note um, as well that I will, I'm leaving for DC tomorrow and we'll have the opportunity to advocate directly with our senators and congressional reps on both the FEMA and the ERAF issue. And CSAC as a whole will be advocating particularly on the, the retroactivity of the congregate shelters because these are these are significant issues. Thank, thank you, President well Ellenberg, personally, team. for uh, fighting the cold and the snow, probably in DC, to fight for us uh, on this important funding. Um, it's in the 50s. <laughs> oh, it is. Okay, good. I checked. <laughs> Try to give you more credit here. Um, <laughs> also, the other thing is that we also talk about there's no more of uh, this tobacco settlement funds that we've been getting. Is that a done deal for now on, or is this just this one year? No, that's, and Greg can speak more to that, but that, that's, that's basically um, kind of is what it is. Yeah, and that'll be for, we'll start to see the effects of that in fiscal year after next. So that's not part of our projected deficit for next year. It, it, it's a, approximately 20 million uh, less that we'll receive for the year after that um, uh, in, in for many years thereafter. Great, um, and, and this was something that we uh, actually came up with built back in FGLC, talking about uh, having some type of a, a incentive program for employees who come up with suggestions to save money on a budget, as mentioned by uh, uh, my colleague, uh, 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 Supervisor Rennes, earlier, uh, and, and that was mentioned in the, the option of report that we received on how uh, this is actually getting an impact because of the website. Uh, so I just want to say that that's, that's wonderful. I absolutely want to hear more later on when these cost savings measures are being you know, taking place to come back to FGLC and let us know how much money has been saved uh, through these uh, uh, excellent processes. And, you know, even highlighting these employees who come up with it to give them the, the proper accolades right here uh, at the county for, for coming up with these great ideas. We'd so be I happy just, to do so. Yeah, please do that. Um, and my final question really is just more of a philosophical question about the idea of a reserve. When I think of reserves, it's really for rainy days, right? So, for example, I used to be on Sunnyvale City Council with a 20-year budget. People say, wow, that's crazy. How did you do 20-year budget? And there's this reserve that we had where it was built in such a during good years. You replenish it, right? So so you don't waste all the money. You just you just you know, so spend every penny that you excess. You try to build it up, build it up, build it up to a certain point. And when rainy day comes, as we all know, how the economic cycle goes is we're designed to actually draw it down to the point where we, in order to cover its services. So I think it's a, it's a kind of a simple concept, but this is important in the sense that, you know, uh, I guess my question here is how much of a rainy day are we in right now for the county? And if it is to the point where it is that bad, whether or not it is time for us to consider drawing down the reserves. Now, we have a policy as a board for years that the contingency reserve is supposed to be 5%. Right, that's a very important number in order to make sure that we're healthy for uh, the rainy days. So my question here is, is it raining now? <laughs> well, I, I think this is a good, this is a great question. I think it points out uh, kind of some difference in nomenclature. So um, when we talk about reserves, what we're really talking about primarily are um, just items that haven't been allocated for specific appropriation. The county doesn't actually have a reserve in the traditional sense of what you were describing, Supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the contingency reserve is actually quite modest. It's not 5% of our total budget. It's not 5% of the general fund. Mm -hmm. It's 5% uh, net of all pass-throughs. And um, 
even in very challenging fiscal environments, uh, the board has maintained that 5%. Um, and it's pretty essential because without that, there would be no cushion to handle any adjustments. Uh, you know, for instance, if there was you know something that happened in the middle of the year, um, and I, I can give you an example, one that is in my memory here at the county during very challenging budget times uh, in the 2011 cycle, which was a major deficit cycle at the county. Um, we uh, didn't receive a payment from the city of San Jose of $50 million, $52 million that was budgeted, expected. They were having their own fiscal challenges, and they deferred that payment. Uh, and so in that mid-year, that year, um, that uh, $52 million was pulled out of contingency. So um, uh, I think it would be very problematic to try to make any changes to that uh, policy, and I, wouldn't cons and I would not think of the contingency uh, as a rainy day reserve in the sense that the state, for example, has created some reserves. We don't have a reserve of that ilk uh, in at the county. Okay. Thank you so much for the uh, explanation, but I certainly do believe you know, we have to be fiscally responsible uh, um, for the rainy days, and so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Rennes, do you have additional comments? Yes, thank you. Please go um, ahead. So I, I do have some questions around, and I know this is mid-year, we, we're, we're, we're doing some fixes here. Um, but there is, you know, there's a trend here that we want to um, reduce our costs. And obviously we want to uh, correct some, some of the um, going over in some of these areas. Um, I don't know how typical it is of, of some, some of these agencies to ask for the, um, certain amounts on a yearly basis. And so um, I think that we also need to make sure that whatever we fix in the mid-year, that it, it's not really a fix if we're doing this every year, right? I mean, I think we should just budget for it or fix it. Um, wh one of the areas that I was wondering about, now I can't find it, darn it, um, is the health and hospital, I think was, um, gosh, I can't remember what the amount was, but it was significant. And about 40 million, 42 million. Yeah, there we go. Um, and, and that's from our general fund. Yes. So, uh, you're exactly right, and one of the things that uh, we are we have are doing for the base going into next year is addressing some of those very things, which is that there historically have been some significant unbudgeted personnel costs, uh, and the hospital shows up in a big way because of its size. Um, that of, of what? I'm sorry. Because of its size. Oh, because of size. Yeah. Um, that. Uh, haven't been budgeted historically. So for, for example, um, there are unbudgeted um, personnel-related uh, vacation payout and other similar costs. And there was a off agenda provided to the board a few weeks ago. Um, gosh, maybe it was in December. I'm losing track of time. Greg can remind me. But um, that described the, the magnitude of some of those in the hospital system. And we're addressing those in the base because those, those specific pieces are recurring, mm -hmm. and they have been recurring for a number of years, and they're recurring because they're unbudgeted. Um, but you're absolutely right. One of the things that I've asked OBA to do is to look at areas where there is a, a legitimate recurring item so that we can either address what's happening with the item itself or if the item is a legitimate unbudgeted expense that's recurring that we actually budget for it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, and this is not to, to pick on any particular system um, because there's, you know, there's some legitimate reasons and I'm, I'm glad to hear that, um, that there's some proactive work that's um, getting set up now to ensure that there's um, a fix for that or at least that, that, um, that one, we're obviously you've already recognized this for, for a number of years and, and going to address it 
in some way. <clears throat> so I look forward to what that looks like. The other area, and I, I hear you, you, know, you said it was partly some overtime. I think there was some facilities um, expenses involved in that, but um, I, the other area that I saw was overtime. And in one area um, was six million. Um, and so th that no longer is like, hey, oops, <laughs> I bought an extra pair of shoes. No, right, this is, this is a big deal. So, so how, how do we fix for that? So overtime has been a recurring challenge um, in particular in the Sheriff's Office and Custody Bureau um, for a number of years. Uh, and in this year in particular, you know, we, um, for this current year's budget, as the board is aware, a number of vacant positions were deleted uh, to help balance in part this current year's budget. And departments had utilized uh, salary savings associated with those vacancies to cover overtime costs. Mm. So what we've seen at mid-year is for some of those operations, um, there's now a gap that's opened up, and that's something that uh, we have to look at in terms of prep preparation of the recommended budget. And I just, I think it's, we have to really, um, and there was a, a, a um, an analysis specific to Sheriff's Office that was actually at the last FGOC meeting, that's a ledge file that we can certainly pass on to the entire board, that walked through kind of the historical trends on that. Um, but we have to, I think, differentiate between some different categories of overtime. The Custody Bureau presents, I think, a particular, um, a particular challenge because uh, we, we have to basically maintain a certain number of posts staffed 24-7, uh, regardless of the exact staffing levels or FTEs. And um, as the Custody Bureau works to continue to fill vacancies, and there's some actions, for example, item 50 that the board approved on the consent calendar today that are aimed at really trying to help make a dent in that. Um, you know, there's going to be continued overtime, and we have mandatory overtime in, in the jail in order to provide that coverage. Uh, that's different from situations where we have overtime that might be occurring uh, where there's more discretion in terms of the level of service provided to the community, where there's overtimes being used to uh, enhance or maintain a certain discretionary service level that might be desirable, but that is more optional as opposed to the custody setting where given the mm -hmm. consent decrees, it's basically right. functionally mandated on us. Right, right, right. Um, and so we're working through kind of figuring out those pieces, but we are concerned about it. Um, and, um, you know, in the, and that is one of the reasons specifically that uh, the budget target that was given to Department of Correction and the Custody Bureau was extremely modest, even though it's a very big general fund department that's very expensive because we recognize that there is not an ability to cut posts in the jail. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, uh, we had an audit for our San Jose Police Department and, and it, that's exactly what we found is that there was a lot of, um, at the end of a shift, some optional um, f uh, calls that mm -hmm. would be responded to that didn't necessarily um, well, that would create this kind of overtime um, instead of, and that would create a, a cost to obviously the city and that department that would then prevent us from hiring folks. So then we would have to fund a, an, um, a higher ahead program so that we can get folks into the door. So, you know, it was very circular in terms of trying to fix this. So I'm really glad to hear you um, say that you're looking into. Um, how to address this on an ongoing basis. And I would also add, those are s some of the specific departments that we, from the get-go, um, ensured that there were categorical exemptions from the hiring freeze. So the Custody Bureau is an example. Uh, right. County Communications is another. Dark Communications Dispatchers, uh, where we know that there are you know those few areas where we have uh, critical, mandated, 24-7 operations that have historically and for a long time had staffing challenges. 
Great, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, you know, and like I said, this is not to, um, this is not to pick on anybody, but I just looked at the, the numbers that were a little bit higher. And the other one that I wanted to ask about um, was the, the quality cleaning professionals, the it, it's six million dollars in terms of an increase in anticipated anticipated cost. Um, well, is that work already? I mean, that's already an established contract. It's just being expanded. Yes, the the actual the contract itself was approved. I think at the January twenty third meeting. I'm looking. Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. January twenty third meeting. The, this item is really a reflection of um, the, uh, and I see Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda is here if there are further questions on it, but it's really a reflection of the changing nature of the inmate population. Historically, there were many parts of the jail facilities where the um, uh, custodial and cleaning services were done by inmate workers. And given the changing nature of the inmate population and the increase, the, the reduction in lower security inmates uh, and the increase in higher security inmates, uh, that's not a viable um, mechanism. And so we've now had to replace that service with outside vendors. It's, of course, very costly given the high security environment. So that's what that is a reflection of. And that uh, the underlying contract expansion was approved, I think, last month. So does that mean that some of those inmates that we relied on are losing a source of income? They're not in custody, is what is really what it's a reflection of. Oh, I get it. Okay. All right. I, I really appreciate that. Um, it's it's a hefty number. It is to augment, but um, it's very I, significant. Yeah. But I hear that you know it has to do with um, those uh, higher level security inmates that are now integrated into our system. So. Gotcha. All right, those, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Smidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President. And uh, let me just begin by saying we're on item number eight. We are. There was quite a bit of back and forth about what got merged with what. Correct. On this item, there's a motion on the floor, I believe. And, and for those who are wondering, yes, we can hear very clearly in the back, but I just was at a bit of a loss to make sure I understood what is the motion on the floor and does it incorporate by reference any of the other items at this point? I don't think it does, it does but I not. just want to make sure. Okay. It is a motion to receive the report with additional direction from Supervisor Arenas to redirect <coughs> an already approved inventory item. If I can right. just add to that, I believe it's a motion to approve A, B, and C. Uh, with the additional direction regarding the, to bring back the reality. That was my intention, correct. correct. Thank you, yes. and, and that's page one of two in the staff report from Mr. Williams, I believe. Looking to the clerk's office, sorry to put the clerk on the spot. Um, I'm noticing that uh, I don't have packet pages where I used to have packet pages. Was that a function of, I know there were some challenges, or is that a function uh, just with this particular packet, or is that our new system and will we no longer have packet pages? Does anyone want to wade into the packet page issue? Ah, there, there comes phone a friend. Thank you. Oh, is it morning still? Uh, good morning. Uh, Curtis Boone, uh, acting clerk of the board. Uh, the packet page numbers uh, is a known issue that is being worked on. We are expecting it uh, down the line, but there is a known bug that the um, vendor is working on. Okay, thank you. I often refer to the packet pages. Many others don't really rely on them terribly heavily, I know, but uh, it's an easy way for the clerk's office to know what it is we're talking about sometimes. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the only other thing I would... Um, ask if the maker and the seconder are uh, comfortable is, and if not, I can just make it as an individual supervisor's request, I guess. Um, we, um, we started to do a little bit more in the way of focus on the issue of urban forestry, I want to say three, four years ago now. Um, and uh, I think uh, County Parks is doing much of the work in this area. 
and it's my understanding the county has received a pretty significant state grant. But just so we're all on the same page as we head into this next budget, um, I think it might be helpful if we got an off agenda report that provides the current status of the program and thinking about the current coming fiscal year, if that's possible. I just sort of want to make sure we're all working from the same understanding. We can certainly do that. And accepted. Thank you. I just asked, make that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And then as long as we're um, doing the recommended action on page one of two and incorporating the direction that has already been referenced by the maker in the second, I'm good to go and have no other questions or comments at this time. Thank you very much. We have uh, heard public comment, the report, conversation by the board, motion and second. Let's vote, please. And uh, Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion passes. And Thank you could, very much. Thank you, Greg and team. And go ahead, James. And I just wanted to express a lot of appreciation to the entire OBA team. They're about to enter an extraordinarily busy time of year where I know they'll be working seven days a week and late into the night. And um, you know, just tremendous appreciation to them and also to the departments and their fiscal staff. And I know we have a number of folks from departments who are present for this item to answer potential questions, but they have been working hard on their proposals, it's a very difficult budget process, um, the most challenging we've had, uh, I think, in, in over a decade at the county. And so I appreciate all of the fiscal teams and leadership across the county who've really put their heads together and worked with their teams and their staff all the way down to line staff to try to put the best proposals they can uh, together for consideration. So thank you. Thank you. We're going to move ahead to item nine, which is a public hearing on building plan check and inspection services fees. Welcome. Please uh, introduce the folks at the podium, at the table, and we'll look forward to your report. Good morning, President Ellenberg, board members. Jacqueline Anciano, Director of Planning and Development. And with me today is Deputy Director of Development Services and Building Official, Michael Alvarez, and Deputy Director of Administration, Stuart Petrie. Thank you for the opportunity to present. This matter before you is a request to increase a subset of our development services fees, specifically the building plan check and building inspection fees. The development services fees are comprised of land development, engineering, surveyor, fire marshal, and code enforcement fees. And outside of the development services fees, we have planning fees, also known as our land use development or entitlement fees. In 2019, the department began to review the development fee structure. This endeavor was concurrent with our review of our services. A consolidation and standardization and elimination of archaic fees um, that no longer aligned with our services was performed at that time. We are strategically bringing forward for the board to consider uh, an increase to our development services fees um, these fees are equally applied to our residential development and our commercial development. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Deputy Director Alvarez to present the analysis and the research that we have conducted to support our requests. Thank you, Director Anciano. <clears throat> this slide shows the historical cost recovery of the building section. As shown, since fiscal year 2015 until fiscal year 2019, revenues tracked expenditures uh, to where the building section had essentially 100% cost recovery. Since fiscal year 2020, uh, expenditures have significantly outpaced revenues, and over the past 10 years, uh, costs have increased by 98% in the building section. The adopted fiscal year 2024 revenue is estimated at 45.7% cost recovery. 
Next slide, please. This next slide summarizes the building permit activity since 2020. As shown, the number of applications that, that the, department, the building section has received has remained constant despite fluctuations in the total project valuation, which is used to calculate fees during the same time frame. Aside from fiscal year 2022, where the department received multiple high value non-residential applications, valuations are currently trending downwards and as such, the collected permit fees are also down. If no action is taken to address the discrepancy between revenue and expenditures, the building section will continue to rely on the general fund to supplement its services. Based on this information, the department decided to pursue a fee study, which included a time analysis and a comparison to neighboring jurisdiction that used a similar methodology to calculate fees. It was found to, that in order to achieve full cost recovery for the building section, Building permit and individual services fees would need to be increased by a total of 68%. Next slide, please. This next slide shows a sample of current fees charged for individual services offered by the building section. Looking at the first two rows, even with a proposed initial increase of 34%, as denoted in the blue column, and the column denoted in blue, these fees will be within the market of neighboring jurisdictions, such as the cities of San Jose, Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, and Cupertino. In addition, impact fees for public infrastructure, transportation, parks and recreation, and housing are not currently charged by the department as is a common practice in neighboring jurisdictions. I'll now hand the presentation over to Deputy Director Patry. Thank you. The, uh, in November, uh, a memorandum was issued by the County Executive's Office providing direction to departments to develop budget reduction strategies to address the county structural budget deficit at the time, the uh, estimate was at $280 million. Um, considering the county's structural budget deficit, the Department of Planning and Development understands the importance of generating fees to offset the cost of services provided when in context of the whole county. The Department's fiscal year 2025 primary reduction target of $2 million or approximately, is, is approximately 8% of the fiscal year 2024 adopted budget. The fee adjustment presented today for the board's consideration is estimated to generate an additional $1.7 million in fiscal year 2025. Recognizing this level of additional fee revenue would greatly minimize the reductions required of the department to meet the primary target. If no fee increases are adopted, this could require the elimination of up to 10 positions, which would greatly impact service delivery across the department. We're anticipating if, if that were to occur, the impacts could include increased review and response times for permit applications, reduction in code enforcement activity, and a delay or deferment of various board referrals and department initiatives. In November uh, of last year, this item was presented to the Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee. At that meeting, there were requests for additional information from Supervisor Rennes and Supervisor Sumidian regarding sliding scale for fees, the building permit process and timing of fee increases along with impacts to applicants, uh, customer outreach and performance measures along with additional options for consideration. Uh, in the staff report, um, there is a comprehensive response for this requested information on page 13. The fee proposal was forwarded to the Board of Supervisors without committee recommendation at that time for additional consideration by the Board. I'm now going to turn it back over to Director Anciano. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director Petri. 
So in conclusion, what we're requesting is we are requesting that the board consider approval of our, the recommendation is the 34% increase over a two year period, which would get us to 100% cost recovery in year, or fiscal year 2027. Um, in addition, we have shown an even distribution um, that the board can consider where it's an, an even 24, 22, 22% 22 over a three year period. However, the recommendation from staff is the two year 34% um, increase. This concludes staff's presentation and we are available for any questions that the board may have. Thank you very much. First, I'm gonna open the public hearing. Do we have any uh, members of the public wishing to speak on this item? I have no speaker cards in chambers for item number nine and currently no hands raised in Zoom. All right, then I'm going to close the public comment. Um, thank you, thank you very much for the um, presentation. Can you go back to the slide that had the big V on it? that one. Um, the Stanford applications represent almost half of the, the your department's um, applications, correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will start with Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you very much um, for the report. And I want to start with a, a policy question that's really directed, um, Mr. Williams, towards you, and then I want to come back and ask a process, I mean, a, a customer service question to you all. So um, from the perspective of departments that um, could or should be um, having, a, you know, f full cost recovery, and I don't know what, it, beyond planning, if there are others, there are a few, yes, but not, not a ton, but there are some others. So do we have a policy that just says we're going to keep up with the cost so that, you know, just that mm -hmm. everybody knows about so that people are less angry when they have a big increase? Yes, yeah, so the challenge has been that in the last uh, decade uh, that we have not been consistently bringing forward annual incremental increases. Right. And so one of the first things uh, that uh, I did when I stepped into this role was actually uh, create a countywide working group that includes the controller's office, OBA, county council, and internal audit to first update and assess the, the master fee schedule from across all departments uh, and uh, to work with specific departments where there is the potential for significant cost recovery, such as planning. Uh, and make sure that on a going forward basis that we are making those incremental adjustments um, even where the individual fee itself might be relatively modest the cumulative impact can, can be significant uh, so that's a long way of saying yes we have now a, um, a work group that is focused on this effort and making sure that on an annual basis these fees are brought forward to maintain cost recovery. So one thing I would recommend is that as part of the June budget process colleagues that a policy that the board can discuss and adopt gets um, included because we we really should, if if we are intending to be cost recovery, then then people should be opting out of, of uh, incremental increases versus opting out you know, because what happened here is it just didn't happen. And and that's really, a, it's alarming to the public more than it is to us. So anyway, I, I would like to just encourage that a policy come forward and that the board have a chance to discuss, you know, the, the, the framework of when something should be full cost recovery or do our best for cost recovery. Because in certain departments, we recognize that full cost recovery doesn't meet another goal. It, right, so I, I want to make sure we're that there's just a framework around it that the board understands, so these don't come kind of in in pieces piecemeal to the board. Thanks, and I appreciate that. And thinking about f 
on on whose shoulders we're putting the cost that's recovery. That's exactly right, is, and that's where the critical. equity tool comes yep. in, and that's exactly right. Absolutely. So um, so anyway, I, I would just uh, want to make that, if I can, as part of this motion for direction to come back to us. And then the second- Including, sorry, does your motion include approval of yes, the yes. increase today? Great. I'm happy Thank to you. do that. Okay. Um, I, did you say this was over the over two or three years for this? The, the department's recommendation is um, item C, which has the increase occur over a two year period. Over two years, thank you. Yes, and I'm accepting the staff's recommendation. And is there a second? Second. Great, thank you. Thank you, and then um, I, I wanted to ask another question for, for, um, for I, there's a table in here on packet, I mean on the report that's part of 11 of six, page 11 of 16 and on to page uh, uh, 12 of 16 that looks at the sample, um, let me see, sample projects that would be considered at valuation levels in table five can be found below. And what I wanted to ask is are we doing um, permits online and versus people having to come in over the counter? I mean, yeah, yeah, Michael, Michael Howard's planning development. Uh, yes, we do have um, online permitting so that people do not have to come to the front counter. Uh, all of our submittals are, are through a public portal. The majority of them are now today. So um, the reason I'm asking is just from a customer service perspective, given how big the county is, as often as we can transfer permits safely and appropriately, um, I, I know that's probably already on the at work plan, but I, I just think it goes into the category of customer service. Um, and then my last question to this um, to this uh, item is really a question for, for you all, but my colleagues as well who serve on the committee. Um, when we're thinking about the um, this department specifically, does, does the increase allow you to maintain the staffing required to move permits more quickly? <clears throat> yes, the, the, if the fees are adjusted as proposed, it would allow us to maintain the current staffing levels that the department has, um, and so that would that would greatly help us to, to maintain the uh, our target dates to review permits and issue them. So um, this actually goes in the category, I think, of a, of a question that goes back to this program-based budgeting, which is understanding the length of time that we're currently meeting goals, what our goals and objectives are in the long run, and what the implications of having people or not. And I, James, I would just say, like, of the departments that seem um, to make most sense to start to quantify uh, impacts, it's absolutely this one for a number of reasons, including that you can quantify the the intake and the, the output, but the other is that as we think about um, cost centers that add value to our overall community and then you know get taxes back to us, we don't really have an Office of Ec Economic Development, so we don't really have that lens, but I'm just gonna encourage that we, we do and that in this particular instance, you know, often when we get um, calls for from for people who need services. So, sometimes it's really just timing, and other times it's, you know, it's more. Um, I mean, there are other you know other issues that folks raise with us, but almost all of them seem to impact the amount of staffing available, at least from my observation. So, um, with that, I, I would just want to encourage that this be one of ours that we're looking at um, as part of program-based budgeting sooner rather than later. And I think that answers all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Arenas Thin Lee. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to thank all the um, the staff and um, and Jack for your leadership. I know that we've asked for a number of things on Hewlett, and so I appreciate the additional information when this um, came to us at committee. Um, and and mostly, you know, what we were hoping to achieve is to demonstrate the impact. Um, this lack of fee it has on our um, residents, um, not just the applicants, obviously. It will have an impact on the applicants. We know that very well. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the current backlog 
um, for the building division. Can you tell me how those applications received have been impacting the workload throughout the years? Through, through the president, if, if you could repeat the question, we didn't hear you. Sure, oh, sorry, let me. Can you, can you explain what the current backlog looks like for the building division? Yes. Oh, thank you, yes we can. Well, in the staff report, uh, we took a snapshot on January 24th, 2024, and we currently had 181 uh, development applications in, uh, in the queue for review in different stages of the review process. And that's typical. We typically do not fall below 140 um, development applications in review at one time. And so how does this, um, you said you, you, you're, you have 12 vacancies, correct, at this point? Actually, we have, we're at about 14% vacancy. We just had another staff person leave. And so we're, mm. we're about at 14%. Where did they go? Um, they're going to Texas. Um, it was a housing situation. They wanted to purchase and were not able to. So um, loved working That's for us, shame. but moved on. Right, yeah. I mean, you know, Texas is sending folks our way, and then we're sending folks right back, <laughs> but with money in their pockets. <laughs> um, all right, so, it, you know, the reason I wanted to ask is because I know that there's about a two-month backlog um, that building staff currently has, I think, roughly, um, and so we, we can't maintain the existing staffing levels. We need to make sure that we hire additional people that we fill, you know, the folks, that, the natural attrition that happens um, so that we can um, say that we don't, you know, we have less than 181 um, applications in the queue and that they're more closed and uh, successfully closed, right? So. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this this increase in fees is so important because we're all talking about housing and how important that is. And, and you know, we recognized even, I think you, you remember, uh, Supervisor Chavez, that we talked about how some of our own building and uh, planning uh, process was slow for our own um, projects. And so it, it, if it's slow for us, it's absolutely, you know, um, molasses slow for the rest of the residents. Although I think we put ourselves in the same boat, so it might all be the same. Um, you know, the other the, the other area that I wanted to just highlight, and this is around San San, Mart San Martin, because they're often calling in for support on code enforcement cases, and if we don't increase those fees, how will it impact our code enforcement? If I may, through the president, um, yes. We are down right now, we have four code enforcement officers. We should have seven. Um, and we've had several failed recruitments. So it- And that's seven for the whole county. That's seven for the whole county. Um, we gave two positions up um, earlier when we were looking at our, um, in 2019, when we were um, looking at our services at that time. Um, and so it, it does impact our ability in San Martin area um, to be responsive, but not just in San Martin, right. throughout the county. Right. Yes. No, I, I, I truly appreciate that. I just highlighted San Martin because we know we get a number of calls from folks. I think you heard earlier today one of those um, concerns as well. And so um, it, it, I just wanted to make sure that I, I had that uh, in there. Um, and obviously, it's just really obvious that if we don't make these rate adjustments, we're hurting our own selves. Um, just nobody's going to be happy with us. And we're not going to be happy with the outcome um, because we want to make sure that those applications not just uh, not are that they just don't remain in the queue, but they you know they at one point are completed. And so I'm really happy to be supporting this motion. Um, I know that that. Uh, we'll look forward to some other increases in rates, and I think that are, are absolutely justified because it's been so long that 
there hasn't been any increases, but I know our, our, our folks are going to feel it out there a little bit. Um, but in the end, what they'll see is um, their projects moving along a lot quicker. So I think it'll, it'll pan out at the very end. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, so uh, I actually do have a few questions here, uh, real quick. Um, so these fees basically have not been increased or updated since 2015, correct? Uh, and through the president, yes, that is correct. So, um, and, 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 and we talked about that. This is not the way we should do business, and so we should change this so that from now on we will be reviewing in a more periodic basis to make sure that we keep up with the, not keep up the Joneses, but <laughs> keep up with the, the market price just to be fair for everybody, correct? That's correct. Right, and, then, and part of the reason for this increase is really to catch up to inflation and what other people are charging. So I, I, I'm completely on, on board with that. Um, if you would mind taking a look of page 11 and 16, showing the building permit fee, which talks about the valuation of these different projects, uh, what the old fee being FY15, right, and the, this current proposed fee for FY24, Right, 24 is the fee that we're proposing to increase. 20, yes, 2024 is the fee that's being proposed, correct. Now, we're proposing 24 for 34%, but then we're also doing another 34% on top of this. Is that correct? Y yes, that is what, what is the department is recommending. So that additional 34% would occur in fiscal year 2026. Okay, so I'm just looking at the first couple of lines. Um, for the $2,000 valuation, in this case would be something like you, you use as a water heater replacement, for example, right? So uh, currently we charge 148 bucks for it. And looking at neighboring jurisdiction for it, it ranges from Sunnyvale, 127 to 270 euro. Um, so 148 actually seems like we are about there. So we're gonna imp increase it by 34%. It goes up to 198, right? So then we'll be, become the second highest, and the growth rate seems to be very high. But then that's not all, right? We're going to increase it again. So that 198 would become what? Two, 250? It would become two, 249 on the um, attachment. Right. So, so I'm just, just using this as an illustration of how uh, these fees are going to the point where I think might be. Now suddenly, instead of being within range, now we become one of the highest in the whole neighborhood. So I think there's an issue that we need to do cost recovery, but we of course need to make sure that we are not significantly higher than uh, other jurisdiction. Third thing we talk about is equity that we talked about. So for example, I understand people building you know million dollar homes and whatnot. I could see why that's charged the way it is. But for somebody who won't change a water heater, which is, you know, let's say it's a gas water heater that is not uh, uh, the most energy efficient, right? Let's say you want to go electric or something like that, right? That's going to be good. I mean, it's good for the environment, good for everybody, a couple thousand dollars. Uh, if we have to spend, you know, 200, no. I mean, again, it, it's, 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 it's just a matter of equity issue. Is this something that we really want to become the highest cost uh, uh, jurisdiction to charge some of these things? So where I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of an iffy, I, I have no issue for the larger dollar amount here uh, uh, in terms of the, the as proposed, but some of the lowest dollar amount, like the 2000 here, we, we will become the highest percentage. And then we talk about, you know, so uh, I'm, I'm like even 10,000 and below. Is, is this something that we might potentially uh, look at maybe slowing down that increase in some of these areas, just to make sure that we don't somehow, by going through this exercise, for example, on the $10,000 one, right, after one increase from 383 to 514, compared to the neighboring jurisdiction, we will be the highest. If I may, right. through the president. Yes, go ahead. If I may, through the president. What you're not seeing here is these other jurisdictions have impact fees. Okay. So if we were to demonstrate to you what the totality of the fee is that applicants are paying, they're, they're paying other impact fees for infrastructure that we did not show. When you look at the 40,000 evaluation, mm -hmm. the 75,000 evaluation, and 250, if you look at the county of San Mateo, mm -hmm. we, we are well under that evaluation of 6,959. But what we're not showing you is the impact fees, even at the $2,000 uh, valuation that 
applicants are paying on top of this evaluation for just what they submit. I was just going to say, in addition, these other neighboring jurisdictions, they will also be increasing their fees during the same time frame that, that we're adjusting ours. So that's not shown in the table here. Okay. I mean, I, I'm just, just wanting to make sure that we are within range. I mean, I'm not, I'm trying to be fair for, for everything. I'm, I'm no concerns with some of the higher uh, valuations we talk about, but some of the lower ones, I'm, I, I am concerned about it. So I, I will support the motion as is, but I certainly do want to come back to us, say, in six months and see what the neighboring jurisdiction is. Go ahead and add those impact fees in there, because I think it's important to compare uh, apples and oranges before we implement the second set of you know, uh, increases, the other 34%. Let's have another discussion on this, whether that 34% initially we have put in is too much, too little, and see how that works out. So I think it'll be, I'm very glad that you're doing this gradually, doing it two years, I think that makes perfect sense. But before we implement the second one automatically, let's make sure this board have a chance to look it over again. And as the maker of the motion, I'm, I'm comfortable with that if the seconder is. And the only thing that I would add is that, um, I also think that it may be of value to consider impact fees in certain areas. Um, so I think you have to look at the whole, if we're gonna take a look at the, um, the equity issues, you know, a big part of those issues are whether or not we have resources to fund amenities in different communities. So at least begin that, that um, evaluation. Great, Yeah. thank you. Is that okay with the seconder? Absolutely. Great, and yes. Actually, on, on that issue, um, as a friendly amendment, as uh, being the one of the greener supervisors on this board is, is on this issue, there have been a lot of discussion also regarding um, impact fees. I mean, the, the uh, fees for some of the, excuse me, yeah, some of the, oh, thank you so much, uh, President Allenberg. I, I can hear myself speak, but you can't hear me, so that's not good. <laughs> um, is, is that uh, there are jurisdictions that talks about lowering or even waiving fees regarding uh, installing, say, uh, PV panels, right? Because of the, the green impact to the whole community, what benefit we get out of it. We want to encourage people to do it, and certainly we don't want to be a detriment of making people can't afford to do this to increase fuel. So we could, come, when it comes back to us in this case, to also evaluate what other jurisdictions are doing on these type of uh, uh, environmental positive projects uh, and, and how we might consider adopting that in the future as well. I think what you're raising, um, Supervisor Lee, is really, really important because, again, I know we're gonna be talking about the equity report in a moment, um, but I think that that kind of feeds into a few things, but one of them is whether or not the actions that we're taking, including how we're financing um, programs and projects, align with the goals, the higher goals and um, outcomes of the organization. And sustainability, obviously, is such a high, um, it's, I mean, it's so important to the entire um, community. I, I think those are really good good points and obviously uh, through I you know I've, I know you will always go through committee um, but I would I think these are really important discussions to have at committee before they come to the Great. full board again thank you all right thank you we have a motion by Chavez second by Arenas uh, we open and close public comment let's vote on this item please supervisor Arenas yes supervisor Chavez yes supervisor Simidian Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. We are going to hop over item 10 for the moment uh, and hear item 11, after which we will take a 30 minute break for lunch. Item 11 is equity in countywide strategic planning and budgetary decisions. We've already heard um, some strong uh, hints and support for that on the dais this morning and look forward to this report. Good afternoon, uh, President Ellenberg and board. Uh, my name is Ana Lilia Garcia. I am the Chief Equity Officer for the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging in the Division of Equity and Social Justice. In your packet, I provided you an update on the countywide equity work, including the adoption of a countywide definition of equity, application of equity in budgetary process, and the development of the first countywide racial equity strategic roadmap. 
Briefly, since the inception of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Belonging in 2022, we have built the operational and organizational infrastructure to begin normalizing conversations on key racial equity concepts and definitions through in-person and virtual staff trainings, while also working closely with departments to build capacity, provide technical assistance, and coaching to bridge concepts with practice and process. The budget equity manual and tool is an example of operationalizing an equity lens. In year two, we have taken lessons from, the, from last year's budget process, updated the compendium of the budget equity manual, tools, resources, trainings, and have partnered with OBA to work one-on-one -on -one with departments as they develop their equity statements. The work of our office is focused on systems transformation, shifting operations and practice by proactively incorporating an equity analysis. Our definition of equity emphasizes equity as both a process and an outcome, building the individual and institutional muscle to not only have conversations about equity and its impact, but translating that into programmatic focus, centering the communities we aim to positively impact through our efforts. Departments across the county are at very different places in terms of their understanding and application of equity. To that end, to anchor, align, and coordinate countywide efforts, I am currently facilitating the co-design of the county's first racial equity strategic roadmap. The racial equity strategic roadmap development process began last summer and will conclude in June of 2024. There is countywide engagement of departments and agencies, as well as engagement and partnership with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits Racial Equity Action Leadership Real Coalition. Thus far, an equity definition, equity principles, and glossary have been developed. The end deliverable of the racial equity strategic roadmap process will outline a vision, priority areas, goals, objectives, metrics for internal county programs and services. The Racial Equity Strategic Roadmap Implementation Phase will begin in July of 2024 and will require departments to identify their role within the internal goals and objectives and work with my office to build an implementation plan to track, monitor, and communicate progress. This concludes my presentation. Uh, Greg and I are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annalisa. I will um, look first to the public for comments. Do we have any speakers in chambers or on Zoom? I do not show speakers in chambers, but I do have two hands raised in Zoom. Excellent. So let me um, remind folks on Zoom that if you're interested in speaking on this item, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. So we'll give that a few seconds to see if the number holds it too. And we are holding it too. All right. Then let's go ahead with our two speakers, please. Okay. I have a... Annalise Frankfort, please unmute. You may begin your comments. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. I love us openly talking about diversity um, and inclusion, although I feel like we really leave out certain groups, specifically straight white people. And honestly, the whole diversity thing is just pushing an anti-white agenda. I mean, it's honestly racist to give opportunities to anyone that is not white or not straight. What you're doing is being racist and sexist and homo not homophobic, but you are being sexually uh, discriminatory towards straight people. I find it disgusting that you can sit in a room like that and subjugate that one group of people while pretending to be inclusionary. A bunch of boomers sitting around in a room. Honestly, what you're doing is deciding who can suck Rabbi's cock the best and bow down to the niggers. I mean, it's fucking disgusting. And you have the audacity to pretend like you're speaking for the... Thank, thank you, you, Madam Clerk, and thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and, and just for clarification before we hear the next speaker, um, could County Council specify when it is permitted, if not advisable, to disconnect a public speaker? It, it uh, is appropriate to disconnect a public speaker, uh, Madam President, if they have so disturbed the meeting that it cannot continue to proceed in an orderly fashion. So in, in, in the case of really hateful, tragic speech, uh, 
that is not in and of itself a basis for disconnecting or, or um, moving forward. So you, we, we um, uh, should con continue to allow um, such speech in, unless it's disturbing the meeting. So let's go on to the next speaker. Before we go to the next speaker, a point of parliamentary inquiry, if I may, Madam Chair. Through yeah, the chair. please. Thank you. I apologize to any of the speakers who um, will need to pause for a moment here, but I do think it's important that we follow through, follow up on this one. Um, right. Candidly, I think we all knew this moment was coming. Uh, we, Sura Chavez and I, as you know, the longest tenured members, have sat in these chambers and heard people say things during public comment that were abhorrent. And we have, for the most part, been advised that, as I think we just were again, that those abhorrent comments were permitted um, pursuant to people's First Amendment rights. Mr. Lepresti, uh, that's a very short version on a very complex subject, but is that a fair summary? Yes, as sad as it, as sad as it is, that's correct. No. For the most part, w Mr. Lepresti, through the chair, we have, and I'm not uh, speaking for board colleagues, I'm just recalling what has happened, We've, we've sort of let folks say their piece and only occasionally leaned in to offer a public comment uh, that is a criticism of the comments that were made by a member of the public. If we did that at every opportunity, we'd be having a lot of back and forth, which has been um, discouraged, in, particularly in the non-Brown Act uh, context. Um, I want to just say very clearly, because uh, it's the piece that I remember most specifically and most painfully, I saw our colleague, Supervisor Ken Yeager, sit at this dais and listen to things that were absolutely appalling. And he had obviously made the judgment that he was just going to let it wash over. I, I can't even begin to imagine the pain that some of these comments cause members of the board members of the staff and members of the public. And I just, I just wanted on the record um, that that speech is abhorrent and has no place here, notwithstanding the First Amendment rights people have to say what they want to say. Now, I think it was literally just this morning's newspaper that said the city of San Jose is struggling with this same issue. Uh, and we've been lucky, frankly, that we haven't had much uh, in the way of a challenge over the virtual communication system. But I think uh, what we just got a moment or two ago is a pretty clear indication that we're gonna need to figure this out and figure it out fast. And it could be that the next speaker or two gives us another reason to understand that we need to figure it out and figure it out fast. So looking to you, Mr. Lepresti, sorry, but mm -hmm. this is the role, do you have any thoughts about how we can lawfully but effectively um, look at this tension between hate speech, you know, whether it's race, ethnicity, religion, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, you know, or, or, and the purported um, views that these people share with us, uh, and the first First Amendment rights that you've also counseled us we need to be mindful of. Supervisor, it's uh, certainly uh, not an easy balance. And, um, you know, there is the option, as the city of San Jose uh, recently pursued, to eliminate remote comment. Of course, that doesn't prevent in person comment of exactly uh, the type we just heard. Um, but, the, you know, the the line is, is quite distinct as to when uh, a speaker can be shut down in an open public meeting and uh, it has to be, uh, has to move beyond the line in, in which you can't proceed with the meeting in, uh, in an orderly fashion. Uh, so it's certainly acceptable uh, and constitutional to offer brief comment uh, in response uh, while action can't be taken 
necessarily uh, beyond the scope of the noticed agenda item, it is perfectly acceptable to um, offer a, a, a brief response to uh, qualify how the board is hearing it and thinks of that particular comment. So before we continue with public comment, I want to understand if that was an appropriate action or since we don't know what's in store with future commenters, uh, are we going to allow hateful, abhorrent speech to continue because it is free speech and it disrupts the meeting for the two minutes, but the meeting is then able to proceed. I wanna make sure that we're applying this consistently. Yes, that would be my advice, President Allenberg. I'm sorry, what was the advice again? It would be my advice that uh, that speech should be allowed to continue. Okay, Through I, the chair. I had actually thought that you had counseled that we cut off that speaker, so I'm, I'm if I misread that, um, my apologies. I, I think in the particular context, uh, in, in that moment, I, I understand um, uh, what occurred. I'm just speaking going forward. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Simidi and then Lee. Thank you. Um, but I also heard you say, Mr. Lepresti, and please correct me if I misheard or misunderstood, that if a member of the board wanted to lean in and offer a comment in response, that that was the prerogative of the member of the board, yes? Absolutely, Supervisor. And that could be extended, or it could be as simple and direct as leaning forward saying, appalling, yes? That's correct. Okay. I think, uh, okay, I so will say thank you, to... Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Lepresti, for the courtesy of the back and forth, I appreciate it. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. I, I, um, I do remember uh, what you're talking about relative to um, Supervisor Yeager and, and a number of speakers. You know, during COVID when we were what I would call Zoom bombed, we made decisions to end those comments right away. And so the distinction that you're drawing here and, and I consider Zoom bomb, they were racist, sexist, vile, violent, and I, and, I, and I would say disruptive to the meeting. So I just wanna make sure, um, Tony, that I understand the difference between uh, the board, you know, or any institution taking that action to, you know, remove somebody that was clearly not trying to speak on the item. And could you just maybe shape a little bit more of your advice so that both the clerk and the, and the chair understand that when leaning in is appropriate? Yes, of course, Supervisor. So in, uh, in a situation where somebody were to stand up in the chambers, for example, and try to speak out of turn, once the president has admonished uh, that particular individual, that person can be removed uh, from the chambers uh, if they don't cease their disorderly conduct. The, the distinction there is that they're not operating within the structure of the meeting. So they're not operating pursuant to a particular public comment process that we have in place at the given moment. Uh, so what we saw earlier was an instance of that where somebody tried to speak uh, when uh, they had not submitted a, uh, a proper form uh, and then uh, didn't cease to uh, their public comment. Tony, Tony, I'm asking a slightly different question, which is when someone calls in with the, in, the intent of, I mean, they begin speaking about a topic, but then they begin um, name calling and, and other other um, raising other issues that are not actually pertinent to the issue because really what I'm what I'm really wanting to understand is when can the chair rule somebody out of order during the time that they're speaking and I, and by the way I understand the point you raise about free speech I don't and and I think Supervisor Smithian did a good job of drawing that out but I'm really wondering wondering for the chair and the clerk. When, um, when is the gavel appropriate and not appropriate? It's just a very, and I know it's not always uh, black and white, but I'm wondering if you could just elaborate that on that a moment, because obviously we don't want to impede people's ability to speak, and yet we don't want to create forums for people just to attack other human beings. Sure, if there, if, if there is public comment on a particular item, agenda item, 
and uh, a person is speaking in a manner that's totally uh, outside the boundaries of the noticed agenda item, uh, then the president would have the discretion at that time to, uh, to tell the person that they need to uh, bring their comments within the scope of the agendized item uh, or stop commenting. Um, but you know, if if somebody wants to uh, engage in ad abhorrent speech relevant to the particular agenda item, that speech should be allowed to continue. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. So. Sorry. <laughs> Follow up question. So, um, for example, swear words, right? right? Those are clearly words like you know the, the N words, uh, start the F word. I mean, those words. There are certain fighting words which basically would immediately justify the shutting down of the mic, I believe. No, it's not, or I just oh, want to double check. Let me, let me go, go over that with, uh, with the county council, if you could help clarify. The words would, uh, that could be considered uh, beyond the line would be words that amount to a threat, um, in particular a threat of violence. So uh, swear words alone um, don't constitute um, a threat necessarily. Supervisor Samidian. Uh, um, Madam President, I don't know if you will recall this incident, but you were a relatively new member to the board when one of our frequent commenters made what I thought was an appalling and misogynistic comment about one of my constituents. And so, and I was presiding at yep. the time. And um, so I simply leaned in at the end of the conversation, or the end of the presentation, I should say, and said, you know, for the record, people are entitled to say what they're entitled to say, but I just want to communicate that I thought the comments were beyond inappropriate and said as much just because I thought the record needed to reflect that. I think it puts the chair, the president, in a tough spot, uh, and all of the board members uh, do we feel then that we have to essentially lean in every time there's a comment that's inappropriate? Um, that's that's going to be problematic. So um, we've gone a little far afield here, and I'm mindful of the Thank Brown you. Act, so I will uh, just say um, I think we're going to get a report from the county executive and the county council in a matter of an hour or so. And I look forward to re-raising the issue with you then. Uh, just wanted to give you a heads up in this open public space. And again, I want to convey my regret to any who are hurt by the language that uh, they have heard or will hear in these meetings. Thank you. Thank you. We've, Supervisor Arenas, did you have something on this? Oh. <clears throat> well, listen, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, we're not the only government um, agency that this is impacting. So I think we collectively need to connect with our other electeds and uh, other representatives. People are doing uh, different things. And um, there is some level of allowance or maybe interpretation of what mm -hmm. um, disruptive is. Um, and I think we, we need to ensure that we we define that for ourselves as this item, I'm not going to go back to this item, is about equity, and we have not yet defined equity amongst ourselves. So when you say equity, I say equity. <laughs> I don't know. It just is not, it's not defined at least. I don't know that there is this conversation among our electeds in terms of what we defined as, a, as equity. We did also have that, that question posed to us at the city, and so then we had to come up with a definition as well as look to our community um, to help us define what equity is. And so just bringing it back to this item in a, in a very real way, um, I think there's an opportunity for us to have this conversation, aside from, I think, what the um, county council will do in terms of, of ask what I've asked um, to see what the law allows us to um, qualify as disruptive, um, because obviously we were disrupted, and I think we we are able to end a, a call if we find it disruptive. And so, anyways, um, I hope that we will be able to come back with something. I did get a chance to hear in at, at, at the city of San Jose how I, 
this woman uh, in particular had mm. called in over and over. Um, and so I think they recognize the voice and they're ready to like to <laughs> put the button on there. Um, and I think they're thinking about some AI um, uh, technology where there is a delay and maybe a filter of, of some of the language. But um, for, for us, I, I really wouldn't want us to discourage us from uh, having this conversation, not only about equity, but um, public comment, um, because it's, we're, we're not in the center of, of the downtown area, and so people know where to go for City Hall. They're, you know, City Hall receives all complaints. They're like customer service of all government agencies, right? And whether it's state or county, it, people don't care. They're just gonna go to City Hall and, hey, fix my blah, 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 blah. And of course, and then they direct their, their concerns over to us or whom, whomever. Um, we, we don't get to have those folks kind of walking in through the door um, and to also have this conversation around equity, to, to come in and say, oh, oh, today they are talking about equity. Let me come in and, and provide my comment or let me do this over, um, over the phone. And so I would really um, want us to protect um, our conversations uh, so that they're not disruptive, but I also don't want us to um, eliminate folks um, from participating um, as the city of San Jose has. And I know Sunnyvale is also looking at some stuff since last year. I mean, anyways, we'll, we'll, come up, we'll come up with the, with the right solution, the right size for us. Um, I'm going to go back to this we, conversation. We still have another public speaker. Oh. Oh, what? <laughs> Public speaker. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to move on with this item. That's all right. But, I all right. appreciate it. I will come but, back to you. Okay. First. W wonderful. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm creating this nexus about equity and having us talk about and defining equity. And so I'd love, is, there isn't a motion on the floor, is there? No, no. No, no. We're still in public comment. Oh, we haven't this finished public comment. This is all just response. Hello. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one additional speaker, so let us hope for the best. Yvonne Jimenez. <laughs> Please unmute. Hi, good afternoon, uh, President Ellenberg and honorable members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Yvonne Jimenez with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. I'm a member of the Nonprofit Racial Equity Action Leadership Coalition, a group of over 125 nonprofits that seeks to promote racial justice and equity in our region and to combat racism, as we just heard. Um, I want to share that we've been very glad to work in partnership with ODEB um, to center racial justice and principles in our policy and budgeting. And I also want to share deep gratitude to the board for your strong stance against hate and racial injustice in Santa Clara County. And I encourage the board to seek a way to preserve hybrid access, which is so critical for so many individuals in our community. Um, I, I think that's gonna be an emerging conversation. So I just wanna flag that for you all and then thank you all for your work today. That was the final speaker. Thank you very much. I will now uh, return to Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna go one step back. I just wanna apologize to our clerk because I know that you are of African-American descent and there was a slur um, word in, in those comments and I know how um, visceral sometimes um, every, you know, the words that, that were connected with us um, to demean us and to, to put us in a place um, that people think is lesser than, and so I want to apologize on their, on our behalf, and, and, uh, and just acknowledge that, because I know that if they had said something derogatory about Latinos, it would have got me just in my heart, and so anyways, I wanted just to really put that out there. Um, and for those of you in, in the audience that are also of African American descent, I think it's important to, to recognize that. So I, I know that, that we are talking about equity today, and, um, and I know that we have a definition that is m moving forward. Um, Ana Lilia, that you've presented, um, 
And um, I, I know there's some work that's been, been done behind the scenes. Um, what, I, what I'm wondering is how, and I know that there's some changes in the equity budget tool from last year to this year. Um, so I'm gonna have a couple of questions. One is how do we integrate and, and become part of the, the, the definition of equity? And then two, how, do, how does um, the Board of Supervisors also integrate um, with the changes in terms of feedback? Okay, uh, Greg Etria, County Budget Director. And uh, I, maybe I can speak to the, uh, the, the, the role with the budget equity tool and, 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 and really what is still in, in early stages of the conversation that you know, we're trying to uh, facilitate with, with, the, with staff and, and I think what you're bringing up is how the governing body, how the board participates in that conversation is to share uh, perspectives, share uh, observations, uh, to get um, uh, contemplation and consideration in, in not just in uh, the development of budget proposals, but just in the use of, of county's resources to have uh, equity in mind. And as the report uh, mentioned, you know, it's nuanced, it's complex. There's a lot of history. We, we, we understand that and that, sh that sharing of that knowledge and that history and, and awareness. We're, you know, we're still in an early stage. So what we have uh, in your packet is the second iteration of a, of a tool to help facilitate that conversation and, and sharing of perspe perspectives. We imagine that this will evolve in each year we're gonna learn from mm -hmm. the prior year's conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, the sharing of perspectives of, of the board members with one another, but also with us too. So it helps us think about how we can continue to move forward with awareness and broadening awareness uh, as we work on resource deployment that gets facilitated through, you know, in large part, the development of the county budget, but also after the budget is adopted, how resources are managed and administered by department so the awareness is there. I know that's kind of high level, but that's my yeah. It's so on elusive. Where we're at. It, yes, and I don't mean to make what you're saying is elusive, but just the concept, right? Um, because we're, and and maybe this is because this is the beginning of these conversations. Everything is very broad, um, and what I'm trying to get to is what is concretely going into these conversations. You know, and I know there's like questions that you. Um, you pose to departments in terms of figuring out how they should um, integrate equity. Um, but not everybody believes in it, right? And so I think there's a little bit of work in, in terms of bringing folks to a common understanding and what you were just um, um, saying. And so how, how, how have we um, in your department or your office um, allowed for for folks to kind of walk together in this in this uh, equity road. That is a great question, Supervisor. Um, every department is at very different places in their understanding of equity as a definition and equity in its application. Um, so we spent a lot of time normalizing those conversations, having a shared language mm -hmm. of what equity means or why. Why are we so committed to this? Why is it a core value in our organization? Why is it a strategic priority? But most importantly, not just the why, but then what do we do about it? How do we then operationalize? Uh, the definition of equity that we've included in your packet uh, came from deep engagement um, across the county. As I've noted in my remark, introductory remarks, uh, we launched a strategic planning process of developing a strategic roadmap, a racial equity strategic roadmap. Key ingredients to that roadmap is having shared language on what is our vision for this work? Right. What is our definition? Um, what are the values connected to this work? What are those principles connected to the work? And most importantly, how are we gonna hold each other accountable as an institution in not only uh, affirming our values and commitment to equity, which is a moral imp imperative, and um, a sense, there is a sense of urgency in the work, but then how do we do the work? Uh, so normalizing conversations, giving somebody a definition is not enough, uh, meaning, 
uh, hosting a training is not enough. There needs to be continuous learning, continuous dialogue, translating a definition, translating what we're learning in trainings, which our office offers, but then working really closely with departments by providing uh, coaching and technical assistance and, and building their own capacity, building their own muscle to then have those conversations from a programmatic lens, have those conversations from a departmental lens, and then really think about what that means as they translate that into practice. Uh, so it is a long-term uh, process. Uh, we emphasize equity as both a process and an outcome because oftentimes we focus on those longer-term outcomes, You know what our aspiration is with this work. Uh, but it's also important to acknowledge that in the process, we need to also shift our orientation and the types of questions that we are asking, the type of analysis that we are putting forward, asking a different set of questions, and that is what an equity uh, mm -hmm. lens is. Mm -hmm. um, emphasizing it as a process, as an outcome, from a departmental lens, from a programmatic lens, it, become, it becomes more pragmatic, mm -hmm. because sometimes it's really difficult to focus on those longer term outcomes, but it's more of the, what can I do right now? Yeah. What can I do differently now? Um. You know, there's always that nuanced difference between equity and equal. Um, and I know that it it's everybody it, it's it's a, it's based on everybody's growth and and um, reflection and self development to get to that point. But when uh, in terms of equity and recognizing what that really is, um, because some folks may say, well, I, I love equity, I'm all about it, but we, I need it to be equal. <laughs> and it's like, well, no, 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 it, it can't be equal because equity is not based on equal. It's based on what people need um, and where they're at, right? And recognizing that there's some folks who may be um, in need uh, or have higher needs than others. Um, so I guess I'm, it, it's hard for me to uh, um, conceptualize th this kind of reflective, um, recognition and shift that we're leaving to each of the directors to then take on and then also relay to their respective, you know, chain of command uh, below. And so I, I, I guess I'd like to know more concretely, how are we doing, how are we making sure that we um, hold uh, folks to a certain baseline, to a certain um, uh, level of, of, of completion, if you will, um, because they may not believe in it, and, and that's okay. They just need to do it. Um, so how do, how, do, how do we get that done? That's a great question, and my answer to that um, is the strategic roadmap in the, that we're currently developing. In the absence of a countywide infrastructure, a countywide strategic roadmap that clearly articulates and holds all of us accountable in this work, um, you then have what I call more of a popcorn effect that happens. You know, some departments engage, some don't, um, or you have isolated examples of equity happening. Mm -hmm. They're not coordinated, they're not aligned, they're not working yep. towards a common goal, a yep. common vision, a common understanding of the why and then how are we doing that collectively and then how do we know at the end of the day beyond quantifying and qualifying the work that we are doing that is truly having an impact, right. that is truly having a, making a difference mm -hmm. for our communities, for our families in our county. Mm -hmm. And that tension of equity and equality is one that I'm very familiar with. And it's really important to acknowledge and recognize that we don't all start at the same place mm -hmm. and that people need different things just like you've alluded to. Uh, but anchoring and coordinating and aligning the work is, is really important. I work with departments across the county, different um, agency heads. Some have infrastructure or beginning to build infrastructure. Um, other departments um, have expressed curiosity. There's a, an entrance, interest. And then you have other departments that have also expressed readiness, but don't quite sh understand or know how to engage. Uh, so the goal with the roadmap, with the strategic roadmap, is to anchor, coordinate, align all of this work, and that we are able to then track and communicate the progress that we are making as departments, and most importantly, collectively as a county. And if I could add just a couple of things. I was going to make some of these comments at the end, but first, I just I really want to commend and call out Anna Lilia and the work that she's doing. Um, she's a leader in the organization and has a, a mandate to be working across 
all of our departments and programs in engaging in this and has taken a really thoughtful approach of direct engagement because you know these are conversations with individuals uh, to assess, engage them, and have them um, converse, right? at a one-on-one -on -one level across the organization. And uh, she's absolutely right, different departments are in different places. Uh, that also reflects the incredible breadth of what the county does. I mean, we're just talking about planning. We talked about um, kind of budgeting. We, we had a department that's one of the few departments that's a cost recovery department, right? Mm -hmm. But having planning recognize and understand, for instance, that when you're looking at just the budget context, what is a general fund subsidy to where we have one of the few places where we have the ability to cost recover mean? Well, it means that uh, we're subsidizing development fees for individual applicants at the expense of safety net services in another part of the organization. And one of the pieces that makes this work um, uniquely challenging in the county context on top of all the other layers that are always there, I think, in governmental entities is you know, as a safety net service provider, ensuring that across the organization, there's even deep awareness of what other people are actually doing and the impact that that has on our community. Uh, and so those are conversations that have been part of the budget process as well. But, but you know, Annalilia has really played a critical leadership role and it is a multi-year effort and will be a multi-year effort. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it. One of the things that I, I'd love to um, ask you um, to do for us, and I would love to hear what my uh, my colleagues have to say about this, but I think that we need to have a, a, a level of uh, understanding um, so that we as policymakers can also be in tune and um, aligned with what you are doing. Um, so I'm hoping um, to not only accept a, your, your report, um, but to also ask you to do a bit of a study session with us so that we can um, have that level of granular understanding. I know for some departments it's, it's easier to implement because it's a lot more concrete. And when I was with the city, I was very surprised that one of the departments that just really stood out was the Department of Transportation. Because they could take you know, um, a, a project like Project Zero, um, which aims to reduce um, uh, traffic incidents and deaths and, and harm uh, to zero. Um, and, and they had a, a whole uh, work plan that related to that, right? But they looked at who gets impacted the most by these deaths. And usually it's communities that um, not, not are walkable, that's why these, these accidents are happening because the walkable ones are the ones um, that probably do so for leisure and not for necessity. Um, and so it was really easy to concretely look at, well, where are the deaths happening? Where are most incidents happening? Where are the deaths or great harm um, taking place? And so um, it's a lot more difficult to, to maybe integrate it um, into the, the planning department, but as you just outlined, um, James, I think that that is a really uh, great example of how we should apply equity into the planning department um, because we shouldn't be subsidizing for developers that can afford to actually um, execute uh, development under their own um, um, their own uh, budget and costs. And so, so anyways, it. I know this is very elusive in terms of conversation in order to really um, make it more concrete for me. I, I would love to have a study session so that we can, um, when we have priority setting, when we have our next budget conversations that we in unison are um, not only agreeing to what equity is, but that we're also um, abiding by it. Um, not just in in commitment, but in action. And so um, that's my motion is to approve the report um, relating to the definition of equity and the application of equity in, in the countywide strategic planning and budgetary decisions and provide a study session for the Board of Supervisors. I will second that and then I just have some comments as well. Go ahead. So, um, Ana Lilia, thank you, and Greg, thank you for working together on this. I, I want to make um, 
uh, three recommendations. Uh, one is that I, I want to support very much what um, Supervisor Arenas asks. I actually think that's a pretty important discussion, and I think it's a countywide discussion, and I think if the board isn't leading on this, I think it's even harder to get the departments to, um, all of them, to, to address these issues. Um, second is that I, I am um, somewhat concerned that the, the amount of um, discussion without uh, policies that are embedded in the way we do our work, it's an imbalance in my mind between cultural shift and policy direction. And so I'm very interested in seeing um, demonstration projects through the budget process, like where you have a department that's able to make these uh, um, these distinctions and this kind of perspective that we highlight one or two of them. And even if they're not perfect, and I, it's really just to better understand how principles are being applied to real outcome. Because what I, what I worry about is that we could be discussing this for a very, very long time without um, both demonstration and implementation. So either demonstration projects or implementation projects. And then the third request that I would make it is that, um, that or second on mine is that I really, really want to see our organization using census tract data and disaggregating um, ethnic uh, origin. So I'd, I'd like us not to see Asian as often as possible. It's too big a group. And during um, COVID, it took quite a bit of doing to get us to break down those numbers, but they were incredibly important to us understanding what languages were required, what communities we needed to be in. And, and that information, I, I honestly believe, was both life-saving, but also very helpful to understand um, how big or how small the challenges were relative to the work that we were trying to do. Um, and then lastly, there are certain entities in the country uh, nationally that have been thinking about um, equity from, for a much longer time period than local government has. And one of them that is the most advanced, and it was interesting to hear you talk about transportation in the city of San Jose, it's actually transportation federally. And the reason for that is that there are grants and awards that are made relative to um, areas that they've designated as areas of concern. And if you're making a significant um, change in investment in a particular mode of transportation, you are required to do a study that demonstrates the implications and impact to communities of colors, color and those that are low income. And they use a designation, I think it's called areas of concern, that can be a collaboration, and by the way, and it's not zip codes, it's a collaboration of, of uh, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a um, amalgamation of like multiple census tracts often to be able to determine an area that is required to have a higher level of investment or research when an investment is being removed. So I would really like to see us take a look at um, what the federal government has learned, and by the way, for decades, because much of this came out of the civil rights movement as it related to transportation, and so it's not that they have a perfect system, but they have been grappling with this in, in very, very um, uh, quantifiable ways that I think would benefit us a lot to take a look at. So if that could be incorporated in your motion would be greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any final mm -hmm. comments? Supervisor Lee. <sighs> to me, it is very, very sad that the term equity has been so vilified by so often cable news talking heads and politicians and becoming divisive and bring out the hateful speech that we just heard earlier. Recently, many states and even school boards have passed laws to ban the practice of teaching of DEI issues and really shows the amount of ignorance of what equity really is. Equity is not equality, or about just making everything equal. Equity is not favoring one group over another or some conspiracy theory to discriminate any one group. Equity is simply common sense. It's about putting resources to serve those with the most vulnerable and with those of the highest needs 
first. I'll use a simple example. I have three daughters, and I love them equally. Let's say one's a problem with her math homework. One is a problem with her prom dress. And the third one just slipped and fell off the stairs and is now bleeding. Equality would mean I talk to all of them at the same time, try to deal with the problems at the same time. That just doesn't make sense. Of course, I'll jump to help the one who's bleeding first, right? I think everybody could agree on that. And yes, that's an example of practicing equity. It does not mean I love the other daughters any less. Prioritizing to serve the greatest needs is what equity is all about. And I just want to thank our county and thank your great work uh, on these very important issues, despite some of the misunderstanding that we've seen all over our nation, that we are definitely doing the right thing right here in Santa Clara County. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And I am so excited about and energized by this work and look forward to, to being extraordinarily supportive in, in moving us forward and making sure that those who need the most receive the most. So thank you. Uh, we have a motion by Arenas, a second by Chavez. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. And President Ellenberg? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, it is 1.04. We are going to uh, break for 30 minutes, and we will return at, let's call it 1.35. Thank you.
Good afternoon. It is 1.35 and we will resume as soon as we've got a quorum on the dais. We are ready to go. Jess, would you take a roll call, please? Supervisor Arenas. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Stamidian. Vice President Lee. President Ellenberg. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum with four. And Supervisor Arenas is present. You have a quorum with five. Excellent. Uh, let me make a, a, a couple of comments regarding structure of the next group of items. Item 10, which is where we will begin, is the fiscal year 2023 mid-year budget review reports. This contains a list of, um, of uh, board-led items. That, that are then, sorry, uh, enumerated below in numbers 12 through 22. A couple of those have been put on cons uh, 13, no, just 13 has been held to 227. And the reason that I ask to hear these concurrently is just that they're all, um, they are all related. So we will take public comment uh, in, a, in shortly on items 10 and 12 through 22, exclusive of 13. So, um, Greg, do you want to make a presentation or do you want to go? Uh, we will, hang on everybody. Let me just organize myself here. We will hear public comments singularly for all of the items. We'll hear a summary of item 10, and then we will go through each of the items 12 through 22 for individual consideration. But if you want to set up item 10 um, for us, or you, you want to. Yeah, I can maybe briefly can present that. item 10, and then you could do public comment. And then I think for the other items, staff is available, but we haven't planned um, individual presentations on the other items. We're available for questions. Perfect. So what uh, we did with item 10 is, is it's really a, just a, a, a summary um, table of the other items that the board has. And there's two tables here. Uh, one shows the items uh, that you have later on the agenda um, related to uh, items that have been referred to mid-year. And then separately, there was a table that was requested from FGOC that shows those items as well as a handful of other items that have been um, approved by the board as referrals uh, for consideration since the beginning of the fiscal year. So we went back to the beginning of this fiscal year uh, and created that table. And it shows a summary with amounts broken down to estimated one-time ongoing costs, ongoing revenues, um, net ongoing costs, FTEs, and potential funding sources. So it's really just to provide the board with an overview summary. Uh, and like I said, we're, uh, we have staff present to answer questions about the specific items as the board goes through them after the public comment. Thank you so much, and, and I will make a framing introduction as well before we go to public comment. And, and I want to thank uh, James Yu and, um, and Greg and your teams for creating this uh, decision-making tool, which is essentially what it is for the Board of Supervisors. 
and and looking at that that grid or that tool, it lists up to twenty eight million dollars in one time costs and six million dollars in ongoing costs uh, for new work. And I want to highlight a sentence in the report that says, and I'm just quoting from the report, the general fund impacts listed below are not currently incorporated in the projections for FY24-25 budget deficit, and if approved, will necessitate the identification of additional departmental reductions. So I just want to anchor this conversation about potential new work in the context of the discussions we've already had this morning and that we'll have about three months from now in which we will actually be tasked with closing a $250 million gap between revenues and expenses. Um, so with that, let's hear public comment on items 10 and 12 through 22. And following that, we will go through each of those items individually. Do we have public speakers in chambers or on Zoom? Just for clarity, we're hearing 12, 14, 10, 12, and 14 through 22. 10, 12, and 14 through 22, yes. Thank you. I do have five cards in chambers and currently one hand in Zoom. Okay, I'll remind everybody that if you are intending to speak on any of these items, and it's a big list, uh, please submit your yellow card now. They're in the back of the room. The queue for speaking in chambers will close when the first speaker begins speaking. So I'll give a moment to, for anyone else that wants to fill out a yellow card. For those of you who are on Zoom, the queue for Zoom speaking will close when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. So now would be an excellent time to raise your virtual hand. I'll issue one, uh, one final reminder when we move to Zoom comment. Do we have more folks filling out yellow cards? I have at least one on the way. Okay, so let's hang on for a moment. Lena, one on the way or more than that? Okay, those are the final cards for this item. All right, we can, oh, when you're ready, begin with the, okay. the first batch of we'll speakers. Accept that and how many do we, I'm so sorry again. Yeah, two on, two on Zoom, so we're up to six in chambers, two on Zoom. Eight, okay, so we are at two minutes per speaker, but I'll, I'll note for folks on Zoom, if, we, if, if our number creeps up above 15, we're gonna move the uh, allotted time to one minute, but for right now, we are at two. Thank you. And holding at eight total, our first speaker will be Dan Furtado, followed by Gerald Arnold, followed by Cole Cameron. Please queue in the center. Dan, please approach the podium. Again, that'll be Dan, followed by Gerald, followed by Cole, followed by Mike Hennessy. Dan Furtado, are you in the room? Members of the Board of Supervisors, good afternoon. My name is Dan Furtado. As you may know, I serve on the Campbell City Council, but I'm not here in my capacity today to speak to you in that uh, role. I'm here as a veteran to talk to you about item number 15, and I strongly encourage you to vote in favor of item 15, both um, A and B listed there. Uh, applying for veterans' benefits is not a simple project. Um, it requires a great deal of patience and uh, a great deal of uh, counseling and advice from the veteran service officers that you have working for you. They do work very hard, but they're overworked and they need more help. And this item will allow you to provide three additional veteran service officers to meet that need. Um, we, of course, as you know, are the sixth largest county in the state of California. We have many veterans living here. As a matter of fact, the persons in the combined uh, membership of the National Guard and the Reserve Forces are greater in California than any other state in the Union. And um, those individuals have shown their commitment to the nation um, by being, there are more people from California in the military services who have served 
the nation, and sadly, more members from California who have lost their lives. So I myself am a veteran. I served two years in active duty and 38 years in the Army Reserve and retired from the Army. Immediately after my two-year assignment, um, I worked for the Veterans Administration Hospital in Palo Alto for over seven years as the clinical coordinator and pharmacy and residency supervisor. So I worked very closely with um, Vietnam veterans in particular, but also at that time, a number of World War II veterans and others. I know how important veterans' benefits and services are to our veterans. And although I know Secretary McDonough, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, is working very hard to streamline the process, nevertheless, it is a federal bureaucratic agency. And it does take time and skill to properly apply for veterans' benefits. So I certainly hope that you will consider item number 15 in the positive and vote to support them. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon. I'm Cole Cameron, a veteran, Army, Vietnam era, chair of your Veterans Commission, and a few other things. But uh, let's focus on the important things here. Uh, I really appreciate the previous share. Um, I walked into the VA to just understand what my fellow vets had to go through in getting a rating for disability. I just asked that simple question. <clears throat> they immediately said, go to your VSO office. Yesterday, I took an 80-year-old Native American vet to that office for his 10th appeal, 10th. Patience? This is since 1962 for him. So the workload that we've talked about of 350 to 400 cases per each of our small team uh, is really overloading. So we, if we have those three more additional openings, that'll help. Uh, the other thing that I have mentioned in statement I've sent to you each is that for over the 60,000 vets and their families, which makes it over 120,000 uh, voters that are members of our community, they received $15 million in the last year that has then respent back into the community for a budget of only $2.6 million. So as an old budget guy, you know, that's almost a 6x return. I think that's pretty good. Uh, the other thing we're doing is we're doing more outreach. We partner with the VA and our VSO team out in the encampments. We have regular office hours in South County that we're going to add to other regions in the area. And I just would really appreciate your support uh, of this issue uh, based on what I hope is numbers quantified. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have Gerald Arnold or Mike Hennessy? I'll take Mike. Okay. <laughs> Mike for 100. That is my name, by the way. After Mike will Hello, be... Hello, everybody, and oh. I hope uh, everybody survived the storm we just got over. Uh, I'm here today. I'm not going to go through all the statistics and the numbers and, and the graphs that everybody has here today. I'm pretty much more well-known for being... Um, I'm like a, an ambassador to the, uh, to the veterans. I do a lot of events, which many of you know, and I know many of you have had family in the military. I came down with a real serious cancer a few years ago. And uh, so seeing these people that need help is probably more emotional for me than most anybody. And some of you I know very personally and know, know what I went through, but I still help with the parades. I still do the veteran memorial stuff. And the more you get into it, the more you kind of really get into it, knowing how much help they need. And what they're asking for, which I got a phone call last night at 9 o'clock, what they're asking for is kind of, I don't want to use the word I'm looking for, but I want to say mice nuts, but I don't know if I can say that, but they need three people to, three people to get on board and help. And I'm here to support them, the veterans, and if there's something we can do to help these guys. And, and uh, I said, well, I better bring some real cannons, and I got General... Kent Hillhouse with me today, just to help support what we're trying to do. And, and I don't think we're asking the moon. I know you guys have been dealing with so many issues, with so many people that have that are probably, and I know some of them sitting here today is very important. And I know this is important to people that are here that, on this case, and of course myself, but 
I just hope you can see it in your hearts to make this thing work for the veterans and, and uh, people like me that's been through it. So, hey, God bless everybody. I don't need the full two minutes, so please try to make that work, okay? Nice to see you. Our next speaker is Major General Kent Hillhouse to be followed by John Sweeney, to be followed by Gerald if he has returned. Good, af good afternoon. Uh, glad to see you all and glad we're here talking about 15 today. It's an important issue. I just wanted to talk about the recent wars where we brought a lot of people into the service from 2001 until probably three years ago. and. These people mostly deployed over to the, the two wars we were fighting. Uh, this said, uh, they're starting to get out of the service now. We're going to see massive amounts of people retiring starting this year. So the numbers are going up for veterans. They're not going to go down. It's going to be an increase over the next 20 years, and they'll need the help of all of you to vote this, get, get an affirmative vote on this 15 A and B. The other thing is, um, I wanted to mention, there, there's a dynamic nature to the veterans coming in and, and, the, and the way that things are happening. Uh, w one thing is they're giving up on Asian orange. That's behind us now. That's in the rear view mirror. But now they have these burn, burn pits, which are going to create problems for the VA and, and also getting reassigned. When I left, the, I spent my last five years in the Pentagon. First two years in Vietnam, and that's a 35-year spread there. So um, I was able to get my out processing done to the Walter Reed, and they forwarded the information. And the VSAO, actually, it's a minefield for anybody, including myself, to go through that process of getting into the VA. So they put me through. It was, it was easy and uh, worked well. But there's people who, for example, Agent Orange comes back to bite those older people like the 70 and plus who, if they contage, uh, say, for example, prostate cancer, then they're, they're just ride it out until they die of old age, but not with Agent Orange. It aggravates the cancer, and they can die within two years of uh, being in, in, in infected with the prostate cancer. So looking forward to your support today, and thank you for letting me talk. Dear President Ellenberg, Vice President Lee, and County Board of Supervisors, I'm here to speak on item 17. On behalf of Dr. Marianne Dewan, the County Superintendent of Schools, I'd like to register our support for the recommendations of the Hate Prevention and Inclusion Task Force. Dr. Dewan proudly served as a member of this task force and strongly endorses the strategic efforts to prevent and respond to hate incidents in Santa Clara County. This work is critically important to the county, and we support an immediate implementation timeline. One of the five focus areas of the task force was to recommend school or school-based programs to promote a change in our community culture relative to hate crimes and violence. And the Santa Clara County Office of Education remains ready to partner in efforts to combat hate, especially those that include education and training. Thank you for your leadership, partnership, and commitment to the expansion of services supporting our most vulnerable neighbors. Last call for Gerald Arnold. Appears to have left the room. I still have one hand raised in Zoom. All right, I'll just remind uh, folks again that if you are on Zoom and wishing to speak on this item, now is the moment in which to raise your virtual hand. We will uh, wait just a few seconds to see if our uh, list increases above one, and then we will close the queue when the first speaker begins. Holding at one. Thank you. Our speaker is Angel Madero. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please unmute and go ahead. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Board of Supervisors. My name is Angel Madero, and I'm Chief of Staff for Councilman P. Ortiz, representative for Eastside San Jose Council District 5. On behalf of the council member, we share our strong support for item number 18, recommendations relating to the Reed Hillview Airport site. Councilmember Ortiz looks forward to a robust and community-led planning and outreach effort for the Reed Hillview Airport site, 
that imagines a space that serves our entire community. We thank the staff and Board of Supervisors for bringing this item forward today and respectfully request approval of item number 18. Thank you. That concludes public comment. All right, thank you very much. Then we are going to move to item uh, 12, which is a Blue Zones project report. And I will look to... Excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. For, forgive my repeated process questions, but since we went through this earlier, would it be appropriate at this point to simply, since we had public comment on, I think, all of the items, mm -hmm. 12 through 22, with the exception of 13, which has been held. Correct. Mm -hmm. Would it be appropriate if I was prepared to make a motion, which I am, to say move approval of item 10 and 12 through 22, with the exception of item 13, which has been held? I, no, respectfully, um, because it's not clear that each of 12 through 22 will receive the same uh, direction. That's how we do the consent calendar, I'll do respect, Madam Correct. Chair. Correct. And we took comment, but we took public comment on we all of them. We just took public went. comment on all of them as if it Correct. were a single item. Right. So that doesn't, so each 12 through 24 should still require an individual vote. Um, I myself am not prepared to accept, to vote yes on, on all of them. So I would like to hear each one. I, I, May I just, I wanna ask a, a, sure. a question I'm back. through. Yeah, I'm gonna ask a question through council because I, because the way we took public comment versus the way we're voting on the items is a little confusing to me and I don't wanna, I wanna make sure we're not okay. making an error. Thank you. So when taking items together in this fashion, uh, it would be the discretion of the motion maker as to whether to vote on in individual items. Uh, or, I'm sorry, to make a motion on individual items or to make a motion collectively. So such a motion could, could be made on the collective items after public comment on the collective items. But we, so again, we, we, we were hearing items, we were hearing all of these items together. We took one public comment. So we could then discuss each item separately and then vote on them separately? Correct, you could, you could either make a motion on all of them together or you could make a motion as to you know, item 12, for instance, and then make a separate motion as to item 14 or whatever it might be. Oh, I, I, I would thank you for help. I didn't realize that. So I, I was prepared to second a motion to take through, all of them. Through the chair to county council, if I may, um, If the motion was to approve all of those items together, which is where I was leaning in, um, would individual board members have the ability, as they do during the consent process, to simply lean in and say, I am an I vote except as to item such and such? No, the, the appropriate way to handle that would be to treat the motion as the motion on the table. If they wanted to make an amendment, they could uh, make an amendment. Um, so if somebody got three votes for an amendment to remove items such and such, that's they correct. could remove it. That's correct. All right. Then, Madam Chair, I, and just to get a motion on the floor, I will move approval of items 10. <laughs> 12 through 22, with the exception of item 13, which has been held. And if there is a second, I will speak briefly to the motion. I would second that. Thank you. Could I, just before you go on, could I make one more point of clarification just so everybody's on the same page, Supervisor? Um, that there are a number of different um, items in this group of items that are four-fifths vote. So, uh, so the vote would need to carry on a four. The motion would need to carry on a four-fifths vote. Excuse Thank you. And, and I'm a little bit concerned about uh, direction that that I thought I had um, clarified where it was appropriate to ask to hear the items. Uh, concurrently, meaning that we would still hear each item, but with an understanding in the framework that they were all part of this same grid that is at the top of, that, that comprises item 10. Um, it was 
not my intention to have a vote on, on all of them and certainly not to have discussion on each of those items within this uh, larger conversation. Through the chair when it's appropriate. And, yeah. I, I would say that if you're taking them all together, then the, then the motions could go either individually or, or be grouped together. Okay. I think it, it's, it, it's the chair's prerogative to hear Got the it. So if I want to make a substitute motion to the motion on the table, which is to hear them all together, to hear them individually, I can do that, look for a second, or do we, can we do that? You could certainly make a substitute you can make a substitute motion to uh, to go one by one, okay. um, and to as to a particular item. Yes. Question. Question. Let me see if I can do this first. So I would make a substitute motion that we hear um, that we that we discuss each of the items, twelve and fourteen through twenty two and look for a second on that. Could you repeat that? Yeah. I'm trying to, my, my intent in hearing these together was for context. It was never to look at, uh, look for a single vote on all of the items. And I do apologize if that's what was conveyed, um, but I want to make clear that that was not my intent. Um, and that I am interested on at least a, in at least a very brief conversation about each of the items. So that was my substitute motion in over Supervisor Simidian's motion, which is to approve all. Got, got it. So your motion would um, apply to the same items 12 to 22, correct? Is that uh, 12 and 14 through 22, yes. 12. Because 13 is, is held. Oh, got it. Oh, that's right. Okay. So um, is that a second that you'd like to make? Y yeah, I'll do a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then we would vote first on the substitute motion. That's correct. Point of order, Madam President. Sure. Uh, I will just point out for the record mm -hmm. that the consent calendar we approved this morning yes. says request from President Ellenberg to consider items number 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 concurrently. Correct. If it is the intent of a member to, quote, consider them concurrently, then that means one discussion, at least, about all of the items at the same time? Because I just heard you say a moment ago, I thought that you wanted to have individual discussions, which does not sound like concurrently on 10 items to me. I, yes, I agree that that was confusing, and I'm trying to clarify that what I meant, I hear what you're reading, um, but for me it was intended to be a conversation that would still discuss each item. We can do them one at a time, or we can, that which seems the most organized way, or we can hop around, but I'm not, again, the, the motion that I made is in lieu of a single vote. and. Apologies if the concurrent language was misused in this case. All right, I will be a no vote on the substitute motion. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's take a vote on the substitute motion, please. Can I just clarify? Do I have that c captured correctly to discuss? That's correct. Which is different from consider. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Aranis? And just to be clear, that's on the substitute motion, not on the correct. motion. Correct. Aren't we supposed to have discussion? Yes, but first we have to see if we can if we can discuss each one. If if my motion fails, then we vote on Supervisor Simidian's motion. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. No. No. Yes. Yes. And okay. That carries with three. Thank you. Um, so if we go through. Um, the items 
absolutely ask a question. I, I'm, I'm trying to, to make this as transparent, but yes, same time as efficient. And I appreciate what my colleagues trying to do is make it as efficient as possible by putting all this together. Can we process it like we normally process our consent items so that let's say we have the whole group together and then for those that we might have some discussion, pull those out separately? Well, I think Would that we, be easier? If, if I call an item for 12 and there's no discussion or comment on it, we don't have to discuss it. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm that just trying to, yeah, I've again, made I'm a little bit of a mess of this, and I'm trying to uh, to clean it up as best as I can, with the goal being that we look at number 12. Um, I, I see I see the problem with the votes. You are, you are all correct. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to make one point yes. that that my vote here is not about efficacy. It's about consistency with the with what we voted on earlier. That, that's why, I'm, why I, I made that, yeah. the second. So I just wanted to say that in response to what, I almost said Professor Lee, I don't know why, uh, but uh, um, with, with uh, Otto, you got a new title today, but with, uh, with Supervisor Lee, thank you. Okay, yes, I, I, I sincerely apologize. I now understand the confusion that is uh, on my part for thinking that I was being more efficient. Um, and in fact, not so doing. Um, nonetheless, we, we have approved the motion to consider each item, to discuss each item individually. We can then at the end, I guess, figure out if we're going to, if some of us will vote Yes on all items, yes and no on some of the various items. I can't make this 10, any messier. 14 through 22. Yeah. Item 12, yes. yes. Madam Super Chair, did I understand correctly that just now you were suggesting that we might have the conversation about 10, 12, 14, yes. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, 11 items, and then take the votes? Can we undo the concurrent request and vote on each of these items individually? And I guess you could all fire me, but then someone else would have to be the president. I, I had understood the last motion to do just that. Separate votes. That, you, okay. yeah, you're, that you're undoing the concurrent motion, uh, and this would allow for yeah. you to, to make uh, the, then let me make a, a, a request votes. for a motion to approve item 12. Except we missed item 10. Correct. It, Madam Chair, could I be it, of help here? I think I can. I really you do. think so? I do. I, I know God I've asked a lot you, of Joe. questions, but I'm going to forge ahead and see how it works. All right. Move approval of item 10. Someone want to second that? I'll, I'll second it. And I, I'm going to make. I'm sorry, you said what? Item 10. Item 10. Because we skipped item 10. I'm okay. going to second that, and then I do have a, a direction attached to item 10. All right. We have a motion and a second on item 10. And direction on this would be that the staff did a great job of listing out one-time ongoing costs, ongoing revenue, ongoing net general fund costs and FTEs and potential funding sources. What I wanted us to be able to look at with the new budget system would be um, to look at cost uh, recovery and cost avoidance. And as was exemplified in the discussion about veterans, you know, having that veteran staffing, because I, I think we're gonna have to be looking at a more robust whole cost accounting, and that's what the new system should be able to do for us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions on item 12? 10. 10, 10. Item 10. Item 10. Jess, let's vote on item 10. May I just verify the mover is submitting the seconder is Chavez on the motion to receive this report with direction? Correct. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That passes with five. Phew. Okay. Item 12. Move approval. Second. Uh, this is the blue zones item. Are there uh, comments or questions from any of my colleagues? All right, Let, uh, is that a question? Yes. Go ahead, please. It is. Um, so uh, I'm wondering how this um, Blue Zones project uh, falls in line with the violence prevention strategic plan that was approved last week. 
or the week before. When? Whenever we met last. <laughs> So I'm gonna, may I respond to that? This is something I brought forward. I, I think what my expectation would be is that um, as we're partnering with the city of San Jose on their youth master plan and a number of our plans that they're much more integrated. And I think this will allow us to use metrics from many, many different approaches, including by the way, the Latino um, assessment too as they move forward. Um, and so this would allow us to take all of the different work we're doing, partner with the city of San Jose and choose with the community leading the way, the most appropriate appropriate metrics for the for two districts in the city of San Jose in partnership with the county. Two districts? Yeah, meaning they're going to use they're really focused on Seven Trees and May uh, the oh, Mayfair. Oh, the sites area. in in the youth plan. Yes. That that will also line up with the blue zones. Yes. So there will only be blue zones in District Seven and District Five. Mm -hmm. City Council so I think that when the city finishes their I mean when the city is discussing their youth master plan it may actually be broader than that but that is what they're recommending today yeah that's what they're well you know what I have a concern about that because I know that uh, there are other areas that are just as um, in need of support um, I'll, I'll support it this time, but I think that it needs to go beyond and, and really touch um, my district, to be honest with you, in South County. Um, because it's never been central to everything we talk about. You know, San Jose is so unified in a way that, okay. yeah. I mean, it's just a huge community. And South County just is kind of an afterthought. So I want to make sure that, it, I know it doesn't make sense with the city of San Jose, because obviously that's outside of their boundaries, but it isn't outside of our boundaries for county. Appreciate that. And we're responding to their to their lead on this, but I will tell you, I concur with you. I think it would be great to do something like this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian, do you have a comment on this item? No. We just move. No, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'll just um, briefly note appreciation that this is part consistent with the uh, governor's master plan on aging. I like that the, um, uh, the dollars are being matched by the, by the city and that it feels very, um, very in line with, with, the, with the overall board priorities and work that we're trying to do to create healthier and safer communities. So we have a motion by Simidian, a second by Chavez, an additional comment by Chavez? No, no, I was no. ready to vote. Okay. We really need two different color lights, like a vote light and a comment Maybe light. Maybe just give us each a paddle. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> Let's vote on 12. My sincere apologies. Item 12 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member, as described on page 3 of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. With that announcement, Supervisor Arenas. Before thank you, you begin, Supervisor Simidian first. Thank you for the courtesy. We have been advised that this item on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member, as described on page three of our agenda. I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately <coughs> so that I might promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I might promptly recuse myself. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Jess. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with five. Thank you very much. Uh, we've noted a number of times that item 13 is held to uh, February 27th. Item 14 is the Fairgrounds Management Corporation Capital Project Budget Allocation Report. Is there a motion to approve? I so, would move. Oh, thank you. I'll second. All right. Um, does anyone have comments on this item? I, I do. Um, 
So I'm wondering, this is, is this, this is a one-time um, subsidy, I'm going to call it for, for lack of a better word, um, that will be allocated to, to the Fairgrounds Management Corporation, correct? Correct. Perfect. And I know that they had some issues with re or establishing future um, events happening at um, in in their respective parking lot, and so I know that they had a loss in terms of revenue. Um, and so, so I'm 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 trying to be very cognizant of what I said earlier in terms of what um, how we should. Uh, be dealing with our household income, if you will, like comparing this to any household income that um, most folks are dealing with as they are trying to figure out their child care and the mortgage or the rent or um, any of those things. And so um, it's just one of the reasons, it's, it's only the only reason that I ask about this. Um, otherwise, I, I mean, I think it's, I love, I love the fairgrounds and I love uh, the experience that we all, uh, including children, especially children, um, get to have um, as they're growing up in San Jose. So absolutely happy to support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make some comments as well. I, I, too, am a big fan of the fairgrounds uh, themselves. But I have really significant concerns um, around this item. And that largely stems from the fact that the, the FMC financials lack transparency. And despite repeated requests, I've received no information about capital improvements, return on investment, and how proposed improvements would fit into long-term redevelopment plans. Per their agreement with the county, FMC should be paying for all capital improvements, but that is not the case. Um, Supervisor Arenas, you asked if this is a one-time investment. Uh, yes, singularly it is, but between 2020 and 2023, the county has contributed nearly $8 million to FMC. And we received this data directly from administration because that information wasn't made clear in the current financial documents provided by the management corporation. And in the context of this current request for 500000 for capital improvements, I want to highlight a few concerns with the way the capital expenses are presented in this 2024 plan. First, the report fails to include the current cash balance, which is certainly relevant information to be included in, in a development plan and improvement program. According to the financial statements submitted to the FMC board, the cash balance as of November 30th was $1.9 million, which is $2.5 million lower than the 22. 2022 year-end balance of 4.4 million. There's no mention that this amount is less than FMC's stated goal of four-month cash reserves, which would be 2.4 million. Second, the report outlines more than $2 million in capital expenses, but it is not made clear that no funding currently exists for these projects and that they are not factored into the budget. Exhibit A9 is titled Projected Capital Expenditures, and language throughout the report implies these projects are already funded to take place this year. That is not the case unless the board advances the funds. The, the plan is essentially a, a, a wish list. Specifically, the 2024 FMC plan summary states, quote, exhibits A1 through A9 summarize the projected revenues, expenses, net income, and capital expenses for 2024. The executive summary states funding is included in the 2024 capital expenditures budget for improvements required to develop plans for a proposed sports bar and restaurant in the current off-track bedding building, redevelopment of the concert arena, and perimeter fencing. I don't believe this is a correct representation. Again, the funding is not included in this plan, absent another county cash infusion, which would again be contrary to FMC's obligation to fund capital improvements, presumably with dollars other than county general funds. Important, um, I would like uh, the board, and I, I would add, uh, sorry, uh, as a separate, um, 
motion or additional piece, I would like the board to receive a more detailed explanation of the request for additional funding as it relates to operating losses in 2023. FMC stated they lost $1.5 million in revenue in 2023 due to county use of the fairgrounds, necessitating the request for $1.4 million from the board. The justification does not account for the fact that the county reimbursed $900,000 for the use of the fairgrounds and that the 2024 business plan only estimates a total of 1.5 revenue, $1.5 million in revenue, not profit, from events for an entire calendar year. I am not prepared to approve this expenditure today, and I, I intend to vote no, but turning to the, the CEO, I would like a recommendation on what additional support or oversight would be appropriate to approve improve transparency and strategic planning for any additional cap county funded capital investments. When that is in place and all of the information described above had been, has been provided, I would be ready to reconsider a vote on this item. Uh, if, if I could first just uh, provide one um, item of clarification for Please. the board, which is why I had the light on and then I'll respond to your, uh -huh. your inquiry. Um, the OBA Gregatoria sent a notice to the board this morning, but we need, did need to correct one item in the legislative file, so this is really for the public's benefit, but the second sentence of page seven of eight, the number should be corrected from 4.2 million to read 8 million, and that was based on uh, updated analysis from OBA uh, late yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to correct that for the benefit of the public for the record. Uh, regarding your question, I think we can come back with um, ideas and options regarding the relationship between um, the county and FMC. I think that's probably an item that requires a little more robust conversation, and we can do a little analysis on some models and, and kind of look at what else, um, both look at the history regarding the creation of FMC, with which I have a decent amount of familiarity, but also look at some of the options that might be available to the board. Uh, okay. Because I do think that is um, a relationship between the, the core county organization and FMC that needs to be strengthened. Thank you. Then, then if there's a second, I would offer that as a substitute motion. I, I think it can't be added to yours because they're in contradiction. Yours, sorry. Um, so I would, I would make a substitute um, motion that requests this information to come back before approving uh, additional funds to the fairgrounds. I have a question, Madam Chair, before considering the potential of a second or a vote, if I may. All right. There was a question earlier, and thank you, because I, I found it a helpful question about the allocation of funds. And I think the question was, that was this an allocation of funds to the FMC, the Fairground Management Corporation? I, I read this as an allocation of funds to the Fleets and Facilities Reserve, which is different and would give me a different level of comfort, respectfully, than if it was a direct transfer to FMC. So those are those are two, to me, others may have a different point of view, but to me, those are two very different judgment calls, giving the money to FMC or giving the money to Fleets and Facilities uh, Reserve to be processed out. Maybe that is correct. Uh, act, recommended action B is to uh, appropriate the money into a reserve within the FAF budget. That is item B. Yeah, that's the appropriation that's that's listed. Being yes. Requested. So to be clear, and though, so thank you for that clarification. In that case, I would offer instead not a substitute motion, but. Um, but a friendly amendment to Supervisor Lee's motion that along with approving the action to put this money into a reserve at FAF, that we get all of the information I requested before any further dollars, including these, are allocated directly to FMC. That, that's, would that work? That's fine. Yeah, that's, that's fine. fine with me too. I, I would just make a comment to follow up on that, and that is that, um, FMC now does quarter, or I think they still do quarterly reports to F, to the FGOC. Yeah, FGOC. And what I would recommend is that I think the 
the request that you're making should actually go to FGOC first and then to the full board because I think, and, and I would mm -hmm. disaggregate two issues, so this would be my request, is that the, the governance issue and the relationship issue be decoupled from the, the financial needs of the institution uh, so that, that, they, that the governance issues aren't required but the, the financial information is. What I mean by that is that financial information that you're requesting be considered at FGOC, then brought to the full board before that uh, 500,000 is dispersed, but that the governance and the relationship issue just be on its own track, because I think it's a longer discussion and it relates to cricket and the earthquakes and a whole bunch of other issues that are being undertaken right now. I'm particularly concerned about the oversight management of FMC and making sure that those quarterly reports that are coming to FGOC already are more transparent, more properly um, uh, defined and, and accounted. So specifically, I understand that. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that the financial needs of the institution of our of our fairgrounds and our partnership with FMC may need to be on a different path than the governance questions that you're asking. So I'm not suggesting that, I mean, we all want transparency, right. we all want clarity. Sure. What I'm suggesting though is that from FGOC that once you receive that information, that, that it come to the full board, the, the request in terms of thinking about governance, I just think is on a longer path. I don't think it's gonna be resolved as easily because we have new partners that are engaging in the fairgrounds. That, so as long as what we're talking about is the finances, then I think that makes sense as a secondary. I, I see you, hang on. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Supervisor Arenas, your, your light was on, and then I'll come to Supervisor Sumidian. And a slightly different question, but now I'm wondering about what you just finished saying, um, Super, Supervisor Chavez. So um, you're distinguishing uh, between the transparency financial um, statements that are, are were expressed an interest in, and then the governance. And so when you, when you talk about the governance, how would that carry out? I guess so I'm, some of what, some yeah. of what President Allenberg asked about was, yeah the long-term relationship with FMC. Mm -hmm. And what the board will be hearing in the coming months is what our agreement looks like with the earthquakes, what our potential agreement looks like with the um, with Cricket USA. And so my, my thinking is that the relationship and the partnership between the county, FMC, and those new partners is something that will have to be discussed by the board um, in any event. The issues that we're discussing today have more to do with the, the ongoing maintenance of the facility, and that's all I was pointing out. Right, but um, shouldn't we establish the relationship between FMC and the county before we bring any other partners into the fold? Because it's important to figure out what this relationship is. So my, that's right, and there's the day-to-day -day operations of FMC, yeah. like we're gonna have a fair, fair there, we're gonna have, um, you know, the the Cirque du Soleil, and so there are sidewalks and other things that need to be dealt with in the next coming months. And But this other issue, I think, is one that the board, ha you know, we don't yet have from staff all the information about how they're, what they're recommending. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that that, is, again, is something that will be coming to the board, you know, over the coming months as these agreements are being considered. Um, I, I still, I'm still, I still think that that there needs to be some some level of of conversation around what the relationship is with the county. I, I understand that there's future um, projects that may impact what that looks like, right? What that relationship may look like. Um, I, you know what? I'll step aside so that FGOC could handle and discuss that at length. Um, I, respect the 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 role of, of the committees as they um, suss out a lot of these details um, but I think it is important to distinguish between the the county and and FMC and if FMC 
also needs to be part of the county versus a separate entity because at this point I'm not sure why they're separate they're a separate entity if they're relying on our funding um, and they're county they're a, it's a county uh, asset yeah. so I so it's it's strange to me to have it separate I don't I I don't know that there's anything at the city that really I could like happy compare hollow. to happy hollow is an example of something similar yeah, but and you right, right. But, but my your part, your point, I totally agree yeah. with, and I think it's really worth a, a much deeper discussion. And frankly, um, we're moving into a different phase of the fairgrounds than we had before. And and one one other recommendation I would make, and I I see Abe in the audience here, is that I do think there is a lot of value in reviewing the contractual relationship that we have with them and why that is. And it's kind of a long historic, frankly. We, we made actually a significant change in it in the last maybe th three years, but I do think it's really important that the whole board dive into it. The only reason I was recommending FGOC is it's that's where it's rested, and the mm -hmm. other is some of this may need to be in closed session. Sure, uh, no, no problem, but you know what, I'm gonna fall back to what I said earlier. We are asking all of our um, departments that, especially those that offer safety net, and I know that um, our county exec said earlier that he wants to make sure that um, those reductions are uh, less impactful to safety net um, services. Um, and I know that we're all cognizant of that, uh, but when I think about what is going to be the most important thing for our community, I always think and I will always default to our safety net um, services and so I think it's a matter of timing. Um, I'll, uh, you know, let FGOC figure out what that all looks like. Um, but I do think that this is an opportunity for us to redefine what kind of really relationship can exist and what makes sense, right? Because yeah. if it makes sense for FMC to fall under the county, then so be it, right? Um, I don't know that they're doing anything maybe different, they would do anything differently. Um, and then they would be part and parcel of, of, um, of, of our budgets and our consideration and it, they wouldn't feel, um, at least I don't know if they do at this point, but a little separate, right? Separate and apart. Um, anyways, I will support the motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are the lights on to vote or for more comments? For a Let's take, oh, please, I'm so sorry. Yes, Supervisor Sumidian. Thank you. The follow-up question to the question about who actually has the funds allocated to them, and I think we have established through the chair, if I may go to the county executive or to the budget director or to Ms. Gallegos who came forward and apparently thought better of it, <laughs> um, the money's gonna go to the Fleets and Facilities Reserve. Is that correct, Mr. Williams? That is correct. If it goes to the Fleets and Facilities Reserves, before it can be spent, doesn't it have to come back to this board anyway? That is correct. So all of the concern that folks have articulated about making sure that the funding not be spent before they get answers that are satisfactory, I would suggest could be assuaged by the fact that not only is the money not going to FMC, but before it can actually get spent for the fairgrounds, we have to approve it again, and presumably we wouldn't approve it again if we didn't get all of our questions answered, yep. which is why I'm still prepared to vote aye. There you go. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Let's vote, Jess. Oh, oh. sorry. Let, just kidding. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, echo uh, with uh, our uh, FMC CEO here uh, that, I mean, I think the issue of transparency is extremely important for this board as you have been here for the discussion the last uh, 40 minutes. Um, the, the FMC has stated in the report that they would anticipate to generate $11.6 million revenues. Uh, it would be very helpful if we could get more details on the methodology of how all these projections are being made. Number one, number two is uh, some type of a comparison, side-by-side -side comparison of prior year's projection versus the actual generated revenue of how, how we've done previously. Those are things I think would be important. So if those could be coming back on the report to show that, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's all I'm ready to vote. Thank you, with, with a review by, by our folks um, by as well. Supervisor I, Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. 
Thank you, that passes with five. All right, item 15 is the Office of Veterans Services additional positions. Is Move there a motion? approval. Second. Thank Mr. Lee for his co-authorship. I have a few questions before I have a few comments, if I may, Madam Chair. Absolutely. If we could get Mr. Aturia back up to the dais through the chair, or back up to the bench. The request is for three positions, yes? Yes. <coughs> the, the, net, yes. the net transfer from general fund contingency reserve is $77,000, yes? Yes, the, the net for the difference between cost and anticipated revenues associated with the work. Thank you, and do I recall correctly, and this is a real question, it's not a, do I recall correctly that the anticipated revenue is in part the uh, offsetting of those costs by either state or federal or both uh, sources? Yeah, correct. Thank you. And my understanding, and there was reference to this in the public testimony, is that there is a uh, significant multiplier, in some cases four times, some cases maybe a dozen times, some cases maybe 16, 17 times, uh, the cost in terms of benefits that are actually obtained on behalf of Santa Clara County veterans, yes? That's what I heard from the commenter as well. Okay. Then I will uh, ask my I will thank you. I, I may have another question, so hang in. Uh, I'll ask my colleagues to please uh, vote aye on the item, as we heard from members of the public and as has been confirmed by staff. Um, the actual net cost is pretty darn modest given the number of positions we're talking about because it is partially offset. The ability of these folks to uh, obtain or assist in obtaining uh, a dramatic multiplier in terms of benefits accrues directly to Santa Clara County residents who have served and are entitled to the benefits and who pump that money back into, deep breath, pump that money back into our local economy. Uh, and we know from prior reports that this is an office that has been uh, overstretched in terms of its ability to meet the actual demand for assistance and service. And with uh, all of that in mind, I would ask for an aye vote and say thank you again to Supervisor Lee. Yeah. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, as far as meeting. I'm very glad to also see that our staff, the ESA, has supported the recommended actions on this item. Uh, the uh, one thing I would do want to mention uh, is that the recently passed uh, federal legislation, the PACT Act, which is a VA healthcare and benefits uh, for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and other toxic substances. Uh, new benefits, that has been new added, and then certainly we need more individuals to help handle these type of requests and applications. Uh, with this item, we are showing that we truly understand that our 60,000 plus veterans in our county are underserved with the current insufficient staffing and turnover. And we stand with them as they reintegrate their society and civilian life, and some of them actually have served not only in Vietnam, but even Korean War. Uh, these three VSR positions are certainly needed to ensure the veterans receive the benefits they deserve. And in terms of dollar for dollar, for the, the money we are spending will bring in more than five, if not 10 times that amount of funds from the federal sources back to this community and county. So it's a really important investment, not only the fact that we are really serving those who have uh, vowed to give up their life for us. So I certainly respect and I vote from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? I, I'll, I'll note, and I hear and very much appreciate the, the offset and the financial um, agreements, the, uh, the uh, explanations. Mm -hmm. The concern that, that I have here is is really just with adding staff, period, while we are asking our our departments to to reduce the number of of employees. And, and I very much hear the the cost benefit uh, piece here, but I think at a minimum, it's really important to call out um, the fact that we are asking departments to reduce staffing in, in many cases, and um, I would understand and do understand the concerns that I have heard from our employees in other departments that this feels uh, 
a, a bit like an end run around um, around the the right sizing that we are trying to do. So I I said that I would sunshine and share that. So I have I have done so. Hi. Any, Supervisor Ch Smitty yeah. and then Chavez. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, I, you raise an interesting and important point, and I just want to say I, it will not surprise you that I have a point of view on this interesting and important point, and here's my point of view. Yes, we have to show some restraint given our budgetary circumstances, but in the last 10 years plus, our organization, Mr. Williams, has grown, I believe, from roughly 15,000 employees to more than 22,000 employees. Am I remembering my numbers correctly? That's about right, but I would note that part of that was the hospital acquisition. So. Thank you. So when someone comes with a proposal as Supervisor Lee and I have, I'm pulling him into my orbit if I can, for three positions, the question to me isn't do we have to show restraint, which we do. The question is can you argue fairly that among the 22,000 positions that have been funded in the budget, each and every one of them is more essential in difficult times than these three positions. Because otherwise, we're gonna take the view that we can never do anything, no matter how important it is, because we've already funded the positions. Now, I'm not saying that we should turn the world upside down for our organization or its employees. I'm just saying that when we're finally obliged to make hard choices during a difficult budget time, as we are, that it's gonna be important to say, boy, should these three positions go even if we're gonna be in a hard place with the rest of the organization? And what I'm saying is that there's, I mean, there's a reason why I ask these questions about partial offset and about multipliers, because if these were nice to have, but not have to haves, I think the argument might have a different flavor. In my judgment, these are have to haves, um, and um, there are benefits for people who are entitled to them, who need them, who pump the money back into our local economy, and as I said before, the positions are partially offset by state and federal sources. So, I, I you know, we're headed into a tough budget, as everybody has referenced. I. I um, and I, I listened with great interest to these questions about program budgets earlier and avoiding sort of just an incremental approach. What I heard everybody saying one way or another is we know that when there are choices to be made, we have judgments to be made and values to be addressed. And in this case, I think um, I would be hard pressed if I were at sidewalk office hours to tell somebody, no, there really weren't three positions that uh, anywhere in the entire 22,000 person organization um, that were um, less important than doing what I think this motion does. So that's, that's my pitch for today, but it's also my pitch for our future discussions. Thank you. Thank you for that. I wonder that, well, I'll make comments at the end. We'll see how, how all of these items go today. Um, Supervisor Chavez, yes, additional thank comment? You. The, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to reinforce something that Supervisor Smidian said, but also just to go back to an earlier issue I raised about how um, rigorous we can be in understanding what rates of return back are to the county. And as an example, one of the areas that we expanded staffing dramatically at the request of administration um, was when we were responding to the um, new law regarding um, Obamacare. And what that required us to do was increase the number of people that we had processing benefits because otherwise, you know, that has such a significant impact to the hospital. And I actually look at this in a very similar way, which is why I think having the um, really being able to do program budgeting where we can quantify uh, resources that are getting to um, the community are really important. The Department of, of um, Children and Family, I mean, I'm sorry, the, um, the uh, D, DS, D, DCSS? DFCS. No. Speaking um, of DEBS? 
Yeah, I'm thinking about Debs. Well, Debs is a great example, but we have so many where we're we're making sure that people are accessing resources. And one that we don't do a very, I mean, we do, we're working really hard on it, and Angela's team is, and the staff are really working hard on it. But for example, is how much money we leave um, out for people not filling out their SNAP app applications. Like, the, the, it is just tremendous. And when I think about veterans, and we think about homelessness, the healthcare system, our custody system, it is just rife with people who have served our country and um, frankly, we're not necessarily getting benefits to them in a timely way. So one, there, so there are two points I wanted to make. One is that I think these discussions would be different if we had um, data, and so I'm excited you're gonna be pursuing that, but I, I just wanna emphasize that the, how important it is to understand cost avoidance and also resources that come back to our county because we're such a donor county, I think, nationally, in terms of us not using all of our resources. And then the other thing I want to point out, and I'm really saying this to the board for the future, is that there are some areas that we've chronically understaffed. And we just, at a different point in time, we, we just were thinking about issues differently. I think about this relative to veterans. I know this is true relative to services that we provide to women and children who've been victims of, of sexual assault and human trafficking. We underfunded that for so long that even in a year like this where I'm saying we got to maintain, we got to maintain or even grow, that that is also a response to long-term, um, you know, long-term underfunding. And so one other thing I would just say is that as we're making these decisions, that part of what we need to be able to look at is both the rate of return uh, to the institution, but also those areas that for generations we just were not, um, we weren't investing where we should have. And what's interesting to me is it also fits into the discussion we had earlier about equity. Like, who are we talking about, right? So I'm, I'm understanding very much the point that President Ellenberg raised. I, I really am just trying to give a slightly different context because I, I think as we move forward, we're gonna need to think about um, these kinds of additions in the future perhaps differently than, we, than we're able to today. And on this side again, yes. So my last point I just want to make is uh, a lot of times when we go shopping, we're always looking for good deals. Buy one, get one free, or buy two, get one free. Guess what? We are doing buy two, get one free. You look at what we're paying for. We're paying for two, but we're getting three. Because that third, that one third is going to be paid for by the federal government. So I just want to know this is really a good deal right here. Uh, by not supporting it, we're not only giving up on our, our, our assistance we can get from the federal government as well to help our veterans. So again, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And I'll certainly note that even when things are good deals, you still have to spend some money uh, in the outset. But I think we could clearly beat this down. I'm hearing everybody's commitment to restraint and responsibility, but I am um, uh, wondering at the, at the end of 22 whether we really will just have contributed significantly more to our county's deficit. Um, but item by item, we shall work through. Let's vote on this, please. Supervisor Arenas. Actually, I, I'm sorry, I have a oh, comment. Oh, please, I'm sorry. I apologize about this. Yep. Um, I have a question for our county exec, um, and, and I'm glad, I think um, Supervisor Travis, you said this earlier. Um, we're, we're doing this, we're kind of picking and choosing programs and services because obviously they're important to us. Um, and we get to hear that how they're impacted. I think it would be a more integrated approach if it was, and I'm gonna say it again, program-based budgeting, <laughs> so that we could take a look at the whole picture, right? Right now we're taking little slices and we're saying these things are particularly important. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, oh, I, I'm hoping not to pit any one particular project or position against each other um, and Votes don't certainly don't represent how we feel about um, that particular topic um, just in the moment, but I think there's a, a greater strategy, strategy here in terms of trying to be conservative about investments. And so my, my question would be, um, how, how, did, how did this, this veteran services office um, have that level of uh, or main, why didn't they have the support that they needed, and why is it doubling in the in the 
consequent years, instead of 200,000, it's 408. Are you asking specifically about the supervisor about the the veteran the, services the office staffing? Yeah, it's a one-time cost of two hundred grand, and then ongoing cost is four hundred and eight thousand. So the 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 mid-year appropriation reflects the cost for the remainder of this current fiscal oh, I see. year. Thank you. And the other number is the, the real ongoing cost, is cost on an annual basis going forward. So that's Got why it. it's roughly double because mm -hmm. we're about halfway through the year. In terms of you know the the broader point about these specific items, each of these items was of course brought as a board referral in the first part of this fiscal year. Uh, but when we do the actual budget process, it will be looking at proposals holistically, uh, department by department. But these are all responses to specific referrals brought by individual supervisors. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, this is our own doing. I realize that, <laughs> but my question was, some, t some of these things, um, we're doing this because we get complaints or we hear from folks that this is going to get cut or it's going to get impacted in some way. And so we're doing um, functionally our own very small program-based budgeting based on what we hear, who we are in connection with. And so the, you know, the, the, the greater question is how did, how was this uh, overlooked why and why this program was overlooked over the years at at this point mm -hmm. you know we we are here now but it, I am, i'm just going to stress that that i i'm glad that we talked earlier about finding a way to f um, really take a look at a more granular level um, how our cuts are going to impact programs and services so that we can prevent some of these referrals from happening on an ongoing basis um, because we don't need to fix those things. We're already fixing those things through our budget process, right? And so um, I, I anticipate that we will have less of these referrals as we move into a more comprehensive, uh, granular-based budget, hopefully. I'll knock on wood. And um, and then I think we, you know I think it's fair to say let's take a look at all of our referrals and see what one which ones at this moment really should be moving forward and can can they wait for one year can they wait for next year's mid year can they wait until you know wh whatever I think we can put maybe a time uh, certain for those to just get triggered uh, in a commitment. Um, uh, for those future programs or services because I think not all of them are going to be able to get approved at the same time. And I get that. Um, and I don't want anybody to think that their, their particular referral and area isn't important um, because it is. Uh, it just, we're competing with so much, um, so many other costs and uh, the buy one, get one free is never free. They get, you know, they increase those prices, Supervisor Lee. They, they get you each and every time. I'm, <laughs> they get me, they get me. So, so anyways, th this is obviously, you know, that's very reductive and I'm not trying to um, reduce any of these issues that are on our referrals as something, um, as a buy one, get one free. Um, or the, although if we had something like that, I would uh, potentially utilize it, but we don't. Um, what we do have is, is a great um, deficit uh, that we are going to have to battle with. And at some point, um, that will impact our employees, which is, I think, what all of us will want to avoid. Anyways, th thank you. All right. I believe we are going to vote on this item. Uh, 15, motion by Simidian, second by Lee. Superv Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. All right. Um, item 16 concerns uh, agricultural uh, ag housing. Is there a motion to approve item 16? Motion to approve. Second. <laughs> okay, are there any comments or questions on this item? 
All right, uh, we can vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. Thank you very much. Item 17, the Hate Crimes Prevention Task Force. Uh, a motion to approve. So moved. Chavez. Second. Are there comments, Supervisor Arenas? I'm wondering how does this um, fold into, um, and you know, relative to, and I think I made this comment earlier, to the violence prevention, um, the strategic uh, prevention plan that that we voted on. Um, last time we met, um, because I want to make sure that all of these efforts are integrated somehow. Um, so you're looking at me because I think you want to answer. Yes? Well, I what I wanted to, um, I was going to make some comments too, so I'm super glad you asked that question. Uh, first of all, um, because this is a project that's been ongoing for a while, I think you raise a good point because the opportunity to, to continue to integrate all of these is a really high priority and I think an excellent point. Um, and I wanna let staff um, give their perspective on that. And then what I guess what I, the way I was thinking about this is that all of the investments we're making here um, are really part of that. But I think it's gonna take a while for all of that to get integrated so the real question is how do you operationally integrate that and I would let staff respond to that and then I, I just have a comment I want to make about the the um, the proposal from staff thank you supervisor Casey Halkin deputy county executive um, so administration really is taking a multidisciplinary approach to the violence prevention strategy so we have one deputy county executive assigned myself to the gun violence prevention work and also to the community violence prevention work in conjunction with uh, Rocio Luna and Public Health, Office of Gender-Based Violence and the District Attorney's Office. So we are looking at a multi-pronged strategy when it comes to addressing violence in our communities. As we know, some of the strategies that we can use for community violence dovetail with gun violence and also with gender-based violence. So the reports that are gonna be coming back um, are really iterative and will build upon each other to talk about some of these strategies and ultimately we'll come to the board with recommendations for a larger, more global operational approach. But uh, it is certainly something that we're considering and these conversations are ongoing with our partners in public health and various other departments as well. So because um, they are not um, integrated at this time, um, we are kind of putting our faith in, in that you will at some point integrate all of those and have, um, have those all uh, fold in together. Um, I also think that there is an opportunity um, within the, the, the violence prevention strategy work plan um, and uh, effort that um, President Ellenberg led, there is a list yes. already, and you recognize that. So I would love to have that also integrate, because it's integrated, obviously, it's already mentioned in, in that report as well. It, it probably um, overlaps quite a bit, and I'd love to see how this is all a um, part of a greater strategy, um, because the, the, the Hate Prevention Inclusion Task Force, I know, um, came out of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Supervisor Chavez, but I thought it was born out of um, the when the Garlic Festival shooting happened. Um, and uh, as we've seen in the cost of gun violence, um, South County and one zip code in San Jose are at the top uh, in terms of impact. I've mentioned um, that there's part of uh, the Gilroy still doesn't have a, a gun safe uh, safety um, law there, and um, and that community has been impacted incredibly. Um, and the and the investment to that part of this of the county still isn't there. And so when we think about um, hate prevention and inclusion, I want to make sure that we are applying it to our own county. 
um, and to those folks who are not uh, thought about uh, nearly as much, um, even though we might have uh, created this out of, out of that effort. Um, I'd love to have Gilroy um, especially um, see what was born out of a tragedy, right? Because I think this is what, uh, this is a culmination, this is at the other end of, of it. Um, and I think when it finally happens, um, we need to celebrate it and we need to make sure we connect it. And I don't think that there's that connection just yet. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and I just wanna say, um, I really appreciate your comments as somebody who was um, quite literally boots on the ground for the mm. Gilroy shooting and was on the task force initially, I think you're right. And I, a lot of these referrals came out the same time. And so they will build upon each other because it seems to be a bit of a paradigm shift that we're seeing on the board and in our community with the focus on community violence prevention. And also to your point about South County, one of the areas of research that we're looking into and particularly with the South County Youth Task Force is some of the cultural practices, which may look different in parts of our county. Mm -hmm. So there are some um, restorative justice practices, for instance, that are happening in the South County, which has a lot right. to do with the cultural community and what makes sense for some of our indigenous populations in South County. So that's being taken into consideration as well. So we are thinking about globally across the county, but also considering culturally appropriate responses um, for some of our communities that may practice those um, and, and need that support as well. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that you were part of that, but I'm, I'm sure that um, you, you are one of those helpers that runs towards, so. runs towards the fire. And so I'm so glad that South County has you. Um, I just don't want us to forget. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was a, there was a, a Latino um, kiddo that was lost. Steven. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was related actually to our council member, Esparza, when I was serving with her. Um, and very often our brown and black children are forgotten when they die. It's not a front page news kind of thing. And so I want to make sure that we elevate this um, in a way that honors their passing and the tragedy and, and really makes that connection super, super obvious. Um, anyways, I think you heard me loud and clear, so I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. I, I do just want to make a couple of additions. I wanted to thank um, Supervisor Lee for um, participating in that, uh, that work group with me. And I just wanted to also acknowledge that um, the Office of Gender-Based Violence, our established trauma recovery center, and, um, and some of the initial um, planning processes that are going on, you know, are all indications of us trying to um, focus both on intervention and prevention. And I, I really think that what the task force is looking at is both uh, prevention and intervention. Um, to the county executive, one of the recommendations in this is that we um, add, uh, that we put some money on for ongoing staffing um, in this uh, body of work. I, I would just ask that I'd like, you know, we have a motion on the floor. I want to move the motion forward, but I'd like the staff to investigate whether or not it makes sense for that ongoing funding to be considered either with a nonprofit partner that could help us really work in this area versus um, adding staff. I'd like it to stay in the ongoing category while that gets investigated. Uh, but I, I think the reason that's important is that the, the volume of need in the community is, is pretty dramatic. And I feel, and based on, frankly, the comments we heard earlier today, that the, the reservoir work that needs to be done is pretty dramatic. And I actually think the point um, that Supervisor Arenas raises is an interesting one, because when I think about violence prevention, um, one of our best partners has really been the city of San Jose. But where we see increased violence is in Gilroy, I'm not increased, but uh, some, and also um, Milpitas and hot spots in Sunnyvale and hot spots in Mountain View. So I would say proceed with all of it, but come back to the board with whether or not there's an opportunity for us to look at a 
a nonprofit partner or using that ongoing resource to build the community's role in um, the hate crimes and violent, uh, the hate prevention and inclusive task force's recommendations. We can certainly assess that, whether it makes sense to do it a staff model or a CBO model. And if that could just be reported back either, and, and, and you can bring it to children's family seniors since this is an area you and I are so uh, engaged with. Thank you, if that's okay with the seconder of the motion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Do you have something else, Supervisor Yeah, so Lee? I just only want to say, <clears throat> concur with the, the direction that's uh, the by our colleague, Supervisor Chavez, and this uh, efforts. I just want to thank you for your uh, amazing work for these past years of pushing this issue forward, being so uh, critical to our community. Uh, I also, of course, want to thank Maribel and the administration for your support on this item. Um, Quick question is regarding the 400K ongoing costs. That is related to the hiring of new position to carry out the distribution, right, of the mini grants program. That's correct, right, Maribel? That is, that is correct. There's some additional uh, resources needed for the administration and distribution of those uh, contracts for the mini grants. Right, so yeah, certainly want to, I'm, I'm very concerned when it comes to ongoing costs uh, moving forward and, and how we spend that. So something I think James and I will have a offline discussion and see final ways to, we can move forward to uh, make it happen maybe uh, how, my, my better than just staffing uh, as we have proposed right here in the future. Thank you and uh, I'm ready to support, thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of my, my colleagues on this, Supervisor Chavez and Lee. I, I'm so grateful for your leadership on this referral to address um, both religious bias and, and racial and ethnic based hate in our communities. I am extraordinarily interested in seeing the work of that tax, task force implemented. Uh, I have several questions about some of the particular uh, options for implementation that have been outlined here. Um, and thank you to Casey and uh, Mary Bell and really the, the whole team that has worked on this. Looking at the uh, $400,000 ongoing for two new positions to support the proposed work and $1.5 million one-time expenditure for services and supplies that are responsive to the referrals direction. Um, I, I want to ensure at, at a minimum that any consideration of, of new investments are synchronized with the violence prevention strategic plan so that we're maximizing use of our resources and aligning efforts in this field across departments. Um, and while there are certainly some new important and, and distinct elements to, to hate prevention specifically as a subset of violence prevention, um, there is a strong overlap uh, as well as the inclusion work that, the, that our Department of Equity and Social Justice uh, folks are currently tasked with. Um, and I know that there have been some concerns about historical understaffing there to carry them out. Um, again, that with the, the deficit um, impacts threatening cuts to the limited resources that the Department of Equity and Social Justice has to execute this work, I, I think it's, it's just very essential to ensure that we can keep staff and retain existing inclusion work before adding new initiatives that would require um, new significant um, investments. So I, I would like to offer uh, a friendly amendment. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to support this today uh, moving ahead. Uh, but I would like their administration to synchronize consideration of hate prevention work with the violence prevention strategic plan to seek opportunities for maximization and potential sharing of resources. Could you say what the, the you mean the plan that doesn't, it hasn't been developed yet? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yes. My expectation is that the staff would absolutely be taking that approach and Thank not you. just to this but by the way just to say this in a more broad way the trauma and recovery center the office of gender-based violence the public health work that's being done we all play a role like to me all of that needs to be considered i don't think this particular item is one that i would pull out but really we're trying to do our very best with few resources to to come up with the appropriate approaches so Thank as you. long that's as it's inclusive of that bigger umbrella, this isn't it a is. trade-off between a, a project that's being developed and a program that's already going. It is not a trade-off, but it is looking to see where 
where we do truly need new non-duplicated resources and where we may already have them but that are not in the right place and being utilized in the right ways. Yes, and I think the staff, let me just acknowledge one area that the staff highlighted. For example, the at the time that we originally pulled the task force together when um, Council Member Esparza and I were co-chairing this, the state did not have their um, hate crimes um, um, a call center established at the time. So we were actually looking at establishing that center. And what is included in this isn't a duplication of a state service, but it is looking at how we get that information out in our community so we can better access another service. So I think they're already approaching it that way. I think it's the right way to do it. It's integrated, thoughtful, and leveraging other resources. And and so, yes, the supervisor, or President Ellenberg, I'm happy to include that, particularly given the what I hope is a, a broad scope of approaches that we're going to be able to align better. So yes. Thank you. Let's um, vote on this item, please. Super <clears throat> Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Travis? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? 18. I'm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just moving on here. Yes, <laughs> and item 18 is next, which is recommendations regarding Reed Hillview Airport future uses. Uh, is there a motion for this item? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Are there comments or questions? I, I'll note for my, myself again, um, I think funding uh, this work at this point um, would, would impact, you know, would impact us, uh, the jobs and the way we look at this um, based on a decision that hasn't yet been made by the FAA. So I will support work like this when it is more germane, but I am um, not ready to do so um, today because I do think that it is, it's significantly premature. And again, just looking across the board at all of the things that we are are doing, I think this is something that can wait for, for a year or two. So that would be my comment on this item. So I'm gonna make a response comment, which sure. is to say that um, the property we're speaking of is 180 acres and the amount of time necessary to do the kind of planning is significant and that BTA is investing half a billion dollars in the East Valley light rail connector um, concurrent to this planning is why the timeliness of this um, is so important because, you know, frankly, on a number of items that, two that we voted on already, we would not be having this discussion today had we been moving and taking action years before, frankly, at the direction of the board. And this is an action that we took um, maybe, I, I can't remember, in 2021 that had not yet been fulfilled in part because of the um, volume of work. So I understand the point you're raising, but to plan something like this is a 10-year um, odyssey, which is why I'm asking my colleagues to support this today. I very much hear that, but I'm looking at that 2031 date as as by no means the the end goal, but likely the beginning of another legal fight and you know I'm trying to put my little foot down somewhere here today and it will be to to have this wait for for a year or two if if uh, any of my colleagues so agree thank you supervisor Arenas um, yeah I have a question um, obviously I'm, I'm really invested in this area as well um, but you bring up a really good point um, president Ellenberg and I'm wondering when when is the the airport scheduled to close? It's not scheduled to close. The first date oh, well, at which it can yes, be closed is 2031. We've been working and with a lot of Supervisor Chavez's leadership to move that up sooner. Right. Mm -hmm. But it, we've been told as well that that the FAA will will plan to sue us in 2031 to prevent us from closing, even though that will mark 10 years after the last time we received federal. Mm -hmm. Funding, is that it's accurate? Do you want to add to that? Close twenty. I mean, we we have not accepted any airport improvement grants, and that allows us to take the action of closing the airport or deactivating it in twenty thirty one, September eleventh, of twenty thirty one. 
of 2031. Yeah, you know what? Um, I think I've been very supportive of everything. This one, I do think that we can wait um, one additional year, um, especially because this is for a consultant team. And I think it is very early to look at a planning and community outreach consultant team at this point when we don't have all of our eggs in one basket with that we do want. Um, there's also an, another concern um, on the side of the city of San Jose, um, and this is one of the things that I, I was hoping to accomplish um, as a council member, and I had suggested to the, the planning department, but at that point they were resisting, um, <laughs> acknowledging that, that um, Pleasant Hills Golf Course was going to potentially get developed um, because, you know, we've run out of space and uh, as much as I don't want to develop an, op uh, an area that people have considered an open space, it really is an open space. And um, I know that there is an effort to do a master plan, I think, um, for the whole area. Um, and I think it'd be great to figure out what they are doing first or, and, and figure, or try to work with them. Um, but, but even if we plan to work with them at this point for a master plan, um, we're still not sure that everything would work, would work out. Um, I would be, I, I think I would be, um, more convinced if if this was a little closer um, to 2031 I at this point. Just n note mm -hmm. something you said about the community that really um, mm -hmm. triggered a, another thought as well, which is that I want to make so sure that we're not misleading our community and talking about this mm -hmm. as if it is a, a done, done deal. deal before it is. I, I absolutely understand that we will need many years um, in advance, um, but that was that. That's an important uh, piece. Do we have? Do you have additional comments, Supervisor? Yeah, I, I do. Um, first of all, you know, I need four or five people to vote for this today in order for it to move forward. And in terms of misleading the community, the board took um, two actions to begin planning this. Um, piece of property and we did it in two phases. The first phase we reached out to the city of San Jose to partner with them uh, um, while you were on the council and um, while Mayor Licardo was the mayor. We um, offered to do joint planning at that time and there was an interest in the city following the planning but not wanting to participate in the joint planning in part because you were still making uh, changes relative to the, um, I forgot what it's called in Evergreen. The, that, the Evergreen that was retired like four years ago. So this was concurrent to that because we were already looking at what was possible with this piece of property. The piece of property across the street from it, Eastridge, as you probably remember, is 120 acres and can't be developed over three or four stories um, because of the um, the um, uh, the airport. Uh, pathway, and so there's been some interest, I know, from the city of San Jose in taking a look at that piece of property uh, also. Um, so, and, and from a timing perspective, it is such a big piece of property that the community is very, very interested in the pos possible disposition of that property. So what, what, what concerns me a little bit is that we've also been engaged with the FAA to let them know that we're very interested in moving forward with the closure of this um, piece of property and to make it something that is of community use. And our inaction today may not just give the wrong impression to the community because the community was very interested in this and we didn't invite 100 people to speak because we didn't think that would be um, appropriate today, but um, but we're also engaged in discussions with them, and it's really important that we are inviting them to be part of our process so that we can get their feedback and input as we move forward. So delays in this um, actually delay the requests from the community that we've already had and the engagement we currently have with the FAA. So I'm really asking my colleagues that this is one of those issues that is very, very important relative to us having the ability to move 
uh, move forward. So what I'm, anyway, so this is a, this is a very significant problem to me in terms of, not just me, but I think in terms of our overall plans relative to the airport. Thank you. Vote or uh, Actually, I do have mm -hmm. another comment. Um, as I was listening to you, Supervisor Chavez, um, and you know, the, the, I represent South County, and South County is really fearful that all of the aviation traffic is going to go to South County. Now, we both know that that's not going to really happen, that there is a number of smaller airports that um, all of the aviation traffic can get rerouted to, right? But it doesn't stop, especially San Martin um, neighborhoods, from um, just getting agitated in a way that I think for now doesn't really make sense um, to me um, because we're so far away. If this was five years from the date, then I would say absolutely, let's move this forward. Um, this is more than five years from the date and we're, um, and I know that it takes a really long time to even plan to plan, right? But I, um, I don't know that I want to agitate my community in San Martin for something that is not going to happen for many years and have them um, assume that this is going to just roll out because we are already investing money in it. So, I, and like I said, I would be more open maybe next year or, um, but, but at this point it, it's, um, I don't think it would be an, a, a go for my community. So um, since two people have already indicated no votes, um, what, I, what I would like to do is withdraw the, to withdraw the item, and I want to know, Tony, the best way to do that. And just to alert my colleagues, I would be bringing this back during budget when it, what I understand it would only require three votes. Am I right about that? You could uh, withdraw the motion, Supervisor, and then uh, hold the item over okay, to Okay, so I'm soon. gonna, so wait, do I make a motion to do that? Again, because I, I already made a motion. Can I withdraw my motion? You can. And then I can defer it? You can withdraw your motion and then. Um, Request a deferral to the budget process? Yeah, I would okay. say j just to, just, um, I would make a motion to hold it. I'm sorry? Make a motion to hold. Okay, I will move to hold. Thank you. Okay, let's vote on the, the substitute motion. Uh, Supervisor Arenas? No. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. And the motion to hold carries with four. Okay. Uh, thank you. Item 19, County Hospital Energy Efficiency Funding Report. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or discussion? Mm -hmm. Supervisor Lee? Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, be clear what this uh, proposal is about. It's not just about being green, but it's also about our fiscal health uh, in the long run as well. Mm -hmm. If we do this right, with the willingness to invest in projects up front to conserve both water and energy use would also save our county money in the long run. Uh, it's been clear to me from the report that we're in currently not in the fiscal position to spend upfront money to, to, to make this, to do this project right this moment. But I certainly would like to see uh, in the future to continue monitoring it at the committee level. Uh, as, we are, as the report has shown, uh, the current estimated payback period of this type of project is 13 years. That's based on today's energy and water costs. If there's anything we know, the cost of energy or water is not getting any cheaper, and th which means if that's the case, the payback period will certainly be shorter. Uh, I would like to request that this item also be brought back to FGLC in August for further discussion. Thank you. Excellent. We have a motion and a second. I don't see lights on. Let's vote, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. 
President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. Thank you very much. Item 20, uh, right, incentives to support foster youth in completing medical and dental appointments. Is there a motion? So move. Thank you. Are there comments uh, on this item? Seeing none, let's vote. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. Thank you. Item 21, uh, concerns reestablishing a permanent OBGYN clinic. Uh, is there a motion to approve? I'll move approval. Second. Motion and second. And I just have one question for staff on this item. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm so excited about this uh, project. I appreciate that we're moving staff from one part of the, the um, you know, hospital. I, I think you're using vacant, unfunded positions to, to staff this. Could you just quantify that for a moment? Maybe Paul could do that. Thank you, Supervisor Cindy Chavez and members of the board. So we will be working with OBA and the county executive office to make the appropriate adjustment to bring about the clinic. And so, but this is doing it without adding additional FTEs? It's by moving them? We would have to, again, supervisor work with OBA determine whether or not we needed to add positions or we can reassign staff um, vacant positions. So. Um, Colleagues, I, I wanted to say, first of all, I, I know there are some doctors and nurses that were really integral to helping us understand how important this um, project is. And I and just the, the staff and their stories about uh, women, uh, pregnant people in need has been just really profound. I like that you're trying so hard to be innovative and creative, recognizing just how challenging the budget is. And also recognize this is another one of those examples of you know, getting in early and, and being able to really provide support to pregnant people is gonna be so much more, like less human suffering and more cost effective for our institutions in the long run. So I would just uh, thank my colleagues. I am still interested in better understanding um, when it, when this is implemented, under what terms and conditions we'd be looking at a medical social worker, because I actually do think that's part of how we make sure that people have their insurance and are, that are, we're doing the work we need to do to make sure we're being cost effective. So as it comes back, I'd just be interested in understanding the staff's position on that as it gets more refined. Yes. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, I appreciate that And thank you, Supervisor Simidium, for co-authoring that direction with me. Thank you. I appreciate the the approach and, and understand that this this will be a, a revenue producing um, model, which is also um, an exciting addition to the fact that it's a, a key service. So thank you, Supervisor Sumidian. The only other thing I would add, Madam uh, President, uh, and again, thanks to Supervisor Chavez for pulling me into this effort. Um, I suppose you could say this about every. Every service we provide, but particularly this service, needs to be provided by what I'll call a trusted provider. Uh, and um, I think in this instance, we are well positioned to be that trusted provider as compared or contrasted with some of the other folks who are out there in the field. And I'll just let it go with that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Renas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Yes. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with five. Thank you. Item 22 is the Executive Leadership Salary Ordinance Preliminary Adoption. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Second. S second by Lee. Uh, thank you. The, the original ordinance was adopted as part of last year's budget. That's correct? James, I just want to make sure I understand this. Not the budget. It's an annual uh, salary ordinance, but this was to make a specific amendment based on a referral. Got it. Thank you. Are there comments? Supervisor Lee. Thank you. The point for this change we're doing here is to incentivize recruitment and retention. Uh, so the question I have with uh, <clears throat> staff is how can we protect against candidates that leaves very quickly, like say after 18 months? Is there a way we could maybe stagger those uh, one-time payment instead of doing the lump sum? We could certainly um, 
spread it out over a period of time. I would say that we're already proposing that it be delayed 18 months. So it, I think, reduces in efficacy in terms of attracting somebody the more we kind of defer it. Usually people would get such a payment up front when they come. So um, this is our current recommendation. I think my suggestion would be we see what impact it may have. I mean, it'll only be for a handful of positions where we're having recruitment issues, but the idea is to pilot it here and, and kind of assess how it's working or not. So um, from, I think we got this answer from our clerk, Brian Darrell, that shows that like San Mateo County has a similar program, offers one third up front, one third 18 months, one third three years. Again, you know uh, how much I like about how other counties do something that works, and if that's how that could work, I just want to make sure that's being under consideration for us as well. We, we can certainly look at that to do it that way. Yeah, and of course, with a fiscal impact, that also uh, lightens up that load a little bit. Thank you. Let's vote. Supervisor Renas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with five. Thank you very much. All right. We are through all of the mid-year budget items. Uh, Greg, I hope you're off somewhere to relax, at least for 30 minutes or so. <laughs> Item 23 was uh, our time certain to not be heard before 1 p.m. Uh, child welfare procedures and protocol report. So... Welcome, Damien and Dan. Item 23. Hi, good afternoon, Supervisors. Daniel Little, Director of the Social Service Agency. I think we'll have a, a PowerPoint that's going to be going up on the screen. Um, Santa Clara County Social Service Agency staff work tirelessly serving some of our county's most vulnerable populations. Dedicated staff in several departments provide the foundation of an extensive safety net of services, resources, benefits, and support. My goal is all SSA departments continue developing strong collaborative partnerships internally with other county stakeholders and with the community in service to children, families, seniors, and veterans. The Department of Family Children Services plays a critical role with a focus on child safety and family well-being. As demonstrated during the December 19th special hearing, child welfare is complex and evolving. We are very appreciative of the opportunity to have this important dialogue with the board and with the community. DFCS Director Wright will provide updates to several crucial questions raised at the last meeting and will highlight some of the incredible work continuing to be done by DFCS staff. We welcome questions and look forward to the ongoing collaboration with the board, staff, and the public. I'll now turn to Director Wright to provide his vision of the pathway forward as a response to the critical referral regarding DFCS practice. Good afternoon, President Ellenberg and board. Keeping children safe is the primary focus of DFCS. We also must strengthen families by linking them to services and supports to address safety concerns and reduce the risk of future harm to a child. These legal requirements as the county's child protection agency are also ensuring we are keeping families together whenever possible and whenever safe to do so. This is the constant work DFCS must do. When a family comes to the attention of DFCS, we are required to assess risk to the child as well as safety of the child and that family's functioning. If there are safety concerns, DFCS must intervene and work with the family involving their support system while considering the many factors to address safety and risk to the child. We must do this work in partnership with communities to continue to build out a safety net. As indicated by President Ellenberg in the board's mission to build safe communities, we must partner to ensure children are safe. Children must be free from harm, no matter the zip code, a child or family lives in. There must be equitable access to resources and an opportunity to thrive. In doing so, we must look beyond just DFCS and how do we identify opportunities to work together across systems 
to ensure the conditions of children and their families are healthy and safe. Next slide. The board's comprehensive request from December 19, 2023 is inclusive of 31 items, and they are specific data and information that fall under five general categories. Those categories are staffing and workload, child welfare laws, program and services, monitoring and oversight, data, and other information. There is a summary response document provided in item C1, which provides progress for each item with the vast majority being completed for today's meeting and some requiring additional time. The board referral provides an opportunity for DFCS to look at multiple aspects of not just child welfare, but creating a child and family well-being system. The work is aligned with the root cause analysis of identi identifying areas of child welfare that are functioning well, as well as the areas that need to be strengthened. This augments the work that is occurring externally with DFCS partnerships and building safe communities to support the safety of children. These activities have helped establish a pathway forward in a strategic framework, which aligns with the board's requests around continuous quality improvement. Next slide. DFCS's strategic framework outlines the results and necessary conditions or changes that will ultimately lead to the desired outcomes we all want to see regarding safety, permanency, and well-being for children. The first strategic fo focus area is safeguarding children to prevent maltreatment. This strategy embodies a child and family well-being system that empowers families by aligning community supports to the reduction of adverse childhood experiences. This connects to the board referrals in regards to focus of under, a focus of understanding specifically on how the hospital discharges look for children in their safe plans of care. This also looks at, at how is DFCS ensuring the larger community is aware of child abuse, neglect center, and the reporting processes that come as a part of that. And how are we partnering with ent entities like the Child Abuse Prevention Council to ensure strategies like posting child abuse reporting information on websites as well as within the media to make sure everybody is aware of that information. We always want to make sure the right level of inf intervention is prescribed to families, whether that be in-home services, court intervention, or foster care. We want to ensure safety. The second focus is to build key partnerships and actively engage with Santa Clara County communities. DFCS is looking to strengthen relationships with a wide range of community organizations and leaders in neighborhoods in which child abuse referral rates are high, as well as looking at specifically vulnerable children. The work is central to the previously mentioned board referrals, as well as the board refer referrals focused on the nexus with probation, partnership with Children's Advocacy Center, and serving children that have experienced abuse, and the partnership with our DA and local law enforcement agencies to make sure we're coordinating around child abuse investigations. These are partnerships that are interconnected and this intersection plays a major part in making sure children are safe. Lastly, the third focus area centers on the backbone of DFCS, which is the dedicated individuals who form DFCS's workforce. The board referrals requested an analysis of DFCS's workload balancing as it at is vital to the work we do in equitably serving children and families. Whether through our partnership with staff and our union partners in having caps and specific workload standards and are the continuous work we do in supporting the equitable distribution of cases, DFCS will continue to support the workforce and the difficult and complex work they do. Next slide. DFCS is not only committed to building a safety culture, but there is also a commitment to be a learning organization. DF DFCS can only do this by having open communication built on trust. DFCS is invested in understanding further areas that need to be strengthened. DFCS has com 
communicated a non-retaliation statement to all of its staff and partners to promote open and transparent communication. DFCS is also looking towards a non-punitive approach to reviewing critical incidences and other work to grow as an organization and building a balance between individual and system accountability for safety. Next slide. Child welfare data on child maltreatment is essential to DFCS understanding how many children come into contact with DFCS, how many children enter foster care, and why. DFCS uses this information to ensure that child welfare systems support the safety, stability, and well-being of all children and families. Federal child welfare measures are indicators of safety, permanency, and well-being for states and counties. Two measures are the focus of assessing, assessing safety and child welfare. Those are safety measure two, which look at the percentage of occurrence of maltreatment to a child in a 12-month period, and permanency measure four, which is the percentage of children re-entering care that have reunited reunified with a family or established guardianship within that last 12 months. Next slide. This is looking at our S2 federal measure, which is the national standard for looking at safety. It encompasses the entire population of youth that has a substantiated abuse of neglect allegation, whether with a parent or whether that child is in foster care. DFCS has a lower percentage rate of recurrence, which is 7.1% in comparison to the state average. DFCS works throughout the continuum to make sure that we have less substantiations by engaging families earlier. DFCS will focus on looking further at families with repeat referrals to support a metrics that gets in front of risk factors that lead to harm of children and further penetration of the system. Next slide. The P4 federal measure is another federal measure that looks at safety, permanency, and well-being. P4 looks at children that have reunified and are in guardianship, and they subs subsequently come back into foster care. DFCS has a higher rate of 10.2% in comparison to the state average of 8%. DFCS will focus on looking at the populations re-entering and any case profile information and strategies that have been successful to support less re-entries into care. Next slide. DFCS also must be cognizant of disparate and disproportionate outcomes, specifically for black, American Indian, and our Latino children being overrepresented through our continuum in child welfare. We must ensure families from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds do not experience inequitable child welfare outcomes. As this is complicated work, we have done significant work around aligning our workforce to reflect the communities we serve through language, our culturally based units, and other strategies, but we must do more. This work doesn't out signify safety, but it should be in alignment with ensuring families are treated equitably. Next slide. Fentanyl and other drugs continue to plague our communities. It has been a game changer in how it impacts families and heightens the risk to children. DFCS continues to look at its most vulnerable, vulnerable population, including children under five, and most specifically newborns, and strengthening partnerships with the medical community through plans of safe care, and our in-home court supervision to support children requiring higher levels of monitoring but ensuring there is support for the family to address this debilitating disease of substance use. DFCS is looking at additional opportunities to create a network of support via opportunities like grants that support the extension of linkages to substance use treatment. DFCS also works with partners like behavioral health and public health and the multi multitude of services they provide, including their in-home nursing services, and linkages around substance use treatment. Next slide. There are several areas of follow-up that looked at board insight and direction, such as the refinement of DFCS's legal consultation process, 
to ensure that process is inclusive of social workers and the child and family, as well as how do we do that in making critical decisions. All should be involved. And the intent is to outline a process that is evident of that. The department is engaging in that process to make sure that social workers, as well as the child and family team process is evident in that. Also further understanding the nexus between child welfare history and, the, and probation, including but not limited to correlational factors between a youth's involvement in both systems. Information ascertained from a small random sample of probation youth indicated there is a significant amount of youth that have child welfare history. We must understand how that parallels to the work we must do. Lastly, in looking at court supervision, there are several changes that are helping DFCS further align its work around safety outcomes that we want to continually see with our children and families. DFCS is further utilizing court supervision as a strategy to support families with higher risk. This has helped increase monitoring and support with family in partnership with courts. It is also supported around the full continuum of prevention and supporting children in home with higher levels of supervision needed for families to succeed. Next slide. The County of Santa Clara DFCS is committed to keep children safe, strengthen families, and partner with communities. We must keep our eyes on and arms around vulnerable children and families. The vision of child welfare, child welfare for DFCS practice propels us to our collective efforts in determining the best pathway forward. Lastly, I do want to take this time to highlight all of the work the staff have done in preparing these board reports. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of effort and work and definitely want to applaud them for their diligence. We are available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I will go first to the public uh, for comments and then return to my colleagues. Do we have speakers in chambers and or on Zoom? I have <clears throat> on item 23, I have two speakers in chambers, no speakers on Zoom. Okay, a reminder that if you are intending to speak on this item, now is the time to fill out your yellow card, which is available in the back of the room at that table. Once the first speaker begins speaking, the queue will be closed. For those of you who are on Zoom, if you're intending to speak on this item, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The Zoom queue will close when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. One hand up in Zoom, we're up to three. Okay, so the Zoom can grow for a little bit if I see nobody else getting a yellow card, so we'll close the queue for in-person. Our first in-person speaker will be Steve Barron, followed by Katie Jo. Good morning. Uh, thank you, I'm uh, Steve Barron with the Child Abuse Prevention Council. Uh, also sit on the Child and Domestic Violence Death Review Committee, but I don't speak for any of them. I'm speaking for myself. Um, I would, first of all, I would like to express appreciation for the reported, as reported in the media, progress made by DFCS in refocusing on and prioritizing the safety of children in child abuse and neglect cases. And I, but I also want to address a couple issues which were raised by the State Department of Social Services report regarding the on-site evaluation of 10 cases that occurred in 2022, which I'm not sure have been addressed yet. The first one is the problem of evaluated out cases that should have been investigated. This is not a new issue. In approximately uh, uh, 2003, DFCS contracted with First Five to assess issues related to evaluated out cases, where the number of prior referrals in some of those ca in cases ranged from zero to 27. It resulted in a report, quote, differential response prepared for Santa Clara County Social Services Agency, Department of Family and Children's Services, funded by First Five Santa Clara County, prepared by Linda Carpenter. One of the main themes of that was that more cases should be evaluated in as opposed to be evaluated out. Second issue, uh, so that issue still exists 20 years later. Second issue, the agency permitting parents to choose the relative or individual with whom the child should be placed with no formal assessment related to safety or the ability of those individuals to meet a child's needs, that doesn't make any sense either. 
The third, I've been informed by a social work supervisor in the past that criminal record checks are not conducted in um, uh, child abuse investigations. To me, that doesn't make sense either, but I don't have the time to talk to that. And finally, I want to support the reestablishment of a specialized domestic violence unit in DFCS. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Katie Jo, and I am the CEO of Dependency Advocacy Center, which has a court contract to represent parents and minors in dependency court, and also works with parents and caregivers at risk of DFCS involvement. As a board prepares to discuss the report from DFCS today, I want to reiterate that removing children from their families is not a guarantee of safety and often puts them at risk of further harm or long-term trauma. An approach to child safety that automatically equates removal to safety is not only out of line with the reality of our system, it also erases the resilience of families in our community and the respect and integrity with which every family and parent deserves to be treated. I want to remind the board and the community that the department has a legal obligation, and I believe we all have an ethical obligation to do everything possible to keep children in their homes before taking the very drastic step of splitting up a family. This was the driving force behind the department's shift to a preventative model in 2020 and is increasingly reflected also in approaches to child welfare by jurisdictions across the country. Unfortunately, since November, we have seen filings in court as well as the removal of children from their families more than double. Beyond a change simply in the numbers, I am hearing stories of extremely traumatic child removals, conflicting directions to families from investigating social workers, and cases being brought into court where parents um, were willing to participate in treatment without court involvement and then not given the chance to do so. Most troublingly, I am hearing of clients who hesitate to seek assistance for mental health or substance use needs because they know um, from talk in the community that their children will be taken away if they do so. These concerns are overwhelmingly affecting our clients who are already the most marginalized and vulnerable, including black and Latino families, low-income communities, and parents who are youth in the system themselves. I understand the need for a serious response to the tragic loss of a child in our county, but I would urge the board to take measured rather than reactive steps in considering how best to protect children without inflicting family, the trauma of family separation. Thank you. Holding at one hand and Zoom. This is the last call for Zoom speakers. We'll wait a second or two, and then the queue will close when the first speaker begins speaking. All right. Our speaker on Zoom is resident. You'll have two minutes. Please open your microphone when prompted. And please go ahead. Yes. I'm sorry, but no nothing has changed at DT. At, at the Department of Child and Family Services. Here I am at a public meeting stating that my son has been anally raped beginning from when he was 13 and that my other children are showing signs of the same type of abuse. I've gone directly uh, to Mr. Wright, and to Mr. Little um, to get this, to get a, my children protected, evaluated, assessed, um, but nothing's happening. Uh, they're not even responding to me anymore. I've had to take legal action um, and, and to resort to that kind of action. I mean, it's just terrible. It's, it's a shame on this county that this is happening. And I really believe that um, that, their, that their statements um, made at this meeting uh, pertaining to their dedication to protecting children were completely disin disingenuous um, because they're not going to do anything uh, on my case, because there's a conflict of interest in the case um, pertaining to uh, my former attorney, Valerie Houghton, and a judge, Judge James Towery, that they want this abuse to continue to occur. And, um, and it's just absurd that I have to come to this public meeting and, 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 and tell you guys, please protect my kids. Um, I mean, th th there's no procedure or protocol that can be changed uh, to fix this. I mean, if this isn't going to happen now, then we really need to start considering um, replacing Mr. Wright and Mr. Little with somebody who really does have a dedication to protecting children. I mean, I posted this all online. If you, did, if you Google Valerie Houghton sex trafficking, it's all there. And plus, I'm being assaulted because of this. And they, they know about it. And they're still refusing. They have no empathy towards anybody in this community. 
um, I think p children are going to continue to get raped and, and they're going to continue to die from fentanyl and other. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. I will now return to my colleague, Supervisor Arenas. I see your light on. Thank you. I appreciate the, the presentation and um, I'm going to divide this, the, my questions in a, a couple of um, categories, one being staffing and, and personnel concerns, the next one being information and clarification, current welfare um, system, the next one being status updates on current programs and services, uh, lastly but not least, new requests and programs, as well as verbal requests. Um, I really appreciate the, the presentation that you provided. Actually, if we can go back to one of the slides that had uh, the diagram where there was, um, I don't know what shape it was. It looked like a circle, but it wasn't a circle. And there were subsets in it. I, I thought it was a really good um, summarized visual of what we should be focused on. Yes, board direction. Um, we are now going to continue to, to meet um, um, Mr. Little and Mr. Wright. I heard your names and I thought that would, would, uh, would a pair, Mr. Wright and Mr. Little. Um, anyways, um, just anything to amuse myself after a six hour, seven hour meeting, so if you will. <laughs> Okay, so, so we're, what we're talking about today, and, and thank you so much for, for being so thorough in some of your um, responses. Um, we, are, we are here because we, we know that the system sometimes needs to um, shift and be responsive to what um, is happening, um, because systems are just like, are, are live, they're alive just like any one of us, and we are not the same person that we were a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, right? And so we can't expect a system to continue to live and look and be the way it was five years ago, three years ago. And so I understand that there's some level of concern about being reactive, and um, I know that it's uh, my intent to make sure that we are as um, considerate and as responsive as possible. And so please understand that some of my questions will come from that place in terms of, um, of what we want to focus on. And so um, the first area that I'm going to focus on, and it is um, really has to do with the, the, um, the protocol um, that is um, that has changed in order to to have social workers consult with um, county council, and and let me just say let me just thank you for one of the memos that you provided allowed for me to really um, put everything together. I was hearing um, the different stakeholders in in this process have different. Um, um, renditions of, of what happened and what um, and how they interact with the system because of course it's based on their perspective and how they interact with the system and so I think when we put it all together we can really take a look at, at all of the the whole picture and I think when when what I didn't understand before was that um, I thought Maybe county council had taken a lead and may, was making more um, decisions, clinical decisions that should be left for the social workers. And I think what has hap what happened, and I think what you reflected in your um, report, was that there was a management strategy along with a policy change. Uh, the 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 management um, uh, shift was to have social workers complete the. Um, the decision-making tool and have them interact with county council this way, right? And so I think what we wanted is to ensure that we are abiding with 
the state wants, which is the state wants this SDM tool to get completed. It wasn't getting completed uh, for a number of years, and I think we just needed to to get it done. Um, and, uh, and at the same time, we had the family preservation direction from the state. And I think those two things blended in to um, one office, which is the Office of County Council, um, because they are the ones who were consulting with the social workers in order to figure out whether um, they can get an order um, to have uh, to have this this um, child be under under the supervision of the court, right? Um, and what I didn't understand was that it wasn't necessarily county council who was leading that. It was just a kind of a perfect storm in terms of DFCS and leadership at that time wanting to um, comply with, with the decision-making tool, which is complex. And I know on the back end, you have to, with every policy change, you have to make sure um, that you change things in order to get uh, a different product or a different response, right? So you're always having to build in some of those policy changes at the back end of that. And then at the same time that that was happening, um, uh, you, there was also this family preservation piece, right? And I think for, um, be, because of both of these hap happening at the same time and because we wanted to undo a lot of the policy that had been um, impacting brown and black families, as we all know, that the removal rate was really high. Um, somehow that actual, uh, um, somehow that we, that formula got shifted a bit and, um, and we were really leaning on making sure that children stayed in their homes. And I think that's really important. Um, I do think that, and like you said, um, uh, Damien, that uh, you know, uh, safety is one of the most important things that, um, that is entrusted to us um, by the state, by all, our culture, by our families, um, by this county. And so I know that you're taking that into consideration and you're following what the state is asking you to do and asking you to follow this tool, this decision-making tool that continues to shift and shape you know, uh, different responses based on the different policies that you you um, kind of insert in there, right? Um, I I also think that there was another thing that was happening, and that's the the clinical perspective, that institutional knowledge that gets accumulated by working with families, just one to one, right? These are the social workers. These are our our um, our champions, our, our warriors that are out there really trying to keep our children safe on the front line. And there is a, there is a lot of um, intuitive knowledge that, that we know, actually based on neuroscience, that this intuitive knowledge is knowledge nonetheless, is wisdom. And then there's wisdom also based on best practices. And so there's a combination um, from a lot of social workers in terms of what they hold when they and and what and how they interact with the family when they're um, responding to a call. Now to shift, to make that shift into plugging things into a a decision making tool seems a little maybe a little cold, right? And and maybe um, uh, a little suspicious in terms of. And I'm, I'm putting this in, and not that social workers told me that they are suspicious of the decision-making tool, but if we're using any new kinds of tools, it, it's strange to us. It's, it's um, maybe not something that, because we're used to it, we're not confident in it. We don't trust it just yet. And what we do trust is what we've learned throughout time, um, through our own training, our education, our experience in an interacting with families, and you're asked as a social worker to set that aside a bit and follow a tool that's gonna compute the direction that you should follow. 
And I'm saying this because I think it's important for us to acknowledge what happened. Um, and this is reflected partly in, your, in some of the reports that you provided, right? And so I wanted to make sure that I highlighted it because I think it's, it's important to, to take a look back to, um, and see what ex how exactly did we get here, right? And I think there was a, a combination of, of factors that allowed us to be in the place that we are. We do recognize him based on the Department of Social Services and their investigation as well as their recommendations that we should take a look at how to um, uh, shift what we were doing because we had the lowest referral, I mean, we had the lowest removal rate in the state of California. And that, I think, is what actually triggered the investigation from the Department of Social Services. And while I think it's, it's great to keep, and wonderful and positive to keep families together, I also think that we need to have the right combination um, and the right approach to safety. And so I'm very cognizant of having the pendulum swing one way and then the pendulum swing the other way. Um, and so I, I'm new to the system when I just got here. This is what stakeholders were telling me because at that point the pendulum was just, you know, at, at one extreme. Um, and that extreme was that children were remaining in their homes regardless of, of what they were plugging into that, um, uh, the decision making tool. So I just wanted to start with, with having a, a little historical look back and I don't know if you want to include anything, Damien or Dan, in terms of maybe what I'm missing. Um, no, Supervisor, I will, I will say specifically around the challenge with the, like a structured decision making tool, I think your insight is spot on that the, the challenge between a structured um, assessment tool and a social worker's kind of clinical perspective, where those two intersect is, is what I have seen in every system where I've seen these kind of models implemented, where, where we see kind of challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I wasn't here locally when the SDM was rolled out. I don't think that the department had a lot of support in the implementation. Um, and I think that kind of set it down kind of a wrong road, which which we needed to kind of reset that that support. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that in a best case scenario, the the clinical perspective of the social worker should be complemented by the tool itself, and the tool is supposed to be built on the the laws and the regulations of of our state. Right. So, you know, using your clinical skills to do a really good engagement and to be able to gather the information to then see if you've met this threshold in the tool. That's where we should be living. Um, it's not really one or the other that are supposed to be in competition, which is, I think, what we're still working towards. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm really glad that you um, acknowledge that because I think that there is an opportunity for all of us to walk together and, and, and balance that pendulum so it doesn't swing one way or the other. But I think at this point it has swung, not, not completely, but it's swinging. It's about to, to swing, and, if, and we need to hold back and be thoughtful about the next changes that we're that we're making, and so what I I hope to hear throughout this conversation is that there is a level of collaboration, that there's a level of partnership, um, and that there is a level of integration of the social workers' clinical perspectives and um, skill sets that can help balance um, this this swing in terms of the pendulum. And so, um, and, and lastly, the, 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 the next thing that I, I want to say, and I know that this is really important, I think, to both of us, um, Supervisor Chavez, um, and I specified Supervisor Chavez because I'm in a brown act with her so I can talk to her about this, not because none of the other supervisors are in agreement, it's simply because we are able to talk offline. Um, and so, one of the things that is happening now and that I, I've heard from some social workers is that they feel like there is a distance between themselves and county council. And I don't, I don't think the problem ever was that that communication needed to um, be separated or needed to have a level of distance because I think at this point we're playing a version of the telephone uh, game. Um, and if you all remember when you were 
in junior high, you whisper, you know, you whisper and in a circle and you end up saying a completely different message than what it started. And so I think I, I'd really like for you to consider as we're having these, as we're going into the different recommendations to think about um, how to bring those two um, closer. Uh, because I think one of the desires of the social workers, uh, not to say that everything that we, you know, we desire is what we're going to get, but I think sometimes when things aren't broken, we should not change them. <laughs> and if something worked in the past, uh, of course, with some level of improvement, we need to go back to things. And it's sometimes it's, it's just fundamentals, right? And so from what I understand in the, uh, previously, um, there was a multidisciplinary team approach uh, to making decisions. And when you're removing a child or getting that order, um, I can only imagine the, the weight on your shoulders. And so when you have in a room all of the folks who have acquired a level of experience and skill sets and um, uh, wisdom, that you rely on all of those resources um, in that room to help you make that decision. And I know that sometimes that can be time consuming. It doesn't have to be in person. It could be, you know, this new version that we have online that we've all experienced during the pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, I think there needs to be that type of interaction with county council at some point. And I'd really like for you to um, reconsider that. Um, at some point in my motion, I will make a recommendation. I'll wait to hear from some of my colleagues, but I do think that we need to have some kind of work group that allows for all of the different stakeholders to participate and have conversations um, and produce a, a protocol that is not exclusively done by on this end and not exclusively done on that end, but it, it is something that, that is um, going to be an outcome based on um, really thoughtful conversations um, and collaboration. And so that's what I really hope that we produce by the end of not just today, but the whole process. And I know we're not gonna fix everything um, ASAP, uh, this is going to, and it's going to be iterative. I'm just asking you to please consider when I am talking about some of these recommendations, I wanted you to think about this is, the, these are the thoughts that anchor me. This is where I'm coming from. And in hopes that we can really figure this piece out together. Um, and, I, oh. and I'm I, sorry, if I can add one thing, Supervisor. Absolutely. Honest. Yes. Uh, so to your point in regards to the uh, re-looking at our legal consultation process, we're actually almost directly in line with what you've stated. Uh, there is processes where we're actually looking at a previous model, two models ago, in regards to the work that we were doing with not only our staff, but county council. Uh, there's conversations with all of those different partners. Uh, definitely to the piece of bringing everybody together, that is a part of what we're trying to accomplish, but uh, taking into account what you said, maybe there needs to be some specific process that we can actually do that. Um, so, so we'll take that into account as we're looking into next steps. I think in the, um, in the file that we presented, we said that we would get something back around March, so hopefully we could get something back by then. Right, and, and within that, I think, um, and I'll, of course, uh, uh, Supervisor Chavez will speak for herself, but I think there's a couple of areas that are very important that um, um, we'd like for you to focus on. But I just wanted to, to really begin this conversation this way. Um, it, you know, I think in, it, in previous conversations, um, when we're really passionate about something, it just colors the way that we interact with people. And I know it colored the way that inter I interacted with you. Um, I don't regret my passion. I don't regret um, some, of the, some of the recommendations that I've made because I've, I've actually made them um, not, not insularly. Uh, I rely on stakeholders. I rely on others to provide me um, the background and the history and their uh, experiences, um, expertise in order to shape policy. And so I hope that this is what 
you and I will do together um, and that I can rely on you um, to be able to produce that. Otherwise, I think it'll be very directive um, and there's a lot to be said about that, but I, I will leave it. Al I will leave that alone, and and just will continue on with some of the questions that I had. Um, I I want to talk about so so it sounds like and and Supervisor Travis, it sounds like they're going there. They have a model that they're going to revert back to that it was like two models ago, which is something that I think social workers wanted to see back in place, and I think. Um, if we produce also a work group that allows for social workers to be part of those conversations, um, even if we are reverting back to a, a former model, I think there's um, an opportunity just to have conversations. And I know the morale is, is um, to be desired. <laughs> I don't know what your assessment is of it, but, but I know that it could be a very stressful, high stakes when everybody's looking at your department and and um, potentially pointing fingers at you. I'm sure that that can um, be very impactful in, in terms of how you're producing the work. And so I think we need an opportunity to have these conversations. And if you're open to that, I really would love to have um, some, some form of uh, work group to look at the protocol and uh, to look at the legal consultation of this. And um, for some reason, I forgot the third thing <laughs> I was going to say. But but anyways, uh, so I'm going to start it off this way. I don't know if you want to jump in, Supervisor Travis. I have a lot of... Um, I have a lot of feedback to provide. And, and one of the things that I think will, um, I hope, in the future, will change is that um, I don't get 500 pages on a Friday night. That's not the kind of date I was looking for on a Friday night. It was me and a binder, <laughs> and actually and all my team. <laughs> we, were, we were all together looking at this collectively. And so what I would really love to have is a process where um, we are all talking to one another and there isn't any real surprises. Um, so I, I also know that you're going to have a, um, a longitudinal study um, around the, the duly involved youth. This is the other piece that I'm going to, this, is, this was the other one that we were, we were gonna talk about, the duly involved youth. Um, I think there was 950-ish I can't remember the exact amount, but out of the the those uh, youth that were involved in probation last year, it was 52%. This is according to to some of the information that you provided, um, and 52% of that of the youth in the probation system had at least one call that was made to the CAN Center on their behalf at some point in their lives, and we don't know whether that was one, twice, and how many times that was, right? But but the calls were there. And so what, what I'm hoping um, to get is um, a, a little bit more analysis on, on these children, on, and I'll call them children because they're still our kids, right? Um, because I would like to see, it, it, you know, the report, it got me just really thinking and scratches the surface. And so I'd really like to see um, whether those referrals were inconclusive, unsubstantiated, substantiated, with, did they have court oversight, did they not, was it, you know, um, I think you gave us some, some numbers in terms of uh, sexual abuse and, and that involvement. Um, and it, of course we saw more girls than, than, than boys um, being impacted with that. Um, and so it, it would be really um, helpful to understand that, and the reason I, I want to focus on older children is because I think that you have a policy that has already responded to children zero through five, but that's not who's the only kids that are in our system, right? And I get why you focused on, on those children, but when we go back to some of the recommendations, um, one of the recommendations was I asked um, for, or we asked, we asked to, um, to tell us how you would uh, incorporate more children 
in um, it, to have more court oversight and not necessarily removal, just court oversight because I think a lot of the voluntary based um, placement it isn't necessarily working for our kids. There's no, you know, there, there's no real um, tools that are being used in order to enforce to, to compliance, if you will, right? Um, and so um, you, you gave me, in terms of a response, a, a list of a, a lot of the support programs and services that would be um, uh, essential to that. Um, but you didn't answer the question in terms of how you would approach the rest of the age range. And so I really would like for you to think about what that looks like and, and potentially in this work group um, answer, answer that question because um, it, it was a, a bit unfinished. Um, the, the other pieces that I would like to have is, uh, uh, to talk about is, um, you know, as I, let me get my notes in place and maybe I'll, I'll tag you. <laughs> is that all right, President? <laughs> Thank you. That's hilarious. So, um, so first of all, I, I wanted to also just say, uh, to you and the team how much I appreciated the, um, all of the report backs, and I know a little bit of this was uh, challenging in the sense that we gave you a date and we said, listen, we're taking this so seriously, we wanna get all this information. Um, so I may ask some questions that you feel like were covered and it will not offend me if you say, look at page, I know we don't have packet pages today, but generally look at page 432 um, because I, I wanna make sure that I'm really digesting what uh, information that you were um, giving us. Um, let me let me start with the uh, with one point that um, Supervisor Arenas raised around this legal consultation issue, and I'm I'm looking uh, Tony at you because I I know this is a partnership between uh, your two offices, and I I want to make sure that I understand where we are in the process of evaluating that and, and refining it in a way that really works for children. So um, in the staff report, it demonstrates that you're, you're looking at that, this transition, you're somewhere in the process of having discussions with staff about transition. What, one request I'm gonna make is that when we're talking to line staff, I also wanna make sure we're incorporating um, their uh, union rep representatives as well because it just gets deeper and we wanna make sure we're not leaving them out, and I think we have to date. So I'm just gonna put that as a request. But could you talk a little bit about where your two teams are in the process of both speaking with line staff, speaking with stakeholders, and then the role that council and is playing in partnership with the social worker today, and where, uh, where you anticipate that going, and how concretely is that being um, both socialized and understood by the line staff? I can probably start, Tony. Um, so in regards to current functioning, uh, the way it works is, and I think uh, Supervisor Arain has kind of talked that through, is currently there is a decision made by the department uh, that goes up to the manager, and then that manager solely is consulting with county council. That's currently as of today. Uh, what we're working on is also what Supervisor Rain has brought up, which is having a two-team or two-person team go through those processes in regards to engaging staff as well as engaging other folks uh, to really look at that MDT model. Those two persons. Can you are, say MD? What model? I'm sorry, multidisciplinary team. So is that different than your previous pro, um, process with the staffing? model or is that the same model with different players at the table or something it, else it's i would say it's something a little different in the sense that it does involve not just the chain of command of the social worker it involves other persons uh, so it involves other managers social workers and supervisors and it also allows for uh, 
the clinical side of the house, which is the department, to really have a thorough conversation on their assessment prior to any legal consultation. So it operates in that, that fashion. So, um, Tony, did you want to weigh in? I'll pass it over to Assistant County Counsel Michaela Lewis, who oversees uh, our attorney team that works with uh, DFCS. Uh, but just, I just want to make one general comment uh, that, you know, the County Counsel's Office, I think, is um, interested in, in willing and working with DFCS where they where they want us and how they want us to work with them. And so, you know, we're um, happy to play the specific role that they ask us to play and, you know, are, are flexible as to the particular um, model that, um, that they want to put in place in terms of consultation with us. And I'll hand it over to Michaela for further words. And just to um, echo what um, uh, Director Wright was sharing, the model is consistent with the interim direction right now. The um, division manager is consulting with um, the child and family protection team. Um, the, the team is happy to serve in whether it's an NBT model or the prior model or continuing to follow the interim direction, um, we're available to support those. So um, here's what I'm going to want to better understand, and I, I think I may be reiterating, um, but I just want to lift up the points that um, Supervisor Adonis raised. One is that it appears to me that if we are trying to be um, very, you know, obviously child-centered and family-supportive, that that does require a different mode of operation for the organization that in fact can do that in as, in, in as real time uh, uh, as possible with the decision makers around one table. And I want to reinforce that the, that I think the idea of clarity of roles is something I'm going to want to be able to see in writing that this is what person X is responsible for and this is what person Y is responsible for because the, the especially as it relates to the roles in different departments so that both the social workers, the the um, foster families, the families that are engaged in our process. So everybody has a real clear understanding of those roles and responsibilities. Now, I think there are certain parts of our organization that understand that better than others. And I also think that the reason I'm really weighing in on this is that I think we have had a cultural response to a policy, to lack of policy clarity. So the interaction that, um, that Supervisor Arenas raised about how the disposition of these cases was being considered, meaning that you know, if, a, if a social worker didn't properly fill out paperwork, you know, and then it became the county council's role to say paperwork filled out or not filled out appropriately, if that gave the impression and or the, the, yeah, the impression or the reality that there was a, a, the clinical decision maker wasn't making the decision and the legal was, that that actually creates a lot of um, conflict where there really needs to be more collaboration and more distinction. So I know that's where you're heading. I just want to say out loud that if, in fact, we aren't able to explain it, verbally, in writing, in trainings, and then exercise it, we're going to be stuck in this lack of accountability loop that I, I know we all want to get out of. So I want to make sure, back to the point that Sylvia raised, as many people around the table as we need to get buy-in and to get that, um, that uh, clarity is going to be really important. So I, I know that may feel obvious, but the reason I'm saying this um, in the way I'm saying it is I, I want to make sure that all of our team understands that we understand that this is a, a, a shift and a change that has to be made in real time, and it's going to be a bit of a struggle. Um, so that's that actually is, is my first issue, and I, I want to reiterate that engaging the frontline staff 
from throughout the organization is going to be really important. And I, it sounds like you feel like some of that outreach is happening. I know you have a lot of employees, and so I'm getting emails from everybody who didn't get invited to participate. So, you know, however we make that party bigger, I, you know, I just say, my mom used to just say, add more water to the beans. So I don't know how you're going to do that, but I'm just saying, you know, do it. Yeah, definitely, Supervisor Chavez. Um, I'm speaking to staff individually, and I'll speak a little clearer in regards to the process. So there's two senior managers that are working on making sure that they gather input, not in regards just to a previous model, but what staff are saying that it should look like. To the other point in regards to, which I think is really important that you said this process should be child-centered and family-centered, we're also bringing in the child and family teaming process, which actually should prompt whatever decisions that we're talking about. That includes the family, as well as their safety and support network, and any decision that we make should be done in consultation with that. So that team is actually working on that now, as well as there's going to be a survey going out to staff, as well as some individual check-ins. So like you said, we're going to try to bring in as many people as possible to provide input. We have been getting varying kind of uh, opinions about what to do, uh, but definitely consolidating that and coming up with a pretty uh, doable solution in partnership with uh, county council. So I, I would just recommend that, again, that we continue to broaden the tent because I think that's how you're going to make the cultural change anyway. I know it's complex and hard to do that, um, but I think it's just really critical. I'm going to move on um, to another issue that... Um, Be before you move on, because this is still uh, related to, yeah, no to this, this piece, I, um, I know that there's... Um, there's an opportunity, I, I really like that, adding uh, more water to the beans, even if there's only two left, <laughs> we can make it look like a soup. That's right. Um, so I, I know this is fast moving situations and, and I know that the model is con currently is, is still challenging for um, social workers. And so I want to make sure that that, that um, continues to improve, and I really appreciate your question, Supervisor Chavez, because I think we, we um, can't wait until the next uh, proposal, which I'm really looking forward to seeing what that looks like, because in real time, there's some urgent situations, right? And um, what I've heard is that, you know, there, there are social workers who are in the moment waiting to hear back from, from um, their supervisors who might, for whatever reason, are doing good work somewhere else and just are not available in in um, in the moment. And so I'm wondering if you think that there is another short-term solution to help fix that, um, just to you know, kind of make things a little bit better. Definitely, we'll try to work through that. I, I don't know if I'll be able to answer right now in regards to what we'll be able to change, but. Uh, I know we've been working with county council uh, in regards to making the process as efficient as possible. I know we've been working with our management teams in regards to the structured decision-making tool. Uh, and just to talk about that a little, uh, a little bit, if that tool is completed, and I understand there's kind of problems with you know, how we view that tool, uh, but if that tool is completed, it's based in the WIC 300, which is our dependency law. So if that's completed, those uh, items are done, uh, we should be moving forward in regards to what's indicated on that. So we are going to drill down to really figure out what are those conversations in, uh, that are leading to the back and forth uh, to really figure out how we can tighten that up. Because when it gets to county council, we should have a decision. It should be pretty fleshed out. And there should be clarity on what we're doing as far as next steps. So. Well, well, I think it's that's, that's part of the, the issue that they don't want to wait they don't want to make a decision without county council. They want county council to continue to guide them um, personally or directly, not personally, just directly in, in versus this line of program managers in between uh, carrying on a conversation in between other folks. Um, uh, like I said in the beginning, I think it is a very difficult um, decision to make. and. 
Um, and it's very similar to what we have to decide um, what to do in our own respective families, you know, as a daughter, as a son, and your parents are going through something. It's not just you, it's, it's you know, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, and you're figuring out what's the best next step um, for this, you know, very uh, delicate situation that you're going to have. Um, and so I think it's, it, 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 it's not county council versus social workers. I think it's it's a, a partnership because I believe at one point it was a partnership and they value that relationship and they've said they value the relationship. Um, and now just the structure is, is getting in the way. So I would really ask you to take a look at what um, what are those challenges that, that you may be able to fix in order to get better decisions for our social workers in the moment. Um, and I know that you're moving towards the MDTs, which I think are, it's, that's fabulous. You, you've obviously um, un understood that this is a, a model that works for, for staff, and, and sometimes we need to bring back what just works, right? Mm -hmm. Something works, let's, it's not broken, let's, let's bring it back. Um, 2.0 version, right? Okay, so, um, and, and I saw you shake your head, Damien, but um, just, that's a yes? If I could get this to work. Yes, we're on the same page. Super okay. And then, Sylvia, just on yeah. that point, yeah, just yeah. to follow back up, um, could, could you just take a moment on on how, how the 24-7 the response works to today versus what you anticipate it to be. And, and, I, and I think it follows up on one point that mm -hmm. Silvio was raising both about social workers uh, on the ground, making sure that I think they all wanna know they're doing the right thing as well. Um, but how with, with any new changes, we, we're still able to provide support to social workers who are you know, out in the field at 11, 2 a.m. or how, how does that work? Today and how do you anticipate it working? If you know in in future iterations of this process. So definitely, we have uh, what's called an after-hours response protocol. Uh, within that, you have not only uh, duty supervisors, social workers, and managers able to support uh, in various situations, or folks that work in those particular areas, uh, but also in regards to what you said, how it would look in the future. Uh, we also are always available as exec team members and are as the senior managers or as the uh, managers that are 24-7. And looking at currently what happens is a social worker has a, a concern with the family. They need to consult. They're reaching out to that on-duty manager uh, to get consultation. Um, so it's pretty, there actually is, the, there's a pretty straightforward process. What I would expect in the future is that there is a process where there's more than just that manager, a part of that process. And even before that, there's the child and family team process that's occurred, which includes not only the manager, which all of this can happen together, but it also includes service providers and other folks all at the same time. So, so when we talk about the multidisciplinary team, even though that was a model that we did two, iter oh, sorry, two iterations ago, there's ways in which, like Supervisor Arain has talked about, a 2.0, where we can include things like the child and family team to put everything together and make sure that there's opportunities in real time to have really critical decisions made. So what I would recommend, again, and I'm gonna just say this again, that encourage engaging as many line staff as possible, because I think that that is what our objective is, but it may not be um, what's happening in practice depending on you know, who's responding to, to what. And, and so I'm just gonna say, I think the staff consult strategies when you have staff in the field is something that really needs to be um, refined. And, and I'm just gonna, oh, did you wanna respond to that, Damien? No, go ahead, okay. Supervisor. What I was gonna say, really, this was more to you all, is that some time ago I wanted us to do a, um, both a time study and a cost study of how we were responding to um, to emergencies in the field, and if somehow that request got just completely 
disfigured and it really never happened. But part of the reason is that feedback we were getting both from families but even from um, social workers is that they would be responding to an emergency and sometimes waiting for um, a police response or waiting for some other response for hours. And so I, I just want to reiterate that the, that the support, especially for emergency response, needs to really be um, much more robust than I think it has been in the past. And, and that this goes back to, you know, as you're doing these line staff discussions, I think this is a, an opportunity to clean some of that up. And frankly, even with our investigating partners, which I'm, I'm gonna spend a little time on in a moment, but I, I just think that that's an area that I, I wanna make sure we're highlighting. So um, just to go to go on with the, Ooh, can, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, go ahead. No, because I, I think this is related to what you're you're talking about because this is impacting staff, and so I wanted to stay on topic if it's okay to interject. Um, with the permission of the president. <laughs> um, so the the other thing that we are talking about is 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 you know this is the staff needs and and as you know this you're you're the boss. So sometimes folks don't want to talk to the boss. They want to talk to somebody else. They, they feel they can really let it all out. <laughs> and I think that people need that, right? Because um, we, are, we are folks who are doing really difficult work, um, especially social workers and, and yourselves included. And so we all need a little bit of steam um, uh, uh, to get released. Um, and so... With, with that is also some very valid um, uh, concerns. Um, and so what I've heard from social workers is, and, and what I saw in, in your report back was you gave me a list of a lot of the, sta the staff um, and the number of folks that you have on board. But what you didn't get to was what is like the right ratio? And I know that there's a kind of a formula and what's the right ratio in terms of how many, how many staff should we really have? And I know it's based on how many children are in our system, right? But there is a lot of moving or transitioning of, of staff. And um, one of the concerns is, well, at least for me, if you could get me a, a baseline in terms of, well, if we have 100 children with you know, uh, I don't know, five different languages or two different languages. This is typically what we have in terms of a ratio. Uh, or what is the right size? Maybe I, I'll change it from ratio, but what, how, how are we right sizing the staff and, and the units? Because I, I know that there's some units that are feeling very overwhelmed, um, and I know that there's an increase in, um, in removals, but I don't know that there... I think what you did was um, th with with the uh, the structured decision uh, making tool um, and the outputs it has now is is based on some of the policy changes that you you listed. You gave me a list of all of the policy changes. Although I did ask, uh, I w wanted it more summarized, and I did ask for more summarized because those policy changes are just a list, right? and they're based on chronological order and a policy, but what was missing from that document was, you didn't tell me what it actually accomplished. Why was that policy change? Um, why did it take place? And so, and, and we, can, we can do that offline, or I can ask you to, if you could please take me through that um, historical perspective. I, I, I don't. Um, I didn't ask for that for a, a list um, uh, without any, you know, uh, without any context, because it's just a list. What I wanted you to tell me is a story. Like this is this, these are the policies that have evolved, and these are the reasons why they've evolved, because we've seen trends this way, because our social workers needed this, because um, technically this, I don't know, SDM. Uh, uh, tool, you know, just is is, you know, wreaking havoc, and and we needed to fix it, and we need to, I don't know, whatever, for whatever reason it was, and that's partly what I wanted to understand. Um, although some of the other reports allowed me to to, to take a look at the picture, um, uh, 
uh, and kind of put it all together. Um, and so I think for me, is, I'm just missing some of those some of those items that I've asked in the way, in um, and the reason that I asked them is so that I can understand. It's for a level of understanding. I'm not asking you to give me lists and um, and projects and things of that sort just to fill your time. I, I know that you have a lot of other things to do. I'm asking you so that I can understand and I can be a better partner to you. And so, if maybe offline, what we can do is is go through that and just you tell me the story of of the evolution of of those policies because at this point it's just a list. All right. So the the other the other piece is is. And when I was talking about how do we right size um, the units, um, w one of the concerns I heard from social workers is that there is um, a concern that um, case workers or social workers that have a language specific capacity um, are are provided um, a mix of of Spanish or or Vietnamese and English, and I think there's you know a concern on my end um, because when those social workers, um, in terms of getting filled up, or are, are at an eighty percent max, which is what they, I think the the max is typically for a language specific social worker, then we can't hand them more language specific cases because they're maxed out, right? Um, anyways, I think that's another item that I'd like for you to really take a look at. Um, you don't have to answer now unless you have um, some um, feedback. Um, uh, and and I think the the other um, concern that I wanted to make sure that I I bring up because I want to honor the uh, what social workers are are sharing with me and I. Um, I understand typically that's your relationship with them, but I think now now we're a family. Now we're all talking about this at, at the kitchen table and we're figuring it out, right? So the, the other piece is I think um, there's some that are feeling left out and I think it would be a really great um, opportunity for you to meet with all social workers that conduct um, risk and safety assessments, and not exclusive to to a certain t unit, and and um, so that they can continue to to provide feedback. And in this work group, we will make it more specific. Um, the 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 other piece that I and and maybe I, I wasn't sure where you were going um, next, but I was going to talk about. Um, which is one thing that was missing, I already mentioned it, is, is how are these cases getting elevated um, to a different response when voluntary doesn't work? It's not working. H how are we elevating it? And this is where I'm going next, but I wasn't sure if this was... Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. You're on. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Arenas. Uh, there, there actually is a policy that kind of walks through that process, which basically uh, in two parts. One, if that family uh, is not engaging in services and the risk level is so high that we need to inv intervene at a higher level, there is processes that our staff should do, uh, including consultation with the supervisor and manager regarding those particular cases. <clears throat> I do want to say in regards to some of what we've seen in the increase is some of that, that particular decision making. So a few of our cases, or a good number of our cases, are actually some of our uh, voluntary cases that have been served, uh, and there has not been an, either an engagement or a significant engagement, which is leaving the child at risk, and so we're intervening at a higher level. So that's the process, as well as what we're seeing in regards to some of our current data. Um, but what, one of the responses, and I think we got this from probation, was that when we asked, you know, would differential response or kids in differential response be included in like a court um, um, or, or in a, the DIY um, program, said, well, it doesn't elevate it because they're not uh, high risk enough. Um, and so 
I, I guess you know what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to um, figure out is is this connection between um, probation and and DFCS and and how the cases are handled because if we have 52 percent of our youth um, that have a can uh, call in in their history, um, that means that we have a lot of children who are older, right? Mm -hmm. And we're we're focused on on uh, intervening a, a, a bit more on the children zero through five, and then we're left with the kids who are older, who sometimes, you know, are, they're hard to serve. They're harder to serve. I recognize that, um, but they're heading towards the probation department, um, and so this is one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that, um, ooh, probation's coming down. <laughs> Um, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that we have this alternative um, uh, proposal that I asked for um, so that we can think about, and, and I'm not asking for us to remove children from their families. What I am asking for is to give our courts an opportunity to have oversight of, of some of these cases that are higher risk and that um, our families will benefit from. Uh, and I've seen it work. I mean, you, you've all seen it work. Our, our courts, you know, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to say about some of the, you know, the, the, the length of time, the response, and it, everything's not, justice isn't perfect, but there's a lot of courts that have had a lot of really great um, results. And so, um, anyways, uh, it, and I'm thinking about the duly involved youth is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, and I know that the the number the numbers in the in that program are very significant. They're very low, right? And probably because they're very intense. And I'm like, I would love to shift all of those kids over to you, probation, because <laughs> they're coming to you. Um, listen, I don't I don't want them in any system. I I want our black and brown children never to be in a system and never to have us walk them there. But when, they are, um, when they're having these calls already in, in terms of their history, then it's our responsibility to intervene in some way. And, and we're, somehow we're not doing that. And so I need your expertise to tell me. I, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to try to put two and two together. But if, if you... If I, if I can rely on you to help me get there, I think that would be even more effective. So, so definitely I'll have probation. I know they walked up, they'll, they'll be able to respond. Um, the two pieces that I'll say is definitely with our duly involved youth, uh, they're, they're in the court process, so it's definitely a partnership with our courts to ensure that they're in the right system. Uh, the second piece is we have a really good working relationship with probation where there's conversations about which system that child should belong in to uh, and or whether that child should be represented by both systems. So uh, I'm sure probation will speak to that. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate that, that. And that's why I asked, like, what our differential response, are the kids in differential response, are they qualified to, to go into the DIY program because... I want to see these other kids have a very structured um, way of succeeding. And it seems like this program is just doing fabulous. And so when I saw, well, they're not high risk enough, and I thought, well, are we waiting for, for kids to get to that level? You, you, you want to say something, and I really want to hear it. <laughs> Uh, through the, uh, the president, Mariel Caballero, Deputy Director, Probation and Administration, and I have with me Deputy Chief Vaughn Kegaris and Probation Division Manager Victoria Contreras Wolf. Um, I wanted to just provide a little bit of additional clarity. Um, as you already mentioned, the number of youth in the DIY unit is, is fairly small comparative to the number, overall number of young people who may have had contact with DFCS. Uh, the information that we provided in the memo uh, shows that out of uh, roughly 1,900 undue duplicated youth who were referred to the probation department, 986 unduplicated youth, which is 52%, had a uh, referral to CWS. Unfortunately, our system does not let us know 
when that referral was. So it may not be an active case. It may not have been substantiated or unsubstantiated. Uh, it may not have been a substantiated case, and we don't know any details related to the referral. And then I find I would also like to point out that of that 986 youth, there's a portion of those youth that are not court involved on the probation side. So um, which means that their offenses are fairly low level, mm -hmm. um, and they're handled through our diversionary programs. I don't have that specific percentage right now. I've been trying to get it all afternoon. <laughs> but um, uh, we do know that roughly between 30 and 45 percent of the referrals that come to probation are handled through diversion. So we anticipate that that would be r around the same percentage range of um, youth that are referred from, that have a CWS referral at any point in their lifetime um, mm -hmm. would also be part of the diversionary program. So um, with that just kind of basic information, I'd like to turn it over to um, Deputy Chief Kegaris and um, uh, Probation Division Manager Contreras Wolf to, to talk a little bit about the partnership between uh, the units in DIY. So yeah. but pardon me, before, before that, that next report uh, comes, I just wanna do a time check. We're about an hour and a half into this item. We have a number of items to follow, including members of the public waiting to speak on 31 and 32. Um, I fully appreciate that you wanted this with the full board and not in committee, uh, but I'm a little bit concerned about the, the level of detail, all of which is fascinating and critical. So I am loath to shorten it, but I'm very mindful of, of all of our board members and members how, of the public. How about if we, what we do is, is um, a motion on some of the areas that we've already discussed and, and have a continuation for another meeting for some of the... For the next quarterly report. Right, right, right. No, we wouldn't want to wait. Quarter. Not quarterly, monthly. It, maybe... I mean, we, no, I'm going to keep the DFCS matters on the on the quarterly uh, schedule so that we are we're able to move through all of our business. So... I'm happy if you need more time now. I would just like to get a sense so that I can let folks that are waiting uh, know about how much time you think this item requires today. Well, listen, if, I think if we can form a work group, um, Supervisor Chavez, I think maybe we can take some of the other items that are um, a little more detailed. Tony, is that something Love that. that we could? Uh, it, Yes, it would depend on the uh, composition of the work group that y'all are interested in. Is it just the two of you? We Such said everyone. Thing? We said, like, invite every everybody. <laughs> but I mean from the board, yes. The board. Yes, just the two of you. So um, because the two of you are brown acted on this particular item, if you were to create a committee that included just the two of you plus additional folks, there would be a Brown Act issue, so. Uh, but we're bringing this only to the um, board and we're not taking it back to committee. Correct, but, but, you, but as you just mentioned, Supervisor, the two of you are already Brown Acted on this particular issue. So as to the body you create, you, you would have potentially a, a Brown Act issue there. So. Can we do an ad hoc? You can do an ad hoc. Okay, yes. then. But that ad ad, just to be is. clear, the ad hoc could only include the two of you. You could invite other people to attend the meeting, but the actual committee members could only be the two of you and have to be for a discrete issue. Uh, so you'd have to just call out precisely what it is that you would be addressing. And well, can we, can we um, have the board referral that was approved in December 19th as, as the direction of the ad hoc? I think it's probably too broad. You'd have to um, specify. Oh, those are very specific. The recommendations. Yeah, I think I think you'd you couldn't do the whole sort of breadth of everything in the referral. You'd probably have to pick pick and um, choose which one ones or, are one, remaining. Yeah, exactly, and there's some items I think that we could check off. Um, okay, I think I think that could be a solution, right? Yeah. Yes, we we'll take your quarterly and do a talk. <laughs> I love the idea raise of, a, you an ad hoc. of a working group. I don't know if just one of you would want to sit on it and then report back to the board at the quarterly meetings, but that would facilitate a working group with whoever you want without a Brown Act uh, issue. Well, it's an ad hoc now, so yeah. I think I think we're we're in it to win it. 
President yes. Eilenberg. Um, okay, so I think at this point, um, um, maybe what we could do is, uh, I, I don't know if you had another, um, some uh, additional feedback, Victoria, I think we were on that. And then and then what I, I have think- some questions, I need to yeah, come over here. Uh, um, Supervisor Travis has some questions. And, I and think still just looking for a time estimate to report to folks that have asked me about such. Can we do 30 minutes? Sure. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah. All right. Um, you got it. Okay, we'll talk Madam later. Chair, but then at that, at that point, we may need to take a break for the clerk, so we'll still have yeah. folks waiting. Supervisor Smidian. I apologize. I'm going to, I can't. I can and will stay through the rest of this item, mm -hmm. but at that point, I probably will have to vacate the dais. I'm hoping that that leaves four members who yeah. don't have scheduling challenges today. Good, okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so we will wrap this up at 5.30. So as Mariel indicated, we do a probation like to handle all cases at the lowest level of intervention when it is appropriate. And so even though the population in the DIY unit is small, um, and many of them may be wards or have some formal court involvement, our goal is when we do know that a youth has a referral and there is a social worker involved, whether it's voluntary or some other um, open, something that's open, um, we, our supervisor and the D probation supervisor in the DIY unit has eyes on those cases. So all of those cases get forward to the supervisor from our prevention and early intervention, and we evaluate the case and we determine whether formal um, intervention is needed um, and what services they're currently receiving, how we can supplement those services and have the lightest touch possible so that those youth can you know, have uh, the referral that they need or have a conversation with a probation officer and then get on their way and have their record sealed. Th thank you. I'm just going to finish up here. I, I just wanted to know, and, and this is, so from the nine, from 1,903, 1, the 986, which is 52% of that, 20% um, of those had a sibling that were, was in a primary, was a primary in the child welfare um, case. And so just going back to um, this from your report, um, and so what I'm what I'm saying is that those children have some high risk needs, right? There, and and all I'm saying is that there is an opportunity for some additional court oversight for those children. I don't necessarily. I'm not picking on DIY. This just you're doing a really great job. Don't do such a great job, and I won't be. I won't want to, you know, stick them into your program, but. But I just think that there's an opportunity for us to take a look at, and this is part of the alternatives, Damien, is what are some of those alternatives? Um, you know, I'm, I obviously highlighted the DIY program. It doesn't have to be. It could be just um, a court involved, uh, uh, elevating the, the case that way, but not um, removing the child from, from the home, or augmenting some of those services, as you mentioned in one of your reports. Um, there has to be something in addition to what we are doing now because we are finding these kids over in the probation department with at least one one, uh, one case or one can center call and then their siblings, a 20% of those have siblings who do have a primary case. So there's something going on there and I think there's an opportunity for us to really take a look at, at um, looking a little more upstream on this. So that, that's my piece, and I, um, I'll hand it over back to uh, Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you, and thank you very much uh, for your report. And I, I do, let me just make an observation. Um, one challenge that we have, and I'm really saying this to my colleagues, is that the way our calendar worked out, we have very few um, board meetings, which means, right, we had one in January, and, and we seem to have um, fewer of them, and I think that's going to put an awful lot of pressure on the board relative to being able to have um, robust discussions. And the second thing is I just want to say, and I know, uh, President Ellenberg, this is not um, in any way to uh, to, to dis discount what you're saying, because I have to say managing these meetings, having formally been chair, is very challenging, especially given the types of information that comes before us and how complex it is, um, and yet, 
you know, obviously, this is such an important uh, body of work, it, and the, the public's really interested in it, and the board's really interested in it as a whole, that um, I don't necessarily think we have a really good option a, as to how we dive into this, except that one request I would make through the president is that if appropriate, that we may want to look uh, mid-year at a, a study session just on this, on a separate day, just so people can give feedback, both the public and us, with some time, time certainty. Um, all that saying, um, I'm going to go to the grid that you gave us, just because I want to be mindful of time and recognizing we have a number of other issues uh, before us today. Um, and as part of the grid, one thing that was helpful was to get the written reports. But in a number of the written reports, I was left with um, some questions about how and what the implications of the reports were relative to the challenges that have been raised by the board, and I mean, and by the public. And so I want to give you two of them. Um, one is, um, I heard uh, Katie, I don't know if she's still here, raising um, issues about the, the, the interpretation from families and foster families and implications for uh, families in terms of accessing services. And it brings me to this point, which is that it is difficult to understand how we measure the success of our voluntary programs relative to um, the non, you know, when somebody has some court supervision. And in many respects, the way we've talked about this has almost been in, a, in black and white terms, right, which is, you know, a child's removed or you're under court supervision and you're able to keep your children or you're involuntary. And the, the um, buckets are, so, in my mind, so distinct th that I'm having a difficult time saying, oh, it makes, it makes sense that these families are in, in this particular um, situation and the disposition of their cases are be, being handled this way and we can evaluate their effectiveness and success in you know, in voluntary or even in court mandated based on whether or not we have enough supports, the family has enough natural support or, and there's a, a pathway to success. So if you could in very broad terms address how you all today are thinking about those three um, avenues and what I should be looking for in the documents that you've given us that helps me understand the, the approach that we're taking. And I want to couple that, and the reason I kept, the, I kept two contracts off is because when I was looking at the contract amounts for the um, three f um, agencies that are providing support to families, what I was really trying to understand is how available are resources to families given the volume in each of these different areas where we're really trying to provide support to families to have success. Uh, thank you for the question, Supervisor Chavez. To be really uh, distinct and clear about uh, how to look at this, I would say it would be on levels of intervention based off of risk uh, to the child. So the lower risk that you have to a child, the lower the intervention should be also those services parallel. So when you look at lower risk families, you're talking about things like parenting classes, tangible resources, housing, those type of things to address uh, very low risk situations. The higher risk that you move up, the higher the intervention. So you may move from not having any intervention with the family at all to the higher the risk goes, you now start to look at voluntary services because that family needs not only the support and services that would be provided, they also need the oversight and monitoring by our department. And so you keep going up as the risk grows to the point of when you're assessing a case and the risk outweighs the safety of the child, you then remove the child. So when you look at all of the resources and services, again, they should parallel in regards to what the needs of the family are, and again, based off the risk to the child. Some services, based on just some of the creativity our county has done in the past few years, we're able to push services more on the front end, so wraparound. 
We're one of the only counties that offer wraparound and voluntary services. Most counties do that only for court services. Um, so those are opportunities where you have very different uh, types of services that may be more geared towards the court realm, if you will, that we have more up front. And we are going to provide a, a updated report in regards to this level of service and resources. I, and, and Damian, thank you. I, I think, um, I, I understand what you just said in a in a our approach perspective. The challenge that that I'm having is both how the interpretation of the laws of when a child's at risk and under what terms and conditions more more clearly we're we're saying your your path is path A, path B, or path C, and in particular because. In the, in the world of voluntary services, access to those services in, in a very real way, like meaning you have the ability to get to those services, you have the ability to access those services, those services have effectiveness for your family. What's difficult for me to understand based on the, the materials I've seen, and I've read um, the reports, even the, the, I know we used to have reports that that went to the feds and state about how we were pursuing this. I, I still am having a hard time understanding when, when somebody's in vo all voluntary services, whether or not we have clear and distinct mechanisms for moving them up and whether or not we have distinct mechanisms for moving people to lower, lower services in, a, in an effective uh, way. And it's not clear to me that that's the case. And and I don't know, I, I didn't read anything that made me say, oh, listen, I, I absolutely understand why we're, um, these kinds of cases are going to voluntary. I, I wanna understand that better. And I, what I really wanna understand is, are people able to access appropriate services that actually help them move up or down the food chain? From talking to our foster parents and some of our advocates, it appears very difficult for parents to um, be able to access some services, depending on where they live, depending on their own transportation ab abilities, frankly, depending on even the, on their personal organization skills. So for me, a bit, a, one question that I, I just really wanna make sure that I understand the policies that drive that the, the continuum and and our, uh, us being a resourced enough county to be able to quickly respond when, a, when that family doesn't any longer fit, I, I know the first box is different, but doesn't fit in super, supervision, voluntary, you know, I, I, I don't feel like that's very clear. It's not clear to me, and I really have read almost all of your stuff. Uh, definitely, Supervisor Chavez, we can bring that back to make sure that we have some clarity in regards to um, at least one thing that I'm hearing from you, uh, which is definitely where is the service array at, particularly around uh, when a family needs a particular service, and is that equated necessarily to the intervention? Uh, and some of that is no. Uh, in regards to, again, using wraparound as an example, uh, that service actually gets to a population that Supervisor Rain has talked about earlier, which is our high acuity youth. In most counties, as indicated, that service is only for court served families. In our county, we can serve families through voluntary. And so there are opportunities that kind of uh, skew maybe some of how the services look in our particular county in regards to resourcing for supportive services. Uh, that's one piece in regards to the intervention, and I think that's where um, there's further conversation needed with the community, because sometimes uh, what I've heard is the service is really what they're meaning is the intervention. So we're removing a child, that child is going into foster care, that's an intervention. And with foster cares come foster care funds, as well as other sorts of opportunities that happen for that caregiver. And those are some of the things that we've been hearing from some of our community partners that only happen when the children come, come into care. Yeah, I understand, and I, I think those are excellent points. And I, I let me just um, make a couple of overall recommendations, and then um, 
I'll work with my colleague to refine our ad hoc asks so that we can dive deep into these issues. First, um, as it relates to the matrix, I have a recommendation and a request. Um, the, what I would recommend is that the, the, all of the recommendations stay on one um, living, breathing uh, chart. And that what is included is, you know, what the source of the recommendation was, like if it was a board meeting or a referral or whatever, uh, whoever um, we're responding to, that the, the status update, if the staff believes the report was sufficient, and it does say that in some areas and in other areas um, it, it doesn't, then I, I would just want to say that, that, you know, that's for you when this comes back to us that it's, it says completed. What would be important for me to know is who the lead staff is and what the timelines are we expect for completion. And in areas where we gave updates that were more informational, but not necessarily, you know, responsive to the, to the, um, to the next steps, that, that that just be written out the way we would do, for example, any other audit, uh, because I think it will help the entire board stay on track with the issues that they're most concerned about. The other request I would make is that we have a form that a format that we we use for the a joint foster youth task force. And a number of items that were on the agenda today, colleagues, and it was one of the reasons I didn't necessarily want them all put on consent, was that some of the, like, um, some of these are, are part of initiatives that happened when we did the joint foster youth task force, and that was very informed by the public, by our employees, by parents, and folks that were part of the, these systems. And I think it's really critical that we demonstrate to the public that these were issues that were raised, this is how we resolve them. And I think they can go in the back of your matrix, but we should be keeping a running tally of, of those. One of the reasons this, I was sparked by this is actually when, when Supervisor Arena said, oh, you know, we're gonna go back and use the MDTs because that's actually something that worked. We made some changes. We're gonna go back to the back to the future, so to speak, in terms of what tools we're gonna use. I wanna make sure that the board, as it's trying to rectify and um, strengthen the, this, um, this part of our um, organization, that we don't undo work that was already in, in progress inadvertently, and that we recognize that, that those bodies of work were really, could really be categorized in terms of, again, being child-centered, are we supporting um, families? How are we supporting foster families? That was really an intent, intention of not, you know, of dealing with the tensions we were having at that time um, with our, our support uh, partners in the community. So all of that, I think, is, is just, those are big issues. I, I just want to highlight some that I, I still want a lot more information on. One is what I just talked about in terms of the distinction relative to voluntary versus involuntary. The other is our investigative structures. Who are our partners, and what are the processes and procedures we're using, and how are we tracking overall um, children who've ever touched our system. I thought um, the probation department did a really good job of explaining, you know, that we have children who, who at some point have been part of one system or, or another. And I think we need to start really honing in on the number of children and the number of families all of our departments are interacting with so that as we move forward, the services that we're gonna be able to provide are gonna be much more customized because we actually understand what systems they are coming in contact with at what point of time in their lives. And the other thing is, even for the CAN Center, and I'll just remind you that this was, as part of our joint foster youth task force that we kicked off forever ago, there was one program that we created at that time called our Neighbor to Neighbor Program. And it was intended to deal with people who weren't even in the the voluntary, it was even pre that. It was intended to be very intervention oriented so we could track and support families by, even if we could, if it was possible for keeping them out of our system, but at some point we had a, we had a shot at helping a family. And what's, what's important about that is that that kind of work would allow us to align so much of the other work we're doing. As an example, 
We're very focused on preventing families from becoming homeless. Those are exactly the families that we're getting the low-level calls about, that maybe it's relative to poverty or other things. But we haven't, that neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor program merged into the, the a differential response for a kind of a higher need. So we, we, in a way, have moved up back up the food chain instead of having the early intervention that's been part of our vision. So that would be part, if, if I could, um, as part of a motion to make the request for information to be structured in a way that the board will easy, easily be able to follow, and that we do a deep dive into the areas that were uh, discussed today, recognizing there were a number of areas we weren't able to, to address today, which you know I recognize that the challenges with the board meeting, um, but did you make a motion? Because that'll be my motion, if not. That would be my motion. And Supervisor Chavez, if second. I can just. I'm, I'm second. Um, but I would like to add to that motion because I know we're, we're right. finishing up. And I want to make sure that our colleagues have time yes. to speak okay. as well. They're getting um, a little window. So, so let me add to the motion. It's direct county council and the administration to report back to the board with an ad hoc committee on key is yes. issues with uh, myself and Supervisor Chavez. It's also to direct administration to expand their matrix into a comprehensive DF reforms work plan. I know that you you want it in a, an easy to read, um, and um, I, want, I want it in a work plan so that we are um, checking off outcomes um, in relationship to, to the direction that we gave. And I think both of those are, I don't think they're contra. Okay. I mean, right. that's what that's that that Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so that outlines goals, oh, it's more specific. Outline goals and objectives, people, departments involved, milestones and timelines as driven by DFCS mission. Um, the reform, the work plan should seek to unify the board of supervisor directors aimed at improving the DFCS system, including those provided at the special hearing and um, really focused on um, outcome data. And then return to the board with a supplemental that expands on today's reports on options to expand court oversight. I did ask for that earlier. Just want to make it into that motion that provides clear new options to expand court supervision to additional targeted subpopulations. This is what you were talking about, um, Supervisor Chavez, and request that the OPP policy report be resubmitted to ad hoc categorized by subject area, not month. Revised report should include the previous and current policies showing the revision made changes that relate to the assessment of either risk or safety. Gotta and slow down a little bit. We're getting some. I some will send this over to the clerk. I will send this over to you, Jess. Um, changes that relate to the assessment of either risk or safety and or correct actions for staff to take should be identified and report on service array to the ad hoc or board per um, Supervisor Chavez's request. Incorporate the Child Abuse Prevention Council in the additional study being conducted by DFCS in partnership with Probation and Behavioral Health Department, which will answer whether recent child welfare practice trends are having an impact on the number of youth with, with juvenile justice involvement, as well as requesting a study session this spring that covers issues. And I think this is what Supervisor Chavez already said. Um, and then lastly, I. It, within any of those, I don't know where we can fit it, but I do want to, I, I, I was thinking about what you were saying um, in terms of how we provide services to children and families, um, and we rely on CBOs to do a lot of that um, that work, but I don't know if they're being effective, if their strategies are effective in terms of supporting the children that we, or in the way that, that um, prevent them from coming into the system. Um, I, I don't, I, I would love to see that included. So, and then lastly, uh, which is not covered today, but um, I'd love to see how we can coordinate a joint report back and presentation by the to the board by DFCSDA and the sheriff in the March on an interagency communication cooperation, in particular the implementation of the joint response protocol, as well as a proposal to implement the e-scars in Santa Clara County. And this is the electronic communication portal that, um, um, that was mentioned in the report. That's it. I, I'm just going to note that that March is is quite soon, and I would like to keep these other than the ad hoc request that obviously needs a little bit faster. The reports back to come at the next quarterly meeting to the, for anything that is coming back to the board to stay within the quarterly format. 
the ad hoc we can we can do quickly at the next meeting so that you don't s slow down on any of the work. Okay. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Thank you. And really, I'm n not only because we're short on time, am I not going to add add very much? But but there's truly nothing I could do to add to the thoroughness and care with which you are both addressing this this critical work. So I want to just express my appreciation and full support. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. I think this is a quick question. <laughs> um, and forgive me if I missed it. Uh, where do we stand with, I believe it's the California Department of Social Services, CDSS, who um, initially at least has declined to provide us with a copy of their report in the specific Phoenix Castro case. Yes, uh, pursuant to the board's direction, we made a formal request to CDSS for either a redacted version of the report or for them to issue a modified report. Uh, the state declined the request. Uh, What steps, if any, might we take to, to pursue the matter further? And let me just be very clear before anyone leans in to answer. I, it, you know, I mean, we're, we're having these hard conversations because we had a human tragedy that shined a light on a larger set of issues. And you can't fix the system if the system needs fixing, and it seems that it certainly needs improvement. You can't fix the system if you don't know what the problem is. And if you can't see the report, you can't tell what the problem was, at least in that one case, even if you have these conversations about the larger systemic issues. So I, I really do find it mind-boggling. Uh, it's just a phrase I don't use very often. But I really do find it mind-boggling that <laughs> the Board of Supervisors with the responsibility to have just these kinds of hard conversations can't access the most relevant piece of information that prompted these conversations in the first place. And I, I certainly understand, I, you know, again, I've, as I've said in the past, I'm the privacy guy, uh, so I certainly understand and respect the confidentiality issues here, but there are ways to address those that still informs our board of how the system failed to work in at least one tragic case. So, Mr. Williams, Mr. Lepresti, can we get an off-agenda report, privileged or otherwise, about other, other options? In, 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 you we, know. we can certainly, I mean, my best suggestion would be that we can escalate the matter to the governor's office. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm certainly happy to entertain any suggestions you have, including as a last resort litigation. I, I, I just, I mean, we, as I understand it, Mr. Lepresti, and forgive me, Madam Chair, because I thought this was going to be a quick question, but as I understand it, Ms. Lepresti, we are charged with the responsibility for implementing state law in this arena, yes? Yes, that's correct. Well, how on earth can we do, I'm sorry, I, I'm, how on earth can we do that if we don't have access to the information about how the system is or is, this is not meant as a rhetorical question, it's meant, you know, we have certain duties and obligations under state law. We're trying to exercise those duties and obligations under state law, and we're not being given the information we need to exercise those duties and responsibilities under state law. That, that's so. Um, enough said. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, sh I should just. Good that it was quick. Yeah, uh, but I look forward to seeing your. Uh, I have the answer, which is not the answer I wanted, which is we've been told no, and. Um, <laughs> I think this is one of those times when we shouldn't take no for an answer. 
I'll be very clear about that as an individual board member, and I look forward to seeing what our range of options is. Thank you. So that sounds like an add to the motion to direct if the, the maker report and the back. second are amenable, I would certainly yes. add that. Thank right. you. Absolutely. I'm sorry, what, what, what was it? I apologize. The direction is simply to uh, county council and the county executive to provide us with an off agenda memo, which may or may not be confidential, depending on the legal implications. Um, as to how we can uh, proceed to press our case on access to the report uh, oh, while right. respecting the privacy of the parties involved. Yep. Thank you. Great, thank you. Supervisor Lee? I'll just be more blunt. Basically, same point that uh, Supervisor Sumanian is saying, but uh, give us some litigation options and how long it will take to draft a complaint to Superior Court. Thank you. Let's vote on this item, please. And thank you uh, all who are, who are there, who have answered our questions, who see the, the concern and the, the passion around this issue. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. That carries with five. All right, thank you very much. Items 24, item 24, uh, item 25, we're on item. Right, 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 item 24 was moved to consent. So we are hearing item 25, and let me look to Supervisor Simidian is leaving us, thank you. I Not pulled thank it. You for leaving us. But yeah, <laughs> I pulled it, and I'll, I'll just make a quick, okay, I Okay, and comments. I just want to check with the three of you, do you want to break for, for dinner, or do you want to keep going? Let's keep going, if that's okay. Yeah. We will keep it going, and I would encourage anybody to hop out and get a bite when they need a, a quick break. Okay. May I interrupt 25. with a, an announcement for oh, language yes, access? Yes, of course. Thank you. My Thank apologies. you. Um, Fong An will translate my comments. Camille will show slides. This is for upcoming items 31 and 32. Two, we will have Vietnamese interpretation services available. For I'm those gonna ask for quiet in the chambers, please, so we can all hear. Thank you so much. For those in chambers, we have devices available for you to listen to a live Vietnamese translation. Those devices are available with the clerk at the back of the room at the public comment table. Please approach them now to get those devices. We are also sharing on the projectors information to access this feature via Zoom. We have a second live interpreter translating during these items over Zoom. Uh, first, please join the Zoom webinar by accessing the public Zoom link, which is in our agenda packet. Once on Zoom, you may choose your preferred language through the interpretation icon shown on the screen and follow the directions to access the interpretation feature on Zoom via smartphone or your computer. We'll display that slide for a moment while Fong An translates my comments to Vietnamese. Thưa quý vị, phần tiếp sau đây sẽ được dịch ra tiếng Việt và phần dịch sẽ là dịch trực tiếp và song song 131 và 32. Đối với những uh, đại biểu đang ngồi trong khán phòng đây thì ở phía đằng sau có thiết bị dịch tại chỗ để quý vị có thể cầm nhận thiết bị đó ở um, bàn của những cái lời ghi những lời nhận xét của công chúng đó dạy tới đó để nhận thiết bị để có thể nghe phần thông dịch tại chỗ và trực tuyến và Um, đối với những người ở trên uh, online thì có thể đến phần phiên dịch này bằng cách là ở trên mục đây ta thấy có phần thanh công cụ thì hãy chọn um, phần dịch là chọn dấu ba chấm trên thanh công cụ sau đó chọn ngôn ngữ của bạn và nhấn vào nút mute original audio có nghĩa là tắt tiếng âm thanh gốc và chọn tiếng Việt thì lúc đó mình sẽ nghe được phần dịch trực tuyến ở trên mạng qua Zoom. Xin cảm ơn. Thanks very much. So that is in preparation for items 31 and 32, but we still have items 25 and 30. Correct. Before that time. Thanks. 
correct. I'm going to turn to Supervisor uh, Chavez, who wanted to keep this on the regular calendar. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, really, I, I don't need a staff presentation, but colleagues, um, this is the uh, a report that reflects the work being done with foster youth and former foster youth um, ages 16 uh, through 25 for 2022-2023. And the, the thing I just wanted to say to the staff is what a dramatic body of work and a dramatic improvement in terms of the way we were handling um, handling these children in the past. And what I particularly wanted to acknowledge, colleagues, is that we still have a huge housing issue that we need to address um, for our foster youth, but that the the direction we're going is definitely um, going in the in the right way. And so I didn't want to leave this on consent without saying thank you to the leaders of that staff. And if you, if you could just share share the board's thanks, and then to make a, a very specific request around. Um, we are going to have a conversation, uh, again, as part of our budget processes, but the report outs relative to housing. And I think this is a, one of those areas that we're going to need to take a deeper dive into the percentage of children that are still um, becoming homeless. Because even though it's less than it was, it's still, it's still children. So my, I would like to move approval of accepting the annual report with our thanks to staff with direction to the housing staff as we're having discussions long term about the gaps in service that we include um, transitional aged youth as a as a body that a group of children that we need to take a deeper look at. Good. Second, Arena. Excellent. Do we have public speakers on this item? I have no hands in Zoom. No comment cards for twenty five. All right. Let's vote, please. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian is absent. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with four. Thank you very much. Items 26, 27, 28, and 29 were approved on consent. Item 30 is strengthening all families equitably program recommendations, and this requires a Levine Act announcement, please. Item 30 is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member, as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. So on this item, um, I, I pulled this one as well. And the only um, direction, I, I did want to say, um, I want to approve all of the contracts. But I am very interested in getting an off-agenda report. And it could, be, it could come as part of our, our quarterly report. I'm fine with that. On whether or not our nonprofit partners are asking for um, or seeing a higher level of need child than they're able to provide services for because, um, Wendy, that is some feedback that I've received, actually not from our nonprofits, but from the guardians that are engaging the nonprofits, whether it's their their parents or their, I mean, uh, guardians or, or parents, actually. Um, it, so I'm, I'm actually really concerned that there may be a gap in the services we're providing, and I don't know if that's feedback you've gotten as well. Turn your mic on, please. Did it go on? Yes. yes. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the board. Wendy Kinnear-Rash, one of the assistant directors with Department of Family and Children's Services. So I'll make a couple statements on that. Absolutely, yes, we want to be mindful of the right levels of support at the right times. Um, a couple things just for consideration and for points of understanding. These new contracts that are named Safe Supporting All Families Equitably, it was the previous neighbor to neighbor that's now been attached with funding, supports, and really to that realization. We need to attach funding, resources, supports. So it really came from that understanding of Is making it then sure. And Wendy, then, this is for folks who are really early in the system? Because the neighbor to neighbor was much higher level so than wraparound. These will be I mean, lower level. I'm sorry. These will be families that have come to the attention of the hotline, the Child Abuse and Neglect Center, that are evaluate outs or non-reports. So these will be things that don't rise to the level of coming into voluntary or those type of services, um, but will be supported. Another point that I will note as well, though, is that we also have work going on in our comprehensive prevention plan and needing to have a community pathway as well for those families that don't even come to the attention of child welfare. 
and it is our plan that these programs will also potentially be one of those community pathways as well. So this really is about those initial discussions that were happening with CAST, no wrong door, how do we push out the right supports and make sure those families have needs that are met. I you know, agree you know you. one request I would make, so thank you, that's very, very, very good news, Wendy. I would just ask, um, in the future contract histories, that that be outlined a little more clearly because for a couple reasons, including that all those folks who sat on that Jiffy Tiff task force, like I, some of the reason I raised it today was I got a little scolding from some of them. And I, I would have loved to have said, oh no, it's in the agenda. And we're, not only are we funding it, but this is what, in, you know, this is what's happening. So if, if that could be um, included. And then my second request would be, um, as I make a motion to, did I already make a motion? on this one? <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna move okay. approval of the contracts with the request that as they come back, they, you know, that oh, we yeah, just are more robust in the contract history. But the other thing is if we Second. could, thank you, if we could add this to that matrix so that we're able to track it, that the implementation happened, because there will be need to be an evaluative component. And I would love, 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 because I, I did read the contracts and I didn't, I didn't understand where this was on the continuum of care in this area. So maybe just draw that out because when we're using wraparound as a term, um, often we use wraparound when we're, we're on a deeper end of the, the system. So that's really great news. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, before we vote, let me see if we had public comments on this item. I, oh, that makes we do not have requests to speak on item 30. All right, is your light on to vote, Supervisor Ennis? Is your light on to vote or for oh, a comment? Uh, sure, to vote. Yes. Go ahead, please, Jess. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian is absent. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you, that carries with four. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings us to item 31, uh, which is a referral from Supervisor, Supervisor Lee regarding a Lunar New Year County holiday. Thank you, President Ellenberg. I would like to thank our community that has joined us today. I know quite a few of our supporters, unfortunately, have to leave due to the length of the meeting. But we thank you for being here and also submitting public comments on letters, which is very important to us. This weekend, we will celebrate the beginning of the Lunar New Year and usher in the Year of the Dragon. And every 60 years, the Wooden Dragon. Lunar New Year is the most important holiday where I was born in Hong Kong, but also in China. Korea, Vietnam, and many, many other Asian countries by, celebrated by over one and a half billion people worldwide. This is the most celebrated holiday in some of the countries that could last up to even two weeks. Workers often travel hundreds or even thousands of miles to return home to see their family. I'll say it's kind of like Thanksgiving and Christmas rolled together for many family <laughs> gatherings. Kids especially are those most excited about the Lunar New Year, not only because of seeing family and, and friends, the good food, the new clothes, but most importantly, the lucky red pockets which contain money for the piggy bank on the next pair of sneakers. An official recognition by this board would help acknowledge the diversity and cultural significance that we have brought to Santa Clara County, similar to the county's observances for Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Caesar's Harvest Day, and Juneteenth. The state of California and our own Valley Water district have already done this. And that's why it is time for our county to show the same recognition and respect. I want to thank all the county workers who have collaborated with our office and I on this issue. And I want to also thank all the community leaders and residents who are providing public comments, both written and spoken in support of this effort. With that, I respectfully request an I vote from my colleagues. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have public speakers in chambers or on Zoom? Yes, we have six speakers in chambers, up to three on Zoom for a total of nine. I see someone grabbing a card in the back of the room. What item are we looking for here? 31? So, 35. 35, okay. okay. Do we have anyone in chambers who's desiring to speak on item 31 who has not yet submitted a yellow card. If that's the case, give a little wave so I know to wait for you. Otherwise, we're going to close the queue. And for speakers on Zoom, 
If anyone is interested in speaking, please have your virtual hand raised now. We will close that queue when the first Zoom speaker begins. And is all of that being translated so people know to raise their hands now? I know that our in-person is interpreter is, our interpreter in chambers is translating. I'm hearing a report that the interpreters on Zoom may not be linked up. I have three hands raised in Zoom. Fong An, could you please just let folks on Zoom know that if they'd like to speak on item 31, now is the time? Thưa quý vị, có những người muốn nói về mục số 31. Ở đây thì vui lòng giơ tay lên. Đây là thời gian cho quý vị giơ tay. Và khi người đầu tiên bắt đầu phát biểu thì sẽ không nhận những cái lời phát biểu, những cái giờ lời phần giơ tay tiếp theo nữa. Xin cảm ơn. Thank you. So holding at three hands on Zoom and six in chambers. Okay, excellent. So at nine, at nine speakers, I'm pleased to be able to offer two minutes per speaker. Um, please go ahead. Um, when I call your name, please form a line in the center. Uh, first speaker is Donald Chan, followed by Ha Tru, Long Nguyen, and I might need help with the one after that. Yes. Go right ahead. Hi, I'm Dr. Chan. I'm a resident physician in radiology at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. And I'm a proud member of the Committee of Interns and Residents, SEIU. Uh, I'm here to ask the board to approve the referral for Lunar New Year. Uh, Lunar New Year is one of the most important holidays in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, uh, widely celebrated by community members, local organizations, and county employees alike. Uh, more than 40% of the county's residents are AAPI, and observing the Lunar New Year as a county holiday would honor their heritage. Traditionally, families gather on the evening before or on the first day of Lunar New Year. Growing up in the U.S., I rarely was able to celebrate this tradition because Lunar New Year was not a recognized holiday. I felt isolated that such an important holiday in my culture was not recognized. I am grateful that more state and local governments are uh, uh, recognizing this holiday, but I want more to be done. On this day, I want to be able to visit my mother, to, who lives one to two hours away, to make food together and enjoy family time together, uh, as she was able to do when she grew up before moving to the US. Uh, I want the AAPI community, the largest minority group in Santa Clara County, to be recognized. And I want people to be able to celebrate this holiday just as my family, um, just as I want to do with my family. On behalf of my co-residents who celebrate Lunar New Year, I respectfully ask the Board of Supervisors to vote aye on the referral for Lunar New Year. Thank you for your time. Dear Board Supervisors, uh, my name is Ha Chiu. I am the President of Executive Board of the United Vietnamese American, North California. I am represent for home, almost 100 people in Vietnam in Santa County. So right now it's a weekday, so thank you. Uh, Supervisor Ali uh, did referral to Vietnam uh, the New Year's, Lulat New Year. To uh, board supervisor, Lunar represent to me is very important. It remind me when I was uh, four or five years old. Every year uh, and midnight uh, between uh, evening uh, New Year, I change my clothes and waiting for my father and, and uh, Give me some money like red pocket, set type envelope. So I would like, right now you all recognize, in the state I recognize uh, that the uh, Asian 
uh, including Vietnamese in there for uh, New Year, Lunar New Year. So I would like you please uh, recognize them is a uh, uh, holiday for Kapti Santakara. Uh, thank you. Bye. Dear Board of Supervisors, uh, my name is Long Nguyen. I am a resident of uh, San Jose County of Santa Clara for 44 years. I'm currently a member of uh, the Board of Director of VIVO. Um, uh, stand for Vietnamese Voluntary Foundation. And I'm here on behalf of VIVO and myself um, to support the agenda that uh, for um, considering Lunar New Year is the county holiday. And I am sincerely uh, asking the Board of Supervisors to uh, vote yes on this agenda. Thank you so much for your consideration. Xin kính chào quý vị, à, tôi tên Nguyễn Thị Cúc, là người Việt, sống ở thành phố San Jose này. Chúng tôi là người Việt Nam, cho nên chúng tôi muốn có ngày lễ Tết hàng năm theo âm lịch là ngày mùng 1 Tết. Vì ngày đó là ngày quan trọng trong phong tục và tập quán của người Việt Nam chúng tôi từ ngàn xưa đến nay. Mỗi đầu năm mới, đó là văn hóa thiêng liêng không thể thiếu được. Đó là chương 31, cái nghĩa chữ 32 là Chúng tôi xin nói gọn và bao nhiêu đó là chúng tôi rất là muốn uh, có ngày lễ Tết hàng năm theo âm lịch vì đó là ngày truyền thống của dân tộc tôi. Dạ. Chúng tôi rất là, là là mong ước được làm lễ Tết đúng ngày mùng 1 Tết dạ. Giống như bên Việt Nam này dạ. Okay, we'll ask Phong An to interpret that comment, please Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kim Cook, I'm Vietnamese I'm living in San Jose, and as a Vietnamese, I want the celebration day of the Vietnamese, the Tet, which is the new year, which is a very important year for us, for our custom, because it has been in Vietnam for more than a thousand years. This is a very sacred culture of the Vietnamese people. In short, I would like to propose that those celebration day should be celebrated here because this is so heavy and strong tradition for us. This is my wish. And I would like to celebrate the first day of the Lunar New Year, the third day at the traditional day. Thank you. Tôi tên là Anna Hoàng, đại diện cho Hội Nữ Quân Nhân Quân lực Việt Nam Cộng Hòa, Bắc Cali. Cảm ơn Hội đồng Quản trị. Quận Hạt đã công nhận nghị quyết chính thức ngày lễ Tết truyền thống ngày mùng 1 Tết nguyên đán và hẳn diện về sự đóng góp đa dạng của cộng đồng gốc Á, trong đó có cộng đồng người Việt tị nạn, cộng sản, sinh sống trong tại quận Hạt Santa Clara. Một lần nữa tôi xin thank you Board of Supervisor Otoli và Board of Supervisor Cindy Chavez đã công nhận nghị quyết ngày lễ Tết cổ truyền ngày mùng 1 Tết nguyên đán hàng năm của cộng đồng người Việt tị nạn chúng tôi tại quận Hạt Santa Clara. Thank you. Thank you. We'll ask Phong An to interpret. My name is Anna Huang. I am uh, one of the veteran of the uh, flight squatch in the North California. 
And I would like to thank uh, the Board of Supervisors to recognize the special day um, of our people. The day is um, very, very, very special to the people, especially the refugee uh, who, run, who flee away from the communists in Vietnam, who stay in Santa Clara. And I would like to especially thank um, Arthur Lee, uh, Cindy Jave, and the, Bo, the Board of Supervisors for this consideration. And uh, I would like to make it come true. Thank you. Hi, Honorable President Susan Ellenberg, Board Supervisor Otto Lee, Board Supervisor City Travis, as well as uh, Board Supervisor Sylvia Arenas, and Board Supervisor Joe Simerton. My name is Van Le, trustee of Isa Union High School District, advisor and founder for the Moon Festival, and also a community activist. I know that it's not a lot of people come today, but I represent some of the parents, some of the students, as well as some of the residents in Santa Clara County. We express the appreciation of Board Supervisor Otoli to bring this item as number 31 to approve Lunar Calendar Year as the county holiday and recognize the contribution and the diversity cultural of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, followed by the state California law recognition as official holiday. But I'm not an uh, employee of Santa Clara County, but I wish everyone in Santa Clara County uh, employee received the observed holiday and appreciate this is never happened before. Never happened before in the state of California as well as a county city. I'm going to try to uh, approach uh, my board colleagues, try to see if we can have the observed holiday for the teachers and staff in Eastside Union High School District because I think it's wonderful to acknowledge and to recognize it's very important first day holiday, uh, New Year from the Asian community as well as the Pacific Islander. So I wish everyone Happy New Year, Chúc mừng năm mới. And I want to say that um, this is a year of a dragon. It, I think it's a very a symbol of an animal, very powerful, powerful that we can make this country, this county, this city a better place to live. Thank you. That concludes in-person speakers. We currently have four hands raised on Zoom. Okay, let me make one more reminder. If there's anyone else on Zoom wishing to speak on this item, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The queue for speaking will close when the first speaker begins. Fong in, if you could just give one more reminder that if you'd like to comment on item 31, you must raise your hand before the next speaker begins. Thưa quý vị, nếu quý vị muốn phát biểu trên mục tiếp theo đây là mục số 31 thì vui lòng hãy giơ tay để có thể lấy phần phát biểu um, bởi vì cái việc mà nhận phần những người phát biểu sẽ chấm dứt khi người đầu tiên lên tiếng phát biểu. Xin vui lòng giơ tay vào lúc này. Xin cảm ơn rất nhiều. Thank you. We're holding it for hands. Let's hear our four speakers. Welcome. Our first speaker is Kimberly Lam. Please go ahead, you'll have two minutes to speak. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kimberly Lam. I'm here as a representative from APALI, Asian Pacific American Leadership Institute, to support Supervisor Lee's Lunar New Year holiday referral. As a Vietnamese American, Lunar New Year's, or DET, has been the most important holiday of the year for my community. It's a time for families to come together, for young Asian Americans to connect with their culture and heritage, and for us to celebrate and hope for the coming of a new prosperous year. I have had so many family members and friends have to make difficult decisions to take time off work, to call in sick, or even risk getting fired in order to attend to family graves, to worship ancestors, and to celebrate and spend time with loved ones, even for a day, when death celebrations are typically at least a week long. Lunar New Year's is a time of connection and is so deeply important to our communities, and making it an official county holiday would recognize the voices, presence, and belonging of Asian Americans in Santa Clara County. Thank you for your time, and as we approach that, happy Lunar New Year's. Our next speaker is Joe Nguyen. Please go ahead, you'll have two minutes. This is Joe Nguyen, field representative for Assemblymember Alex Lee, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Assemblymember 
Lunar New Year is one of the most important celebrations for our Asian American communities, from reunion dinners and lion dances to exchanging lisi or red envelopes. Lunar New Year festivi festivities reflect the rich culture and history of our community members. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, for introducing this proposal to recognize the diversity of Santa Clara County. By joining the state and declaring Lunar New Year as a holiday, Santa Clara County would reinforce its commitment to our county's Asian American communities. Lastly, I wish all those who celebrate Lunar New Year a happy, a very happy Year of the Dragon. Our next speaker is Victoria Lowe. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is Victoria Lowe. I'm here on behalf of Assemblymember Evan Lowe. Good evening, Supervisors. Um, I'm District Representative um, Victoria Lowe. I'm from Assemblymember Lowe's office. I'm delighted to um, be here to speak on be his behalf to support um, Supervisor Lee's referral to recognize Lunar New Year as a county holiday. Um, in 2022, the governor signed Assemblymember Lowe's bill, Assembly Bill 2596, which recognizes Lunar New Year as a state holiday, allowing any state employee to utilize time off to observe Lunar New Year. Um, as uh, previously stated, um, Santa Clara um, County's Asian American population is over 40%. So such a recognition um, of Lunar New Year as a county holiday would both be appropriate and welcomed by the community. Um, Santa Clara County has made tremendous efforts to foster inclusivity and celebrate our county's rich cultural diversity. And so as chair of the California Asian American and Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, Assemblymember Evan Lowe urges the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors to continue these efforts and support the referral to recognize Lunar New Year as a county holiday. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, yes, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. Uh, as a historian, I am in support of having having a holiday uh, established that has historical roots in the Asian uh, community, specifically the Vietnamese community. Um, I, I would like to challenge, though, the Vietnamese community that their establishment here in San Jose was built on the bodies of Chicanos. Now, in the Vietnam War, the highest rate of casualties of any group in the entire Vietnam War was the Chicano community. We were 22% of the casualties in the Vietnam War. I don't necessarily see that reflected in the Vietnamese history here in San Jose. Uh, secondly, it was my community, the Samoan community and the Filipino community that gave a space of refuge to the Vietnamese community so that they could become viable citizens of San Jose. They weren't welcomed on the west side. They weren't welcomed in the Rose Garden. They weren't welcomed in Willow Glen. They were welcomed. And it was a challenge. It was a challenge on the east side because we were absorbing a community that we, we didn't understand their language, their culture. We didn't understand theirs. And, and since then, the Vietnamese community, which I feel so like, uh, like uh, I, there's a, a sense of like, like uh, surprise and gratitude and honor that whenever I walk into a Vietnamese haircut space, some of the Vietnamese women know more Spanish than I do. And that is a testament to their willingness to absorb and to assimilate themselves into the culture and into the community, which is one of the reasons why I'm in support of this initiative but I would also like some acknowledgement of the sacrifices that the Chicano community made. Our final speaker is Ava Chow. Please go ahead. Hello, dear supervisors. Uh, I am honored to be here. Thank you for uh, listening to us. Uh, my name is Ava Chow. I am a commissioner for Shinju Sister County in, for Santa Clara. I'm also a school board member for Cupertino Union School District. I am today speaking on my own behalf in support of the referral. Thank you, Supervisor Otto Lee, for the Lunar New Year as a county holiday. I teach in Eastside San Jose, so we have a lot of students that would appreciate this and also people that live in Santa Clara County. I live in Cupertino. There's a large population of people 
that celebrate Tet and also Chinese New Year, uh, Lunar New Year, would recognize um, the culture and diversity that we have in Santa Clara County. And also, uh, our Lunar New Years are celebrated um, on the weekends, usually, and it starts on the Saturday and goes for the entire week. So celebrate as an official holiday also won't take up any time off unless there are people who celebrate Lunar New Year and they work on the weekends. So I think this is a great opportunity that we recognize that. In addition to that, thank you to Assembly Member Evan Lowe for taking this and as an official holiday for the state of California. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Lee and a second by Chavez. Uh, do any of my colleagues wish to make any comments? Uh, I, I'm going to do so then. Thank you, Supervisor Lee, for, for bringing this uh, item uh, forward for discussion. I, I will support today uh, sending this to forward to administration for a report back. Uh, Lunar New Year is indeed an important day for our Asian American community in Santa Clara County. As you allude in your referral, community members and organizations are coming together in celebration. I also appreciate your recognition that the state uh, has declared Lunar New Year as a holiday. Uh, the state notably does not close services, but allows employees to use time off to observe the new year. I'm also thinking, of course, about our budget discussion from earlier today and the, the tough choices we're being asked to make. Um, I, I will acknowledge that I'm becoming increasingly concerned about our willingness uh, to actually make unpopular choices. And I'll share as well that the additional cost of implementing a county holiday is estimated to be about $2.3 million per year, ongoing and increasing. Um, as, as uh, wages increase. This is the cost of time worked on the holiday that's calculated at time and a half, plus the cost of applicable benefits for employees covered by our labor agreements that provide for a premium pay for working a holiday. This cost is in addition to a day where another day where county residents would lose the access to services, the equivalent of 106,000 hours of services. Um, and of course, a county paid a county paid holiday doesn't necessarily benefit them or members of the public in the way it would um, internally for us. I, I think also about the beautiful diversity in our community um, and how many different communities and interests are represented. Um, and, and I suspect that, that many of them would also undoubtedly appreciate a day off uh, for their particular cultural or religious celebration. And, and I worry that we open ourselves up really to a long list of requests and being put in the position of seeming to discriminate against certain groups if we approve some and disapprove others. My, my strong preference is that we follow the state model that was introduced by um, Assembly Member Evan Lee and honor this low. <laughs> You know, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Evan. By Assembly Member Low, um, and honor this special day in that fashion. Thank you. I think we're ready to. I think vote you or just comment. promoted Supervisor Lee as an Assembly no, Member. I was thinking of Assembly Member Lee, but I meant yeah, Assembly yeah. Member Low anyway. <laughs> You're so, oh, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, President, it's okay if I make a comment. Of course. Uh, thank you so much for for putting that into perspective. Because I'm, you know, I'm just go. I'll because I I want to partner and um, of course, you know, living in the East Side, um, you have a myriad of people um, from all kinds of different cultures, right? My neighbors on one side were Filipino, on the other side were Vietnamese. Um, you know, we I, I grew up. In, in a place where we had a lot of folks from um, from Asia, from different parts of Asia, right? Um, and uh, and I love <laughs> I, I love all their their customs. I'm thinking like I'm thinking about all the things that they introduce you to, right? Um, and 
and how you call the, some of the elders and um, and how you get integrated into their families and and it's a, it's they're just beautiful cultures and there's so much to that we share in common because we value family um, and so I, I mean I'm, I'm going to be supportive of this I do want to see if maybe I don't know can we can we take another one off and put this one in <laughs> I don't know what the the options are um, but when you laid it out the way that you did President Ellenberg I was like oh I think the intent is to honor our um, uh, Asian brothers and sisters in our community. I think that's the most important thing. So however it gets done, I'm, I look forward to seeing how the, that is. Um, in, in my office, I we have half of, half of my staff, I think, is Vietnamese, and then the other half is Latino. It just represents who lives with us, right? Um, and so, so anyways, I, I'm so glad that you brought this forward and, and that we are together. I think I heard one of the speakers, he um, said, you know, I wasn't, I'm not able to drive two hours and visit my mom on this, you know, uh, Lunar New Year. Um, and the, the fact that he said he wanted to visit his mom in a two-hour trip just got me. <laughs> He's a good son. He's a good son. <laughs> So anyways, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for honoring um, the different cultures and the diversity. When we talk about equity earlier and we, we talk about valuing um, each other, this is partly how we do that, right? And so, so anyways, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez? Yes, thank you. Um, and I want to thank Supervisor Lee for bringing this forward. And I just wanted to make a couple observations and ask the county when they bring the report back to, um, to be able to highlight a couple of different issues. Um, one is that I'd be interested in knowing as a, as a nation um, how many official holidays that we have, and even for the county, and let me just say why. We, my recollection is not necessarily the county, I think we do a good job at this, but nationally, we. We have very few paid holidays relative to other countries, especially other industrialized countries. So that's one thing that we have to think about. The second thing I want to remind people is that we have fought for a very, very long time in this country to dedicate holidays that reflect the community and the community's values. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, President's Holiday. And I'll also say that in the city of San Jose, when I served on the council, I think we became one of the first cities in the country to acknowledge Cesar Chavez's birthday as a holiday. And it was done because um, we, we recognized that it, it had significant cultural implications. And to build that sense of belonging in communities, acknowledging important dates is part of how we say, yes, we belong. And then, um, I, I know you acknowledged Juneteenth, but I will, ta I will remind everybody that there was a bit of a controversy, not controversy, but should we do it? Should we trade a holiday? And, and to be honest with you, that caused a whole other set of con consternations because everybody was like, not my holiday, you will not, because again, because they have meaning to us. And so, as we were talking about equity, I will also observe that what often happens when we have, we're making new strides we have a difficult time making the newest stride because it's the last thing coming on board and it's, it's budgets are tight or we already have three holidays. And really we have to recognize that these actions, while in incredibly important and have a financial, a very real financial impact on the county, I do not want to discount that. And I appreciate, Susan, that you've, you've um, really reinforced that um, a number of times today, uh, that we are also, this also aligns with the work we're trying to do with hate prevention, with building um, more resilient communities, with really creating a, a place that everybody feels like they belong. And belonging is the number one way we know that we improve the health and vitality of communities. So I, I, I wanted, what I want to make sure comes back is that there's a robust explanation around um, not just the financial implications, but how this aligns with other activities and you know, recognizing that in the two instances I just described, both in the city of San Jose and here in our own county um, for Juneteenth, 
we did not make it part of labor negotiations because we knew this rested above those discussions because it was more meaningful to our community. So I'm very excited to support today and we'll ask when the staff comes back that we're thinking um, critically about how we want to uh, proceed. Thank you. Thank if you. I Let's can make a Sorry? quick comment. Of so you can hear, hear something from administration you, you almost never ever hear. Uh, this is an exception, which is, can we actually move up the report back date? And the reason is, <laughs> and, and the reason is, you know, I think we can just update the analysis that was done for the Juneteenth holiday, but uh, having this item heard much sooner will allow us, if the board moves forward with making it a holiday, uh, accommodate that by taking the appropriate rec actions in the recommended budget. Uh, May 7th puts it very late in the process to then balance the budget given the anticipated ongoing costs. So um, I don't want to fully commit staff, but I would like to target the March 26th meeting. Why would I say no? <laughs> <laughs> but don't hold me to hearing that ever again from the administration. Let's vote. Uh, apologies, I'm updating this to approve as amended by request of the county executive. <laughs> Good job, Jess. Putting you on the Jess. record, Jess, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, Supervisor Reynas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian is absent. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with four. Item 32 is a resolution being brought forward by Supervisors Lee and Chavez um, regarding the official flag of the Vietnamese American community. Yes, uh, board colleagues, I'm very pleased to be co-presenting to you all a resolution along with Supervisor Chavez to reaffirm the prior recognition of the flag of the former Republic of Vietnam as the official flag of the Vietnamese American community right here in Santa Clara County. This resolution also opposes the display of the flag of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam on county-owned flagpoles. Supervisor Chavez and I request a resolution to reaffirm the county's commitment to recognizing the former Republic of Vietnam's flag to include additional language to strengthen it and to be aligned with other jurisdictions. Many American veterans proudly wear on the lapel pin or the ball cap. That is the very same flag with the yellow background and the three vertical red stripes. And I want to thank Supervisor Chavez and her office for collaborating with us and on, on this resolution. And I want to also thank all the Vietnamese community leaders right here and residents who are providing public comments, both written and spoken in support of this effort. Also, I'd like to welcome the Vietnamese American community and our fellow county residents to attend this Vietnamese flag racing ceremony in honor of the Lunar New Year here at the county building in McIntyre Plaza right outside this coming Saturday, February 10th at 11 a.m. With that, we respectfully request an I vote from all our colleagues, and I'd like to pass it along to my colleagues, Supervisor Chavez, for additional comments. I wanted to make sure I seconded the motion uh, before we move forward, and I think it was very elegantly said. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have public speakers on this item? We do. We have four in chambers, currently one on Zoom. Fong and if you could just remind folks on Zoom that if they'd like to speak on 32, please raise the virtual hand now. Thưa quý vị, những người nào muốn phát biểu trên Zoom hãy vui lòng giơ tay vào lúc này để chúng tôi có thể nhận sẽ sắp xếp cho quý vị lên phát biểu. Xin cảm ơn. Thank you. And we'll take speakers in chambers. I don't see any additional cards. Thank you. Last call for speakers on item 32. You should have a yellow card completed and brought up to the clerk. I'm going to note just a general comment for the public as well. When any of us step back here, as I'm about to do for a moment, there are speakers and we can hear all of your comments. So please don't think anyone is, is disregarding comments if we step back for just a moment. Do you want to go ahead and call speakers in chambers? Yes, speakers in chambers are, will be Long Nguyen, followed by Nguyen T. Cook, Anna Huang, and Van Lee. If you can form a line.
and myself um, to support the uh, agenda item. I were a uh, both people, and I left Vietnam when I was 16 years old. And uh, this is the only flag that I know of. Yeah. And today I'm here sincerely asking the Board of Supervisors uh, to vote yes on this item to reaffirm prior recognition of the flag to the former Republic of Vietnam as the official flag of Vietnamese American community in Santa Clara County. And also to oppose the display of the flag of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam on county owned flag bowls. Again, thank you so much for your consideration. God bless America. Xin kính chào quý vị là ở trong quần hạ Santa Clara. Trước tiên, tôi muốn lên nói rất là ngắn gọn là chúng tôi cảm ơn ông Otelli và bà Cindy Garner đã cho chúng tôi nghị quyết hàng năm để mà có gì như là đã cho chúng tôi treo cờ ngày mùng một Tết với cờ vàng ba sọc đỏ của chúng tôi chúng tôi đi theo lá cờ đó từ Việt Nam qua và chúng tôi rất biết ơn à, một lần nữa à, quý vị đã à, hiểu được à, cái nguyện vọng của chúng tôi và cho, cho, cho chúng tôi treo cờ làm ba sập đỏ trong những ngày lễ Tết à, vì à, chúng tôi đi tị nạn thì chúng tôi cứ mang theo lá cờ và chúng tôi rất là là vui và rất là um, hân hoan khi được đứng dưới lá cờ đó để mà ở trong cái uh, trong cái quần hạt này để mà chào nó mỗi ngày lễ Tết. À, xin cảm ơn và rất biết ơn quý vị. À. Thank you. We'll ask Fang An to translate. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Phúc and I live in Santa Clara County. And in brief, I would like to thank um, Mr. Dr. Lee and Ms. Cindy Chavez for the resolution to allow us to hang the flag, the beautiful yellow flag with three red uh, stripes on our Tet, the New Year celebration. This is a very proud flag in yellow color, three red stripes, and we brought it over on the way to Vietnam. Thank you so much. Thank you for understanding our wish that we would like to hang up our flag, to celebrate our flag. And um, we are the refugee uh, who bring this flag over here. And it's become our symbol. So we are very happy for the chance to celebrate, to get it recognized, especially in this special occasion and celebration. Thank you. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Van Le. First of all, I would like to say thank you to Board Supervisor Otoli, as well as the Board Supervisor City Travers, to bring this item 32 back to the county to reaffirm um, the Vietnamese heritage and freedom flag, and to recommend the action that uh, prior recognition of the flag of the former Republic of Vietnam as the only official flag of the Vietnamese American community in Santa Clara County and oppose the display of the flag of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam on county on a flag post. As you know that most of refugees, immigrants, you know, been here, I believe uh, since 1975, the 
South Republic Vietnam flag is only the flag that we celebrate as well as we have every community event in Santa Clara County. And I really appreciate that uh, both board supervisor uh, who hosts the flag ceremony this year as the first day of the Vietnamese uh, Luna, Vietnamese New Year as Luna Calendar Year. Very important to us because that is the day that we really appreciate. We pray for you know uh, everyone, and everyone will have a good year, and as well as a county, and and also as the resident in a county. I also want to appreciate uh, the staff of uh, board supervisor Otto Lee, Tevu, and Daniel Kao. Uh, supporting every step of the way to help this event as well as the flag ceremony will be very successful. And to me, this is very emotional to me to have the first day of the lunar calendar year. And I will see the Vietnamese South Republic flag will fly at the county and keep it up for the whole week. Continue the tradition. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I will have some invitation. Oh. Leave, it, leave it by the clerk's desk. Thank, Thank you. you. Dear board supervisor again, uh, my name is Ha Chiu. And uh, this, I not, did not intend to come here to talk about Vietnamese flag because the motion go with me a lot of time. Excuse me. Um, do you know 180,000 Vietnamese refugees come here by many way. I was a victim of the communists. I put them in the, after with 1975, I put them in the jail. And uh, I get out by buying the crime to get out of the jail and they escape. And they got the bite to me in the ocean. I survived in the ocean and came here. I went back to school and I become an engineer. I worked for Intel for 30 years. Uh, I designed most CPU for you guys are using right now. Uh, the last chip I did is a quad-core chip. Okay, so it's very emotional about Vietnamese flag. I, 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 I don't know what to say, but I would like you approve a Vietnamese flag. Not again, but I already have it, so we affirmed it. And one more time is that uh, I'm very happy the Vietnamese flag on the New Year, on uh, Lunar New Year, and uh, could you get you can assign the person organized this year so she will take care who who will take care for next year. So we need to do that. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Happy New Year. Thank you. That was our last in-person speaker. And we have one hand in Zoom holding. Excellent. Let's hear our single speaker. Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'm in support of the official flag, the raising of the Vietnamese flag. Um, when you're talking about the Vietnamese flag here in San Jose, you also have to talk about Lai Tong. Lai Tong was the man that had uh, conducted a hunger strike in front of City Hall uh, about, about maybe about 15 years ago. And he was, he was a very staunch, very, very committed supporter of this particular flag. And so when we're talking about that, we need to talk about any type of flag raising within its historical context. Um, we, we also need to talk about Everett Alvarez. Everett Alvarez was the first aviator that was shot down in the entire Vietnam War. He spent eight and a half years. He was the second longest serving POW in the entire Vietnam War. He is from San Jose. He's from here, he's from Sasi Puedes. His sister's name was Delia Alvarez, and she is also from Sasi Puedes. Now these are people, <clears throat> Delia Alvarez worked for the county. And so what I'd like to see is an acknowledgement of the sacrifices of the Chicano community we represented the most casualties, meaning that the Vietnamese would not have what he has today here in the city of San Jose without men like Everett Alvarez 
and the Chicano community. It was our blood that was spilled in Vietnam that allowed them the ability to come here and to find a viable place where they could grow as a community. And I think that we, we, lose, we lose a part of, of that connection between the Mexican community and the Vietnamese community. We lose that if we just only talk about how great and how wonderful it is to be a Vietnamese when we don't talk about the Chicanos that spilled the blood that made that freedom possible. And that that was our only speaker on Zoom. Thank you. We have a motion by Lee, a second by Chavez. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian is absent. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Item three is the, uh, 33, is the county executive's report. I will keep my report very, very brief in light of the hour and just note two things. One is that uh, yesterday over one million vote by mail ballots have been issued for the March 5th election. Lots of information is available on the ROV website and of course we'll have the vote centers open and, and everything else as per normal protocol. Uh, and second, just wanted to give a shout out to our Office of Emergency Management staff who have been working on uh, dealing with the recent storms and um, you know, I know we've provided uh, updates to the board separately, but uh, they uh, had a long, busy weekend and uh, continue to provide support uh, as the power outages dwindle. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Did you want to address, um, I'm sure it feels like years ago, but this morning during public comment concerns about the payment issue? That wasn't brought up today. I may have, I'm, I'm going to skip that. I may have misheard something. Uh, County Council's report. There were no reportable actions taken at the February 5th, 2024 closed session meeting. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. We have two items remaining on today's agenda. Item uh, 35. Migrant Families and Individual Safety Net Services. This requires a Levine Act announcement. And then our final item will be item 36. Item number 35 is subject to the Levine Act. Any parties or their agent must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Board of Thank Supervisors. Uh, Keeley, Deputy County Executive. I'm uh, joined by my colleagues from the Office of Supportive Housing, uh, uh, Department of Employment Benefits Services, and Office of Immigrant Relations. Um, due to the lateness of the hour, I'll just summarize our report uh, briefly. Uh, we're returning today to describe the actions that we're taking to meet the immediate needs of uh, the 60 or so families who are being supported by Amigos. Um, also describing the actions we're taking to improve our rapid response network um, and also to describe our actions for all unhoused families in Santa Clara County. Um, your report includes uh, several uh, recommended actions to address immediate needs. Um, first, we are recommending um, increasing funding for Amigos by $200,000. Uh, if matched by the city of San Jose, this would um, <coughs> ensure that motelling is provided, temporary shelter is provided through March. Uh, this gives us additional time for staff from uh, the interdepartmental county team to meet with um, the, amigo, uh, the families and amigos to better assess their needs and to better organize services. Uh, some of uh, the, uh, the county team here did meet with some of the families last night. Um, we didn't get a chance to meet with all of them, so that uh, work will continue. Um, that assessment will inform any modifications to the legal services contracts that we have with uh, approximately 16 organizations. 
Um, second, uh, we are working to develop a more robust and uh, responsive system of legal services and uh, other support services. And then finally, um, as we were um, trying to understand the needs of the 60 or so families, um, we realized that their temporary shelter and permanent housing needs coincided with many of the needs of our own uh, other unhoused families and unstably housed families. And Office of Supportive Housing identified that in addition to the needs of these 60 or so families, we're uh, facing significant pressures and potential gaps in our Heading Home campaign. Um, and on February 27th, uh, Office of Supportive Housing will outline a plan to allocate an additional $10 million to support the Heading Home effort. Um, and as you know, that is the county's effort to reduce and prevent homelessness for families with children and pregnant women. With that, I'll pause and uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see first if we have any uh, speakers on public comment on this item. We do have four speaker cards turned in for chambers and currently no hands raised in Zoom. All right, let's hear the four speakers in chambers, please. Okay, in any order, uh, please approach the podium. We have Father John. We have Jeremy Barros, Maritza Maldonado, and Ms. Ra Mendoza. I feel like saying we're back. <laughs> um, and we won't take a whole lot of time. We know everybody's tired, but just thank you for the proposed 200,000 to house families currently in our care. I also appreciate all of the eligibility workers that came out to, um, to our place yesterday to enroll our folks into uh, Medi-Cal. Uh, luckily, all of the people at that one hotel were all already enrolled in Medi-Cal due to the efforts of our staff. I just want to uplift that uh, even coordination of services with Amigos will, will cause uh, more time and effort on Amigos. So I just ask you, as we have, and you've noticed, we started off with a five-month budget, um, and then we started off with a three, and now a two-month budget, and we've actually cut that. We cut all services. And so I'm just asking to please consider um, the necessary services that we have provided for over a year free of cost to the County of Santa Clara, and we're just trying to get this right and coordinate the services at the level that they need to be coordinated uh, with um, love and compassion, and also that we actually find a solution to this ever-growing problem, and it'll continue, and we know with, with the elections coming our way, our people will be used as pawns in this election year, and I just want to raise that as well, and unless we're ready for that, um, we won't get it right. So uplift that, and thank you all for your time and your attention. Good evening, Board of Supervisors, Jeremy Bruce, Amigos de Guadalupe. Thank you to the county for all your work and for the work of staff over this past month towards addressing the growing crisis with unhoused families in the county. We appreciate the proposed 200,000 for housing through March for the families that are currently in our care. We provide very extensive services to these families, which is not covered by the 200,000. These services include legal services assistance, school enrollment, support to find permanent housing, and case management that connects families to critical resources such as food, medical care, and much needed behavioral and mental health services. We do this with great care with staff who are culturally competent and able to work well with parents and children who often come with serious trauma. We are requesting the 109,000 through the end of March. Uh, it doesn't seem possible for county staff to immediately take over providing services for this vulnerable population. So we are happy to continue this work for two more months to continue to give the county time to transition into this role. Thank you very much. Hello, how are you? Good evening. My name is Ms. Ryan Mendoza. I'm a community navigator with Amigos de Guadalupe. I want to thank you so much, County of Santa Clara, staff for working with our families. It gives me a little, ah, 
I breathe a little easier knowing that you guys are in a side and trying to work together with us. Thank you so much. Uh, but I'm here also to advocate a little bit. If uh, I'm not a complainer, really, because I love what I do, and I'm one of that one percent that loves my job. I believe I love my job, but we need a little help with programming. I hope you guys can can take a look at that, and uh, let's keep working together. And I'm, I love to live in this county, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate all the work you guys do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Father John from <coughs> Helping with Amigos de Guadalupe. Um, Chuck Namoy, Happy New Year to the folks. We're um, I'm just seeing uh, here to support the, continue to ask for the funding uh, and really will help the county develop a more robust long-term solution. Um, Amigos is more than just house folks. They work to integrate them into the community. Uh, and and uh, increasing the c members of the vulnerable population, their ability to get their kids in school, uh, connect them to jobs, and stabilize their well-being after a very traumatic journey to this community. So it's not just a matter of housing. It's a much more complicated uh, a proposal proposition that they're engaged in. So ultimately, I agree with, uh, with the, the speakers before me that we need a more robust long-term response. We can't continue to have these patchwork reactions to serving um, arriving families, and they're arriving more frequently and with their problems even more uh, difficult. Uh, this, so this patchwork reaction is not what we need. Uh, the people are here in this community and we need to provide them with a sustainable solution. Uh, part of that solution is to provide Amigos with the resources to support and integrate these families um, who have already suffered violence, inhospitality, and the indignity of being used as punching bags for anti-immigrant populists. We are a welcoming community, and let's stay there, and let's make that happen. And I want to, again, thank you all for the work that you've been doing, the support that you've been giving to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have speakers on Zoom? We have one hand raised. All right, let's hear our single speaker, please. Paul Soto, please accept the MU. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horse School. It was really good to see Father Pedigo uh, give his testimony. For Since the Chicano movement, we have always had the support of the Catholic Church. I'm doing research on Father Anthony Soco, Father Ronaldo Flores, um, uh, Father uh, President of the Chicano Priest Organization, uh, Father Jim McEntee, and, and, and he, it, he was a reminder of that type of support that we do receive from the Catholic Church, so I just wanted to acknowledge him and thank him for that. We do need this, um, this item, the monies that are allocated here. You see, this is what racial equity looks like, and it's one of the reasons why I keep pressing the county for a legal definition and a racial equity metric to be used anytime you're doing budget allocations. And what that, what that means and looks like is this, is that whenever you have to make these quote unquote tough and hard decisions, it's the communities that have been the major beneficiaries of the largest of monies that they are the ones that are the ones that get the tough decision. They're the ones that get taxed. And it is the, it is the communities that have historically not received any monies that they are given priority. Now, that's what racial equity looks like. If a million dollars is passed out to five districts, we make an assessment as to what districts historically have, uh, that, that we as a county through racist policies have created those deficits. And, and, and the way that we respond to that is through money. That's the only way. That is the only way to institutionalize racial equity within the context of, of these monies. I want to thank Amigos de Guadalupe for the work that they've uh, been done and continue to do in the community. And that uh, there's going to be some work that's going to be done in that community very recent, uh, within the next week or so, that I'd like to discuss. But uh, once again, thank you for bringing this up to, uh, to the public issue. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. I'm looking for a motion to approve the recommended action. So moved. Second. And a second. Uh, does anyone have additional comments? Are we ready? I do. I, I wanted to just okay. ask. Um, if I could just better understand what Amigos is saying the gap still is for them relative to, I, it was a little confusing. Could maybe one of the staff respond to the gap issue that was raised? Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, for the question. Um, the, uh, the gap that they've identified, I think, relates to the case management or other personnel that are associated with the motelling program. Um, in our recommendation, we believe that the $200,000 is sufficient for the motelling and then some. Uh, we, uh, if the board approves the delegation of authority, we can work with uh, Amigos to uh, refine that budget a little further, uh, and if necessary, take uh, additional action. Thank you. Thank you. Are we ready to vote? Yeah, I, I, I just want to first <laughs> thank the the, uh, the Maritza and uh, Jeremy and all your team and, and Father John, all, all the good work that you're doing. This is You're doing really God's work. When you have a former president that called them robbers, criminals, rapists, bringing drugs across the border, uh, it is not just wrong on the facts. It's absolutely denigrating people. It's not only insulting. Uh, it is is that that amount of ignorance. Well, actually, they might actually he might actually know what he's saying, in order to raise fears and anger among those who don't understand the system. Uh, the word invasion of our southern border. These are not people coming in with arms trying to invade this country. These are individuals coming through thousands of miles of hardship to seek safety for the family, to seek a better life. And I, I, I just want to say this is such an important difference. And, and I'm not trying to argue politics. I'm just talking about facts. And if you don't believe what we're saying here, go talk to Maritza. Go to talk to the families over there. You get to see them, see the kids. Uh, uh, and, and I think I just want to say you, you guys are really doing God's work. Uh, our county, as you know, are having you know, budgetary problems. But at the same time, we absolutely will do whatever we can to help your important work. And please keep us posted what's going on, uh, because this, this, is, this is about humanity. And I just want to also thank our county staff for, for your great work of, of putting this together with such a, uh, uh, together with such a quick time. And I know this is very late in the day, but I just really want to acknowledge this is really important work. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I represent my board members. I'm sure for you the exact same way. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Let's uh, vote on this item, please. Supervisor Reynolds? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Stamidian is absent. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with four. Thank you very much. This evening's final uh, item is item 36, Violence Prevention and Intervention Mapping Report. President oh. Ellenberg, yes. may I interject and, and see if there's a possibility to, to, to maybe move this um, to another meeting, um, especially when our, our countywide community violence strategic work plan comes back in March. Well, let me. I had a motion in oh, mind you had to pull okay. this. I, um, I'll let you be together. Please. See what you think of it. Okay. Um, if that's all right, rather than holding it, but I would like, since we've all had the opportunity to read the report, which is is excellent, um, I would like to begin with a motion, see if there's a second, go to public comment, and then come back to come back to the board. Um, so first, with, with tremendous thank you um, and appreciation for the report, I wanna offer two pieces as, as a motion, two pieces of direction for public health, and, and then just some notes on how this report connects with Supervisor Arenas's and my uh, violence prevention referral, as well as work that's happening at the City of San Jose and with our community partners. Um, so the, the motion is to receive the report and to direct public health to do the following. Uh, first, to prioritize consideration of violence prevention grant applicants community engagement planning practices, as well as applicants existing neighborhood ties. And second, to report to the, let's do it, an off agenda, to report in an off agenda on the outcome of the violence prevention grants once awards have been made. I'm asking for CBO applicants community engagement practices and existing neighborhood ties to be considered in furtherance of the community violence intervention approach that this report champions. 
which is to engage communities most impacted by violence in creating and implementing solutions that are tailored to their unique needs. And I would look for a second, second. on that motion. Thank you so much. And I, I want to make a couple of, that's the end of the motion, but just a couple of comments um, on the report. Uh, first on the scope, um, I thought it was, it was very sensible from the public health department standpoint to limit their scope to community violence intervention defined as violence between unrelated individuals usually outside of the home. But what that means, of course, is that the analysis before us doesn't address some of the leading causes of gun violence in our uh, community, such as suicide and intimate partner violence, uh, which public health noted that behavioral health and the Office of Gender Violence Prevention are, are best suited to address. Um, so that's not a, a critique to the public health department. I think they did an excellent uh, job on this report. But it, it, to me, it's kind of one of the they, the, the spotlights on, on sometimes our lack of interdepartmental coordination. So I, I will look forward to a more comprehensive analysis uh, being made possible again by the Violence pre um, Prevention Strategic Plan that Supervisor Arenas and I have directed. Uh, I also want to recognize that um, the board has uh, allocated some funds to operationalize one of public health's recommendations to address gun violence. Uh, and I will be interested to see, again, in this, in this climate, um, how, the, how your work to find grant funding along with the Violence Prevention Strategic Plan will allow for furtherance of the other recommendations on this critical issue. And finally, I just want to call attention to the alignment of this work with our partners, which I think is so important. The San Jose City Council is considering staff recommendations today to establish an Office of Violence Prevention, as well as a recommendation from Vice Mayor Kamei to consider expanded violence prevention investments in their budget. The Real Coalition um, has shared uh, with all of us, I'm, I'm certain that violence prevention is one of their uh, priorities, and they've submitted comments uh, at the city of San Jose on the council's item, as well as on this item uh, before us. I think with more entities recognizing violence prevention as a top public safety priority, it's really critical that we work to coordinate and deduplicate um, work not only within the county organization, but also with our city and CBO partners uh, when we look at grant applications in a countywide strategic plan. All of that to just say thank you. Uh, Supervisor Arenas, thank you for your partnership. Thank you to all of the, the county staff that is, that is really um, producing great work, and I'm, I'm very excited to see the plan and where we go uh, from here. Thank you. Um, did we do public comment? I don't think you did yet. Okay. Do you want to speak before or after public I comment? I can wait till after public wait. comment. Supervisor Ennis, before or after public comment? Dealer's choice, whatever you want. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do public comment. Do we have speakers on this item? No speakers in chambers. I have two hands up in Zoom. All right. Let's hear our two speakers on Zoom, please. Our first speaker is SVCN1. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good evening, my name is Yvonne Jimenez with the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. As representatives and close partners of several CBOs who provide crucial violence prevention services to our community, we are excited by the work that has already been done by the Public Health Department to identify gaps in prevention and intervention services. We hope that the board will direct administration to work with community stakeholders, including the Real Coalition, BHCA, SVCN, and grassroots community leaders with lived experience so that together we can develop a community-informed and aligned plan. And we also urge continued collaboration between the county and the city of San Jose, who at their council meeting today voted to direct staff to prepare a budget addendum with options for increasing city investment in violence prevention uh, efforts, which also included some direction to partner with other government entities. Thank you for your consideration. Our next speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I appreciate the work that our CBOs do in the community in order to keep our community safe. However, what I don't want to see, and which I have seen, is an exploitation of this particular issue for grant allocations. 
and, and no results. They're, they're not held to account. And I think uh, Supervisor Arenas had, had referenced that earlier, that we need to have an accounting of outcomes, which means crime rates and violence rates going down, because then that would, that would justify the grant allocation to the CBO. I mean, this is really simple. What I'd also like to see is that Martin Luther King in a speech April 3rd of 1967 at Stanford University stated that when you say that it, that, it's, that I can't live next to you, when you say that it's okay, not okay for my children to go to the same school as you, when you say that it's not okay for me to work in the same places or to live next door to you, you are saying consciously or unconsciously that I do not deserve to exist. This is the definition of genocide, end quote. So he made a very clear connection between segregation and violence against a people. Now, we have never talked about violence within that context. We have never articulated what segregation has done to our communities in order to keep these particular communities the way that they are. They didn't happen by accident. And we don't, uh, Mexicanos don't have a predisposition to violence. It's not like in our DNA or something like that. It's not racial. So we have to talk about that. We have, when we're talking about violence, we also have to root the conversation in poverty and racism. Now, the, the report that, that uh, Supervisor Arenas has commissioned on how, how, how Latinos' health care has been impacted over time in a bunch of different sectors, I think that report's going to be very helpful when we talk about violence. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Arenas and Chavez. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for the report. I, I really appreciate it. I know that, that uh, you took into account some of what um, I had shared previously um, and uh, included South County, and so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, I didn't try to move your, your report off. I just really wanted to have more of a dedicated and considerate um, conversation, but our president, Ellenberg, did that really well. I mean, you just laid it out for us, um, so I'm really glad um, you were there for us until the very end, um, President Ellenberg. Um, the, the only thing that I, I'll, I'll just add is that um, I would like to have, um, with the asset mapping, I think that that um, there's an opportunity to take a look at, uh, obviously, to identify the gaps um, uh, that are seen by the community. Um, and one of the things that I, I saw was that um, we didn't really have um, what was missing from South County. I think you, you said what was there, but, um, and, you know, I think we could easily do um, look at what is there for the yay and and what's not there for South County, and then obviously figure out what, what we actually need because I think that's a really good baseline in terms of what services and programs that are um, important and, and effective. Um, and I think that you, you uh, overall, I think you, you helped us um, with with uh, some of the other notes that we we had in terms of feedback, so I really appreciate um, you taking this, um, taking our feedback um, and making sure that you fold it in, that it's reflected, that our South County is is um, there, um, and I, I love this kind of lay of the land, if you will, um, um, because it helps us to begin to create baselines, and so. Um, I love that it's going to feed into not only the work that um, President Ellenberg um, is leading and has allowed me to be part of, but a lot of the other work that um, the supervisors like um, Supervisor Chavez is doing with the anti-hate um, program um, work group. I just There's so many pieces that this is going to be able to um, help. Um, so, so thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, uh, and thanks. You guys deserve that pin that you get when you've, you're at an 11th inning of a baseball game. I don't know what ours is, but we should have one made. Um, so just a couple of observations that, that I would like to make. One of the things I was really struck by, um, and almost every report that I've read, 
has the number of reports that we have you presenting either to Children's Family Seniors or to Public Safety and Justice or to this board. And, and one of the things I'm really struck by is that I, I think the reason that, that referrals and questions keep coming to you from different angles is because of something that Supervisor Ellen, or President Ellenberg raised a few moments ago. And I, I'm gonna ask if you could give me your thoughts on this. I am finding one of the biggest challenges with how we're addressing public safety, um, and, and, and in particular as it relates to guns and community violence, that every department um, has given us their own slice of the pie in presentations, and we are not receiving integrated approaches. And I know that's why supervisors, uh, President Allenberg and Supervisor Arenas now ask for this massive like approach, but I feel like you've been getting that question for years now. And so what I wanna press on is, um, is a, a product that I am very interested in seeing concurrent to the, the final, um, work plan because it would it would inform me in a way that I realize I haven't been informed, which is why I would add another, oh, let's do an off agenda report on blah, right? And that is this. I want to better understand how the county integrates directives from the board at a policy level, and this may be more Greta and James as I look at you, at a policy level that doesn't require referrals that ask for a coordinated approach. And it's a very sincere um, observation and request because in this report, there's a portion of it that says, um, we, we, were, we didn't explore in-depth mapping. However, they were covered in the cost of gun study violence. Other county partners, such as Behavioral Health and the Office of Gender-Based Violence, are the leaders in these respective areas and are best suited to advance knowledge base in their domain of expertise. And I know you're talking about research there, but I really want to understand how we get to a culture that integrates um, priorities more rapidly instead of us receiving such splintered um, approaches. I can share a couple things on that. One is that um, the only place where we're staffed as an organization to, to coordinate interdepartmental work is in the county executive's office itself, and it's a very, very small pool of people. Um, it's basically the deputy county executives and a small set of program managers who are the only staff in the organization that can support those kinds of efforts. So we obviously do for a whole variety of initiatives. Those folks are extraordinarily busy, so it's not like they're not doing that work. Um, but it um, isn't sufficient given the volume of those needs. So that's one piece of things. Um, second is that um, the departments themselves, right, have a huge volume of um, mandated and or otherwise operational responsibilities that consume the vast majority of their staffing resources. I mean, that's, I think, relatively obvious and self-evident for those operations that, um, you know, run direct services, like, say, a hospital or a jail or something like that. But even of other departments like public health, where a majority of its budget is funded by federal grants that mandate funding for very specific programs, and one of the things we'll end up talking about with public health's budget in the upcoming recommended budget process is the fact that they're losing $17 million in federal grants on top of the need to reduce their general fund. Um, and you know that necessarily consumes and dictates the work that much of its staff does because they only can draw down against those grants by booking hours to that work. 
Uh, and so those staff are then not available to be redeployed to any different work or the revenue backing their pay um, doesn't accrue. So, um, so I think taking us full circle back to the conversation we started at the beginning of the day um, with the budget, um, I think that in our current approach, um, there's maybe a lack of deep understanding and it looks different in different departments and different programs within different departments going back to kind of a, taking a more modified programmatic based approach ultimately on our budgeting to understand just how many actual resources in our otherwise uh, extraordinary workforce are actually deployable on the kinds of analysis programs and projects that, that I think the board wants to be launching or initiating. You know, James, I want to I want to give you a, a slightly different observation, and I I do recognize the point that you raise about um, the role of your office relative to the organization overall. And I will say to my colleagues that one of the things that I have recommended to James is that as he's he and Greta and um, Tony are all relatively new in these roles that. One of the things that I hope they do is really lean on the board to say, here's how we need to be structured and here's how we need to be staffed because it actually may be very different than the way it's structured and staffed today over the next 5, 10, 15 years. I also think that a little bit of this is um, uh, cultural. And there are some departments that, that I've interacted with and I know my board colleagues have that end up being your go-to departments because either they have a deep bench, it's not necessarily resource, resource driven in the financial way, but a deep bench with folks who have skill sets that, and, and relationships that cross departments and actually do this work almost um, as a, an innate part of how they get work done and other departments that that's more difficult. And it may be to your point, the overall staffing or overall resources that influence that, but I do not believe that is the case in every instance. And the reason I'm saying that to my, this to my colleagues is that I think one of the questions that we have to be asking ourselves in a more direct way is how the roles and responsibilities of different players in the organization and different um, entities drawing on their strengths would allow us to get deeper into problem solving in a number of these areas. And, and, it, and it's not to be critical, it really is just to accept what you've just said, that some of this is, in my opinion, resource driven, absolutely. Some of it is skill set driven, some of it is cultural in terms of this is mine, that's yours. Some of it is how we look at the kinds of grants we get and how, how innovatively we think about how they get spread. And I, I think the opportunity, especially relative to um, how we want to address violence overall, is very um, in a unique position because f for the first time in the last maybe five, eight, six years, we're starting to actually invest more resources in those in those areas. So I, I hope, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously going to support accepting this. I'm going to reinforce that I think we really, really, really have to look at census tracts. I, I know you're getting there. I just have to say it because these are way too big of blobs. And I think we're trying to boil the ocean, and we can't, and I recognize that. But I also think that taking the strengths of each of the departments on the implementation side would would so dramatically move the dial, and I think it would be a value for the board to take a look at one, two, or three of those issues where we really can move the dial. I think violence is one of them. I think uh, addiction, and the reason I'm so interested in how we're dealing with drug and alcohol is that these are, they're so foundational to other challenges that we're having that if we don't shift the way we're doing business, we're gonna do great studies and nip away at these as we have done for generations. So anyway, I, I'm, I, I do, I do think that's something that I hope um, you consider as you're thinking about the future of the organization and the future leaders that will be coming on board to take our places. And I do want to say thank you. I, I learned something new, even though I know this has been restructured from request after request. And I, again, I think the reason for that is we're searching for answers that are not yet available, which is why you get so many. Can you just reorganize it this way and that way? Thank you. Thank you. Let's vote on this item, please. Supervisor Arenas? Yes.
Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Smidian is absent. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Thank you. That carries with four. Thank you. With that, uh, with much gratitude to the Clerk of the Board's office and to Create TV and to everyone who makes these meetings possible, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Go Niners. <laughs>